Dark Reckoning, a gripping and explosive conclusion to the Dark Creatures saga. Written by Ella Stone. Narrated by Naomi Rose Mock. Chapter 1. Nerissa. The salt spray hits my face, stinging my eyes and joining the tears running down my cheeks. I gaze out at the grey waters of the English Channel, that small strip of sea between England and France, that separates my past from my future, the things I've done from the things I will have to do. Less than 48 hours ago, I was on a ferry exactly like this one, but going in the opposite direction. There had been five of us travelling together, heading for London. Five of us. Two vampires, two wolves and a witch on a mission to steal grimoires from the Vampire Council. We have those books with us now, but at the cost of three of our number. Only Vasara and I are making the homeward journey. A wave smashes against the hull, and the following seagulls squawk and spiral upwards. Nausea threatens to overwhelm me, but it has nothing to do with the seasickness that's afflicting the others up on deck, hoping fresh air will be the answer. Last time I didn't come up here to watch as the land disappeared over the horizon, or ponder what might lie ahead of us. I should have given it more thought. When I hadn't been asleep, I'd spent the time apologising to Callan. He'd accepted my contrition with the same grace and dignity that he always shows. But it was too little, and too late. I only wish I'd known. I can still see him clawing at his head in agony as Vasara's spell found its way into his skull. The memory of his nails tearing at the tiles makes the hairs on my arms rise. I tried so hard to reach him before we fled, but there was nothing I could do. Another wave crashes against us, spraying water over the deck. I don't blame Vasara, of course, I don't. She did the only thing she could to save us both, along with the grimoires. I can't even reproach her for not including me in the backup plan she, Rhett and Callan had devised in case things went badly. No, it's my fault for believing we could do it in the first place, for thinking we could get in and out unscathed. There's always a price to pay, and I've learned that the hard way. Nerissa, they're asking people to return to their vehicles. We'll be docking in Calais soon. I turn and look at the woman beside me. She's more than just your average witch. She's the leader of a coven, possibly the only remaining one on the planet since the vampires made it their mission to wipe them off the face of the earth. She's strong, but even her powers wasn't enough to bring my friend, Ray back from the evil that held her. Polidori, head of the Vampire Council, had captured her and forced her to use some of the darkest grimoires they had in their possession against us. I can just imagine him watching as the corruption fed off her fear and consumed everything that was ever good in her. So we went in search of spells to fight this malignancy, but in trying to save one person, we lost three. How does that make sense? Whichever way you look at it, they're dead because of me. I don't know what I'm going to say to them. I stare at the sea, unable to look at Vasara. I just don't know. Then say what you feel in the moment. The wolves will expect me to lead their ritual service for Esther, but with no body, no bones, it's impossible. We'll think of something, she says, taking my hand and giving it a squeeze. I want to return the gesture, to feel a warmth flow between us. But I can't. The last hands I held were Esther's and Callan's as we stood before a ring of salt, candles and runes in a vault of the Vampire Council. We walked in easily enough, unaware that a curse had been put on the entrance, meaning no living person could ever leave again. The only spell that could defeat this sorcery required a blood sacrifice. It was meant to be me. I would have done it, I whisper, half to myself. I know, and they will too. You can see each other's hearts, can't you? Isn't that the gift of werewolves, to know each other's thoughts? Is it a gift or a curse? I still haven't made my mind up on that one. I hesitated, I say, tears blurring my vision again. If I hadn't, she'd still be alive. And you would be dead, and it wouldn't have changed anything that happened to the others. But I was meant to do it if I'd just been stronger. Anyone would have wavered. You were walking to your death. Esther didn't. She marched into those flames without a moment's thought. Do you truly believe that? I think back. I'd been terrified. No, terror doesn't come close to describe what was running through me as I stared into those flames. Once inside the circle, that would have been it. 
My life would have been over, but the others would have been free. No good Alpha would have faltered. My mother wouldn't have. I'll never be the leader she was. I don't know much about Esther, Vasara tells me. I spoke to her on the journey over, not a lot, but it was enough to get the feeling that she would never do anything important without careful consideration. Now, if I could sense that in such a short time, then the rest of the pack already knows it. She made her choice, and you cannot change history. All you can do is live your life in a way that honours her memory. Her arm comes around my shoulders, and she squeezes, not hard, but firm enough to tell me we should get moving. We still have a long drive ahead of us, and I'm not so far gone that I can't tell she's struggling too. And not just because of the spells that she had to create and hold to get us out of that place. Vasara and Rhett had a long relationship, even if it was one that can't easily be pigeonholed. If the hurt I feel at leaving Callum with Polidori is enough to make me sick to my stomach, then I cannot imagine how she is feeling. We wait in the car until the ferry docks, and then join the other vehicles rumbling down the metal gangway to the solid ground of France. Day has arrived with a brilliant blue sky, yet despite this, I yawn. Why don't you close your eyes? Fasara suggests. I know the route. You can rest. It's fine, I say. I'm not sure I could sleep now, even if I wanted to. I don't remember the last time I closed my eyes and wasn't haunted by visions of those I've lost. First my mother, then my father, then Ray, then my mother for the second time. I didn't see her die. I didn't even know it had happened until months after the event. But I have imagined the moment a thousand times. A sniper. A bullet. A beautiful white wolf dead on the ground. And now I have three more faces to add to the lineup: Esther's. Callens and Rhett's. I think there's a supermarket along this road, Vasara says. I'm not hungry, but if you are, I was thinking about herbs, not food. Herbs? If I can find what I need, I'll make you something to help you sleep. I shake my head. I'm fine, I say, almost by rote. It's not that I have anything against Vasara's tonics. I'm sure they work brilliantly. But it feels wrong taking something to ease my own discomfort when I couldn't do anything to help those I should have protected. If you're sure, she says. Considering what we've been through together, I know very little about this witch. Does she have children, for instance, or possibly even grandchildren? Perhaps I should ask. Then again, maybe I should just keep my nose out of other people's business. If the last year has taught me anything, it should be that. As the car trundles along, my eyes grow more and more heavy, and then I realise I'm nodding off. I shift myself up a little in my seat. Can you make it a dreamless sleep? I ask. She takes her eyes from the road to offer me a fleeting smile. I will do my very best. Chapter 2 It works almost instantly, and although it's not dreamless, it's certainly the closest to a deep sleep I've had in years and all the images are good ones. I dream about my dad and me, making campfires and toasting marshmallows. I dream about running in the forest as a wolf with my mother by my side. And I dream about Callan, Ray and Oliver, the four of us eating pizza together and laughing. I guess that should have given me the clue that I was dreaming. I can't imagine Callan and Oliver ever getting on well enough to eat pizza together, or even me and Oliver right now, for that matter. But it's perfect. It's exactly what I need. Nerissa, you need to wake up now. We're nearly there. I've been so deeply asleep that it takes me a while to recall where I am. The residue of the dream remains, and for the briefest moment, I feel a lightness, like everything is okay. I can go running in the forest with my mum, eat pizza with my friends. But then I glance to the side and see Vasara looking at me with concern, and it all returns with a sickening thud. We're close. She says as I sit up and stretch the cricks out of my neck, about twenty minutes away, I think. I gaze out of the window towards the rolling hills in the east. There's a small wooded area that feels familiar, and a derelict house just ahead that I've run past a few times too. My stomach starts to churn. Any of the wolves could be roaming out there, awaiting our return. George, Esther's best friend, the one from whom she was inseparable at Regine's home. Regine's home. The thought causes another wave of nausea to pass through me. 
We've been hiding in a chateau in central France for months, thanks to the hospitality of an old lady, one of Callan's close friends. But he's gone, captured by Polidori. What's to stop her from throwing us all out, or, worse still, informing other vampires of our whereabouts? As Alpha, I ought to have a plan for this eventuality. I'm the one who should have all the answers. But I haven't. Right now, I don't even know how I'm going to walk through that front door and face everyone. Can you stop the car? I mumble, apparently only audible to myself. When Vasara doesn't respond, I speak louder. Can you stop the car, please? I start fumbling at my seatbelt buckle, my breathing unsteady. Stop! Stop the car! I shout now. I need to get out! Stop the damn car! Eyes wide. Vasara slams on the brakes. My fingers are still unable to find the button to release the belt. I tug at it instead, pulling harder and harder, but the tension only increases. It's okay, you're all right, she says, reaching over and gently pushing my arms to the side so she can do it for me. I don't even stop to thank her. The moment I'm released, I fling open the door and fall onto the grass verge. The shock of the cold air does nothing to help, and kneeling there, I puke until there's nothing more left in me. I push myself unsteadily to my feet. Here you go. Vasara is standing over me, although how long she's been there, I have no idea. She's holding out a bottle. Another tonic, I say expectantly. Just water, I'm afraid, but it will make you feel better. As I use it to swell my mouth out and then take a sip, I find she's right. It does, but only by getting rid of taste of vomit, not about all the things I have to do. Are you ready to go now? she asks, as I finish off the water. I shake my head. No. You will never have to face this again. Sometimes, knowing that helps. I'll never have to face this moment again. The thought is enough to get me back into the car. For the longest time, I've been furious with Callum for keeping the death of my mother from me, and Oliver, too. They should have told me. It's not until this moment I understand. Why would you tell someone news that you know will break them if you convince yourself that you don't have to? We continue along the road, now to territory I know well. Every distant tree and landmark we've raced around as a pack, too many times to count. Full moons, new moons, sunsets, sunrises. Can you stop again? I say in a substantially more measured tone than last time, although Vasara still looks at me with concern. This isn't how to tell them. This isn't how they deserve to find out. Words can't do justice to what Esther did for me, but Vasara was right on the ferry. We're wolves. We have more than words. Is there anything I can do? She asks, as I step out onto the verge again, this time staying on my feet, as I slip out of my clothes. You could take these back to the house for me. I reply. I wait until her car is out of sight, until I can no longer hear the thrum of the engine in the distance. It's still a few miles to the chateau. I know she'll drive slowly and give me the chance to do what I need to do before she appears. When there's nothing but the sound of the wind in the trees, I close my eyes and change. It used to be so painful. When I think of the first few times, it still gives me chills. It's unsurprising, given what the body has to go through and used to be something I tried to avoid. Now it's the most natural feeling in the world. Like stepping into a warm bath. Like coming home. I raise my nose to the sky and howl with every ounce of strength I can muster. It sends birds from their roosts and rabbits scurrying through the undergrowth. It creates ripples across the fields of corn. I send all the sadness I feel. All the pain and guilt at my failure but also my pride in Esther for what she did, for how she protected me. And then, when there's no breath left in my lungs, my pack responds, with its sorrow too. Chapter 3 Chrissy is the first to greet me. Her soft amber muzzle nuzzles into my side as if she were a mother, comforting her daughter. And she's the closest I've got to family. Her and Lou... I shared everything I could with the wolves, the sacrifice, how it should have been me, but it was Esther who stepped into the flames before I could stop her. 
I let them see the look of peace on her face too, the calm dignity with which she met her end, as opposed to the terror which made me hesitate. I let her down. My voice flows to Chrissy. I should have died. She could not have lived with that, Chrissy replies, with certainty in her voice. You gave her a gift, allowing her to do that. I didn't allow. I would never have. That's when I realize. I could have stopped her. I'm Alpha. If I'd had my head in the right place, I could have forbidden her from doing anything other than standing outside that bloody salt ring. She chose it, Chrissy says. She chose to do it. I can't speak any more. I just let my feelings flood through into her. I don't have to do that. Being Alpha, I have the privilege of keeping whatever I wish secret, emotions included. But I need to share this pain with someone, and I know that Chrissy, with so much of her own, won't judge me. What do you need? She asked me. Is there anything I can do? I feel sick to my stomach. There's nothing anyone can do now. It was all down to me. I should have done more. I must change back, I say when I've gathered my thoughts. I need to talk to Oliver and Regine. I understand. We'll be with you. It's only then that I turn around and see them all waiting there. Lou, George and all the others who fled when Juliet took over my mother's pack. They've all been through so much. Lost so much. And now, thanks to me, the two dozen wolves who let me lead them have lost even more. I'm sorry, I say once more. As I make my way back, I'm divided. Part of me wants to go to each of the wolves individually and offer my condolences. That's what my mother would have done. But I don't know who was close to Esther besides George, and while I could find out easily enough by reading their thoughts, it seems like both an invasion of privacy and the mark of a crap leader. So I carry on, back to the chateau. It's an impressive building with three turrets, four wings and a kitchen big enough to cater weddings, which is just as well with the number of us who are staying here. There are also small cottages within the grounds that the witches have been using. I suspect having wolves coming and going at all hours makes it difficult for them to concentrate on magic or sleep. We try not to roam too late, though. Regine's been more than generous, but I'm not sure how much longer we can impose on her. When the situation requires it, we all come together for meetings in the formal dining room. Its chestnut table is big enough to accommodate us all. Three magnificent chandeliers hang from the ceiling. It's got the same floor area as an average family house, yet the floral curtains and deep red carpets and wallpaper give it a surprising homeliness. This is where I'm heading. Basara and the other witches are waiting. Many are comforting each other, their eyes already red-rimmed from crying. For a second, I think it's because of Esther. But then I remember Rhett. He knew them all. If it were not for him, none of them would be alive. Great. Even more people to hate me. The eight grimoires we managed to get out of the council vaults are open on the table. I hope they're worth the three lives they cost. I didn't want to start looking for spells until I'd spoken to you, Vasara says. If you agree, we'll take them to my cottage to work on. But if you'd rather we do that here, we can. It may take longer, though, given the uh, interruptions. It's fine, I say. You do what you need to. Take them wherever you want. Thank you. I hesitate. I have a question. It seems rather churlish, given what we've been through and the fact that we've only just got back. But I need to ask it. Do you think it will take long, I ask, to find a spell to help Ray? Vasara looks down at the books, then back up to me. There's a lot to go through here, and it may take more than one spell. I cannot say, but I can assure you it is my number one priority. Thank you. She nods to the other witches, who quickly close the books, and pick them up. You know where I'll be if you need me, she says, wrapping her arms around me for a hug. I hadn't expected she smells of earth, Mother Nature personified. There's something so very grounding about her. It's no wonder the coven holds her in such high regard. And if you find anything, I will let you know. Immediately. Vasara, I say, struggling to find the right words. About Rhett. I'm sorry I ever got him mixed up in this. She smiles. Rhett is over four hundred years old. Do you really think you made him do anything he didn't want to? Besides, we'll get them back. Trust me. 
The witches are filing out of the room, and Vasara follows them, the last to leave. For a second, I think I'm going to be alone for the first time since we escaped. I'm fearful of what will happen when there's no one here to help me keep it together. But as I look at the doorway, someone appears. Can we talk? He says. Chapter 4 If you'd asked me a year and a half ago, I would have said my relationship with Oliver was solid, utterly secure. Yes, I wasn't blind to the fact that he had a crush on me, but we were both able to get past that and concentrate on friendship. Me, Oliver, and Ray. We were a team, but then I messed it up. While he needs to shoulder a fair chunk of the blame, it's not possible to deny the fact that it all began when I stole from him. Working for Blackwatch, he had access to the one thing I wanted, information about vampires. So I stole a docket for a blood donation that was about to happen and took the girl's place. That was when Callan and I met. I guess you'd say it was the start of all our problems and marked the beginning of the decline in our friendship. Maybe, given the chance, he would have got past the betrayal of the theft. Only I screwed up yet again, going to a vampire bar, the blood bank, with Ray. We were devastated when we thought the vampires killed her that night. Now, I wonder if it would have been easier if they had. The thing is, no matter how much we hurt each other, we know the truth. Even with all the pain it causes us to be in each other's lives, it would be so much worse if we weren't. So he came to my rescue, first saving me from sticks in London, and then a second time, flying me away from almost certain death in Scotland, when my mother's pack was attacked. Then we went on the run from the vampires to Europe, and he did his best to keep me safe again. But then we crossed the line from friendship into something much more, and it blew up in our faces. When I left the chateau to get the grimoires, I didn't think we'd ever make things right between us again. I heard what happened, Oliver says, stepping in and closing the door behind him. I'm so, so sorry, nurse. And just like that, I run to him and crumple into his arms and cry. It all comes out now in great, childlike sobs. Time stands still, and I don't want it to move on, and for a while it feels that might actually happen. But then he breaks away from me. Chrissy came and spoke to me. I'm sorry about Esther. Were you too close? She was a member of my pack. I say to cover the fact that I don't know how to answer him. We hadn't known each other long, but the sense of loss I'm feeling is almost overwhelming. Of course, sorry, I, I know that. I, I didn't mean... I feel bad for his awkwardness, but not bad enough to try and make it easier for him. What could I say anyway? And Callan, Chrissy says you don't know what's happened to him. That Polidori, that... that he might... He stumbles over his words again, but this time I have no trouble finishing his sentence for him. Keep him alive so that he can torture him, rather than just killing him outright. Oliver shakes his head. Naz, I can't imagine how you're feeling right now. If there's anything I can do, anything at all. Thank you, but there's nothing any of us can do. And about us, there's nothing to say. That's not true. What I did, how things happened, I, I just want you to understand that I do. He runs his tongue between his lips like he's not sure how the conversation is going to go, as if me saying I understand is some kind of trap he doesn't want to walk into. You and I are friends, Oliver, at least... I hope we still are. Naz, you know I would do anything for you. And I feel the same. He reaches out and takes my hands, a look of relief flooding over him, but I'm not finished. I would do anything for you as a friend. I hope you know that, and I hope we can stay like that, but anything more... Well, that's behind us now. Okay. I study his face, trying to read it. I used to be able to predict how he'd react in pretty much any situation, but those days are gone. When he squeezes my hands, it's my turn to feel relief. I'll always be here for whatever you need, he says. Thank you, I reply. I feel there's more he'd like to say but doesn't want to risk it. Dropping my hands, I'm about to make an excuse and head up to my room when the door opens again. Standing there in a grey silk dress and black onyx necklace is the lady of the house. Is it true what they say has happened? You must tell me what has become of Carlin. Regine. I move towards her, 
I was just going to come and find you. So, it is true. She bows her head and lets out a sigh. Trying to guess how old Regine might be would be like trying to age a pebble on the beach. Seventies would be my guess, but that's based purely on looks and fitness. She has no problem saddling up a horse and galloping across her estate, and she's adept with an air rifle, too. But I suspect from some of the remarks she's made that she could easily be ten or fifteen years older. Regine, I'm going to do everything I can to get him back, I promise. I will make it my mission. Your mission? Like it is to save that girl imprisoned in my coal shed? My cheeks colour. I wonder what Ray has been up to while I've been gone. Callan dosed her up with enough vampire venom to knock her out, but it's not the first time he'd done that. And when she came around, her mood was less than sunny. It's only now occurring to me that we no longer have access to that remedy to keep her docile. We have the grimoires, I say, trying to sound optimistic. Vasara and the witches will be able to fix what the vampires did to her, and then we'll go for Callan and Rhett. Assuming they are still alive, she says. I dig my toes into the pile of the Egyptian rug beneath my feet. I don't feel like an alpha right now. I don't even feel like a wolf. I feel like a child who's just been told they've run out of chances. Regine sighs and speaks again. Nerys, it is you I fear for now. Callan is a big boy, but you... All this fighting, all this chasing. Are you not exhausted? I could certainly do with a nap, I say with a sad chuckle. At some point you must want to stop fighting, no? Very much, but not while there are people who need fighting for. She nods, as if this is the first thing she's in agreement with. Given that I'd like as much time as possible to plan, I broach the question that's been churning through me since the ferry. Regine, I know you want to let us stay here because of Callan, and then we brought the witches too, but with him gone, I would fully understand if you wanted us to leave. Her hands fly into the air. No, 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 do not even think of it. Do not say such a thing. Here is no home for as long as you need it. But we take up so much space, and we're so loud. And I am half deaf. You think noise bothers me? I spent far too many of my years in silence. But I admit I will miss his company greatly. Perhaps if one of your wolves or witches could accompany me on my evening walk, I would appreciate it. I can do that, Oliver says, stepping forwards. He's been so quiet I've forgotten he was even here. But I'm immensely grateful that he is. It would be my pleasure. She smiles graciously. Thank you. I don't suppose that you ride too, do you? Provide you don't expect any dressage moves. Fantastique. She smiles at Oliver, then turns back to me, the lightness in her expression fading. Thank you for fighting for him, she says. He thinks the world of you, you know. The feeling is mutual. She suddenly laughs, and it is almost like the trill of a small bird. Why couldn't we have just found ourselves a nice human boy? Wouldn't that have been so much easier on us both? I think it may well have been, but me... And easy aren't words that usually come together in the same breath. She nods knowingly. Don't worry, you have a good team around you, she says. And I know she's right, but it's not complete yet. First, I need to get Ray back on side. Chapter 5 We leave the dining room, while Oliver immediately steps into his new role and accompanies Regine over to her wing of the house, I take the staircase up to my room. My room. A strange thing to feel possessive over a space in a home that doesn't belong to me, in a country that's not my own. But I've stayed here longer than I've been anywhere else for quite some time. My student accommodation in London was little more than a place to sleep and store my books. I was barely at the wolf pack long enough to settle in there. And then I was on the run. Derelict buildings and abandoned barns, my only shelter. For a short while, a small flat with Oliver had started to feel close to home with a routine of sorts. But something about being back in this place, with its frescoes of heart playing cherubs on the high ceilings, feels like coming home to me. Although how much longer I'll have here, I don't know. Not long, I suspect, if Polidori gets his way. It's well past noon, and my stomach growls to remind me I haven't eaten anything today. Or yesterday, for that matter. But I can't face food. The taste of bile is still lingering from earlier. 
so I lie on my bed and stare at the ceiling. One of the cherubs has lost a bit of pink from its chin, and the blue sky is flaking in places. Will it ever be restored? Regine said no one had slept in these rooms for years before we moved in, so it seems unlikely. It's a shame. Something like this should be taken care of, preserved. Then again, maybe it shouldn't. Perhaps that's the kind of thinking that makes humans such a mess. Who's to say painting shouldn't be left to just fade away the same as humans do, the way all creatures do? Only Esther didn't fade. She was snuffed out. I stand and move across to the window. Half a dozen wolves are lying on the grass in a close circle. One is staring directly up at my room. Lou. Still checking on me. Still worried about me. I make eye contact with her for a second before closing the curtains. Even without tuning into them, I know how much hurt they're feeling. When a pain is this great, we don't need to change to wolves to share it. For a moment, I consider shifting and becoming the wolf in my bedroom so that I can listen in to what they're saying to each other. They wouldn't know I was eavesdropping, not unless I wanted them to, but what would it gain me, knowing more about how much they hurt and how much they feel I let them down? I lie back down and close my eyes. The effects of Vasara's tonic are fading, and every time I start to drift off, faces appear that I want to forget, and not just human ones. I try to resist, but I'm so exhausted that sleep takes over, and in my dream I see the newly turned vampire I met when Oliver and I were on the run together. She was so innocent. Yet I snapped her neck. I twist and turn. I wake up thrashing around more than once. And yet somehow I drift back into another fitful slumber full of screaming and tears. I'm eventually woken by a knock on the door. As I come to, there's a second, harder voice. Nerissa, says a voice. I could pretend to be asleep. Whoever it is wouldn't be rude enough to keep hammering away, particularly given what I've just been through. Then again, with that in mind, it seems unlikely anyone would come up here, unless whatever it is they want is important. Come in, I say, sounding more like a teacher than a twenty-something uni dropout werewolf, and the door creaks open. It's Chrissy. I never officially made her beta. It was one of those things that went without saying, as so much does in the wolf world. She was my mother's beta, her best friend too, not that she let that interfere with her responsibilities. She now offers me a sense of perspective and understanding of the wolf world, which helps make up for my lack of experience. I didn't mean to disturb you, she says from the doorway. If now's a bad time, I can come back later. I'm not sure later will be any better, I say, honestly. I understand. She lingers momentarily before stepping inside, and shutting the door behind her. A need for privacy means it is important, and even before she speaks, I know what she's going to say. I spoke to Vasara. She comes and sits on the end of my bed. She said you tried to bring the body back with you. Tried and failed. She said you were faced with an impossible choice. I shrug. I'm not sure what she wants me to say to this. There are others, other alphas who might not have even tried. I appreciate the sentiment, but it doesn't help. I once made the comment that I thought I'd be the worst alpha in history. Esther had responded immediately, telling me about one who, on his very first day, got insanely drunk, fell over, injured himself, and was immediately overthrown. You'd have to be better than that guy, she'd said. I wonder if she'd still think that was the case. What am I supposed to do now? I ask her. Without a body, we can't give Esther a proper funeral, can we? The short time I was with the pack, there was only one werewolf cremation, and I didn't attend it. I was locked in my cabin, awaiting a fate that I'd stupidly chosen for myself without knowing what I was getting into. Art and Lou told me about it later, over dinner, and I know what the ceremony entails. And without burning the body, dispersing the ashes and burying the bones, it would be meaningless. We'll think of something. Chrissy says, and whatever we come up with, tradition dictates that it should take place as soon as possible. If you'd like me to... No. I was her alpha when she stepped into those flames. She died to save me. It's down to me. Okay, but don't take too long. The pack needs closure. And, if I'm honest, I think that you do, too. Chapter 6 Several hours later, I'm still in my room, 
my head spinning as I tried to come up with a solution. Chrissy offered to stay and talk through ideas, but I told her I need to do this on my own. However, with the sun setting, I'm starting to regret that decision. What can we do? What can possibly compare to hundreds of years' worth of tradition? How can I return Esther's bones to the earth when I don't have her body? Maybe it's tiredness that's stopping me from thinking straight, or maybe I'm just lacking in imagination. But I don't see how we can have the ceremony. Lou appears with a tray of food. It must be dinner time. Marion cooked supper for us, she says, putting a plate on the bedside table. And you weren't there at lunch either, so I guess you'd probably be hungry. I'm about to say I'm not, but when I see the assortments of bread, cold meats and cheeses, turns out I'm damn near starving. Thank you, I say. She smiles, tight-lipped, worry evident in her eyes. If you want, I can bring you breakfast up in the morning, too. I know it's not easy for you at the moment, being with the other wolves. Not that anyone holds anything against you. Honestly, they don't. We all know you did everything you could. But I can fetch you food if you don't feel ready to leave your room just yet. Honestly, I love this girl. As an only child, without so much as a single cousin to my name, I feel like I've found a little sister in Lou. Which would be great if I could ignore the fact that she also has a brother, who's no doubt reveling in his new life in Juliet's pack. He's probably celebrating my mother's downfall, something he tried to bring about even before Juliet came on the scene. I squeeze my eyes shut and try not to think of art and all the shit things that happened from the day I turned up in Scotland. I should leave you, Lou says. Unless you want me to keep you company for a while. I mean, I can stay here and be quiet if you'd like that. I don't mind. I pick up a roll and take a bite, swiftly followed with a mouthful of cheese. A piece of ham and another lump of cheese later, I finally speak again. Actually, I say, there's somewhere I think I should go now. The witch's cottage would make a decent-sized family home. Two old properties knocked through into one. It's the type of place you see on those home restoration project programs. You know the sort where couples decide they want to move abroad to a country where they don't speak the language and ultimately end up going seriously over budget and having to jack the whole thing in. I've seen it from the outside plenty of times, but I've never been inside. I'm nervous as I knock on the door and wait. One of the younger witches opens it and immediately moves aside to let me in. Vasara's upstairs, she tells me, shutting the door behind us. I'll just go and get her for you. I can always come back later if it's not convenient. I'm sure it'll be fine. Won't you wait in there? She points to the left. An open doorway leads to an expansive kitchen, and I step in. If I hadn't known there was a coven of witches living here, this would have been my first clue. A large, unvarnished wooden table stands in the centre, the surface almost entirely covered with a mass of glass jars interspersed with burning candles. Bunches of dry herbs and flowers hang on the bare brick walls, and the room is flooded with strange aromas, not normally associated with cooking. These, combined with the heat coming from a fire burning with a strange, violet hue in the open hearth, quickly start to stifle me. I pull at the neck of my top, trying to let in a little air, but my efforts are in vain. Sorry about the temperature in here, a voice says behind me. I guess we're used to it. Let me get you some water. Vasara crosses from the doorway to an antique-looking fridge and pulls out a large jug of ice water filled with lemon slices and mint. The cubes rattle as she pours a glass and hands it to me. She pulls out a chair from the table and gestures for me to do the same. I'm sorry if you were hoping for some progress on the spell. We're all working on it, but it's going to take some time. The language used in some of the grimoires is very old, and our knowledge of ancient Lithuanian is only rudimentary at best. I promise, as soon as I have some news, I'll tell you. Oh, no, I say, realising she thinks I've come to check up on her. Oh, that's not why I'm here. I know it'll take time. I appreciate everything you're doing for Ray. No, I'm here for another favour. As soon as the words are out of my mouth, I know how bad this sounds. It must seem like I'm always on the take. I suppose I am the reason they've got the grimoires, but I'm also responsible for the fact that the vampires will now almost certainly ramp up their search for witches. I'm not sure it's a fair deal. What is it you need? Vasara asks. On the way over, it had seemed like such a good scheme. But now, 
feels ridiculous. I've got this idea, I say. The clearing I've chosen for the ceremony is a short run from the chateau. There's a small well nearby which reminds me of the one back in the village in Scotland. I wasn't sure how Regine would react to me asking to have a giant bonfire in the middle of the forest, but she shrugged it off in her normal, nonchalant way. It's easy to see why she and Callan got along so well. There's no drama with her, just opportunities. Of course, you're English. You love to do this each year, don't you? Yes, but there won't be any fireworks tonight. It's fine, just try not to set the house alight. I don't think we would all fit into the cottages. Not the way your numbers keep growing. Don't worry, the fire will be contained. With the location sorted, I ask only Lou and George to help me make the pyre. I'm not sure how it works normally, but this feels right, and I know they would tell me if I was doing something wrong. Chrissy appears briefly, possibly just to check on progress, and leaves again. We carry on collecting and arranging the wood. How high does this need to go? I ask, when it's reached about three feet off the ground. I think we're pretty much there, Lou says, stepping back to get a better view. Normally we'd have to make sure the top was level, you know, for the body. We'll make this one level too. I say, bringing over some wood I found at the back of the stables. Lou and George exchange looks. Then she turns to me, lips pressed tightly together, as if she's trying to stop the words from spilling out of her mouth. Of all the people I've ever known, human, wolf, or otherwise, no one has the skill for verbosity like Lou. The fact that she's forcing herself to stay silent means that whatever it is she'd like to say is probably important. I think I can guess what it is. Go on, you can ask, I say, laying one of the planks across the top of the pyre. I know you've been holding it in all this time. Her lips tighten even further, before she finally opens them with a small gasp. I guess it, you're the Alpha, and you probably know exactly what you're doing and everything. I just, I don't understand why we're building a pyre when we don't have a body. I mean, is there really any point? We could just do a ceremonial run or something, say a prayer to Eve, This seems like a lot of work when we've got nothing to burn. Who says we've got nothing to burn? It takes another twenty minutes to complete our task, by which time my hands are full of splinters and I smell like a mixture of moss and mildew. But it looks good. Sturdy. Which is important, given that I don't know how much weight it's got to hold. We should go in and get dressed now, I say, wiping the sweat off my forehead and probably leaving a dirty smudge there in its place. Tell the others to meet here thirty minutes before sunset. Lou and George stop in their tracks. Funerals always begin at sunset, he says. That's when the pyre is lit. I know, but this is not a normal situation, is it? Thirty minutes before sunset. Make sure the pack knows. Once they've gone, I reach into my pocket and pull out a small paper bag, which is nearly full to bursting, and start sprinkling seeds on top of the wood. Chapter 7 Leading is bullshit, and I hate it. There's almost never one correct answer to a given problem, just a range of solutions that could be right for some, but will most definitely be wrong for others. All you can do is choose an option that you hope will offend the fewest. And, right now, I don't seem to have achieved that. We're standing in the clearing facing an empty pyre. A reminder that I didn't bring back Esther's body. A sign that I messed up. And I've made everyone come out earlier than usual to witness it. I don't understand why you would want us to meet before the usual time, Chrissy whispers in my ear. The rest of the wolves are in human form, and most look pissed off. It's custom that funerals begin at sunset. I know, you told me. Respecting tradition is important. It connects us with our heritage. You must see how vital that is, particularly at a time like this. The sense of frustration in Chrissy's voice makes it clear that this is a big deal. I just hope that what I've got planned will be enough for them to overlook this change in ritual. I understand. I promise you. Then why are we here early? Because I'm not sure how long the next part will take. If the wolves seemed unhappy before, it's nothing compared to how they look at the sound of footsteps crunching through the forest, reaching their ears. Everyone stiffens. Eyes dart to me, and I feel their urge to change, but I block it. I won't let them do that. A moment later, Vasara leads her coven into the clearing. Nerissa, what are you doing? Chrissy hisses. Please, just wait. The air is still. 
I don't know if it's the witch's doing or it's just an unusually calm night, but it heightens the tension. I feel my heart pounding. Just let this work, I repeat to myself over and over again. The wolves are silent, glaring at the witches with undisguised malice. It's understandable. They've intruded on something sacred. But they're here at my request, and I'm Alpha. This is going to work. When they're all assembled, Fasara turns to me. I nod, and she lifts her hands towards the pyre. The other witches follow suit, and the chanting begins. Orgti de Soji, Orgti de Soji, Orgti de Soji. I hear angry exchanges between my pack members. What is this? What are they doing? Why are they here? Then one of them lets out a gasp and points, and all attention switches away from me and the witches to what she's seen. On the pyre, the seeds I sprinkled earlier are sending out green shoots, which twist upwards and produce leaves. It's a spell I've seen several times now, once in the coal store when Vasara first tried to free Ray, and twice in the vault of the Vampire Council, when she was searching for the strongest grimoires there, and when she revealed the hex on the doorway that would have killed us all. Even though I've experienced it before, I've never seen anything like this. It's truly mesmerizing. Sturdy stems are now covered in leaves, and small buds are beginning to form. It's hypnotic. Even though I know what should happen next, my jaw drops in amazement as the plants reach outwards to the ends of the platform. The leaves in the center rise higher, and those at the front curl and curve into the exact shape of a wolf's muzzle, then create the expressive ears. More grow and twist into place, and a luxuriant tail now lies flush against the wood, followed by front and back legs, and then pause. The last details fall into place, and a perfect green wolf lies on the pyre before us. There's one more surprise to come. As a human, Esther was striking, but as a wolf, even more so, with jet black fur and a bold white stripe running the length of her spine, and as the topiary reaches its final form, there is one last flourish, and the buds along the back erupt into a stream of white flowers. There's no doubting who this wolf is now. It is Esther. I turned to Chrissy, my eyes blurred with tears. Thank you, she whispers. I want to ask her if it really is okay, but I can't find the strength to speak. The witches' work done, they retreat respectfully the way they came, without so much as a word. I turn my eyes to the rest of the pack. Tears stream down their cheeks as they hold one another's hands, captivated. Next to me, Chrissy slides her own hand into mine and squeezes it tightly. You did good, Alpha. You did good. We cannot perform the complete ceremony, which would later involve taking the bones and burying them in places that were close to the dead person's heart. But we light the pyre, and the foliage wolf burns in a hundred shades of red and orange. And then, when nothing more than ashes remain, we transform into wolves and thunder in a circle until they lift into the air and disperse. With that, we have done all we can. As I ran with the wolves, they shared their memories of Esther, her ceremony, her marriage and life with Ruth. Some images of her featured my mother, too, laughing with the pack. Seeing Freya and someone's thoughts like this made it seem as if I were there, too, and that was enough to cause a new flood of pain through my heart. Given the speed with which the floor or Esther burnt and the absence of bones, the ceremony is over much sooner than normal. I should leave... I say just to Chrissy. I want to thank Vasara and the coven. Are you certain the pack would like you here? These are their memories to share. I have nothing to give. Besides, I want to thank the witches before they go to bed. I understand. We'll all run together tomorrow. I block further thoughts from her mind, as right now, I'm not sure what my answer is. At the cottage, Vasara is in the kitchen with three others whose names I don't yet know but feel I should. Then again, other than the rushed introductions when Rhett took me to their home, I've barely spoken to most of them individually. Nerissa, is everything all right? Vasara puts down her pestle. Did the figure last long enough? Yes, it was perfect. Better than perfect. This is why I've come. I want to say a huge thank you. No, don't be silly. Esther's sacrifice was for me too. 
for all of us witches. Without her, I shudder to think. I know. With nothing more to add, I scan the table. Along with all the paraphernalia of yesterday, a large book with yellowing pages and faded writing is open there. One of the witches is poring over it. Are the grimoires proving useful? I ask. It's a line she can see straight through. I don't doubt for a second, but she smiles as she answers the question I didn't ask. Immensely, although we have not yet come across a spell to help your friend Ray, I sense it will not be long now. I don't know if this will bring you any comfort, but we've mastered the uncoupling spell. I know it feels a little late for that. A silence descends. Because of the vampires, witches have had no access to grimoires for generations. The only spells the coven had were either ones just recently passed down or those they'd worked out for themselves, which sometimes had their drawbacks, coupling being the greatest of these. When Vasara placed the incantation on the vampires in the council building to immobilize them, she couldn't pick and choose. Every vampire was affected, meaning Callan and Rhett, too. That was the reason we had to leave them behind. Do you think they're still alive? I ask. I do, she replies. I have to. Chapter 8 Callan The rational part of me believes that only a couple of days can have passed. Noises that filter through from the street, the beeping of horns or blasts of music, indicate fairly accurately whether it's day or night. And yet every minute feels like an hour, and each hour a lifetime to my immortal mind. I've slipped in and out of consciousness so many times that perhaps my senses are not as accurate as they should be. That midnight bell may have chimed a thousand times, and I've just not been able to hear it. No, I'm sure it's only been twice. They've placed Rhett and me in adjacent cells, not for company, but so we can watch each other being tortured, no doubt with the aim of intensifying our misery. This strategy has been perfected over the centuries. While I've been strung up off the floor by my wrists, the metal rope tearing into my skin, they have slit the throats of over two dozen humans in front of us leaving them gurgling and broken on the floor, gasping for help. Meanwhile, the opaque window behind me is cracked open just enough to ensure a single sliver of daylight reaches my bare back. There must be a cloud obscuring the sun at the moment, but when it moves on, as it most certainly will, my flesh will start to burn again, enough to cause me immense pain, but not sufficient to kill me. How long do you think until they get bored with this? Rhett calls over. They couldn't use a sunlight trick on him. With his great age has come an impressive immunity to burning. So, instead, they clamped his wrists in reinforced stocks and pulled out his fingernails. It's just as painful as it would be for humans, maybe even more so given the connection to our venom glands. As an added bonus, he must endure the same pain every couple of hours when they arrive to repeat the procedure, possibly because of our ability to regenerate. He sounds casual, but I know what he means. How long until they stop bringing humans to slaughter in front of us? All we have to do is give them the whereabouts of Nerissa and the witches, and they will let us and all the waiting humans go. That's what they said, anyway. You are responsible for everyone who dies here today. Remember that. It was the last thing Polidori said to us as we once again refused to give him any information. The blood of the latest victim has stopped flowing now and it started to congeal on the floor beneath my feet. I know I'm not to blame for these deaths, but that doesn't make them any easier to watch. I realize that I'm sacrificing one life for another each time I keep Nerissa safe. Don't speak, I say to Rhett, trying to use as little energy as I can. Apart from the sunlight on my back, there are four thin wooden stakes in my chest, each less than a centimeter from my heart. Any sudden movement due to a surge in pain or even a large intake of breath could see one of them shift position with fatal results. This is another torture that Rhett shares with me, although he seems less phased than I am. He's not going to kill us, not until he knows where they are, so just stay strong, okay? Don't give him a thing. I go to nod, then remember the stakes. Stay strong. Sounds so damned easy, doesn't it? Chapter 9. Nerissa. Three days have passed since the funeral, and I'm at a loss to find something useful to do. 
possibly for the first time since discovering what I am. I'm truly lonely. The ceremony was a success, if you could call such a thing that, but since we burned Esther's wolf effigy, I haven't run with the pack. I'm not sure why. I know they hold no animosity towards me for what happened. George said so himself when he found me in the kitchen, picking at leftover chicken from that night's roast, around two in the morning. She'd be happy. She was a warrior and she died in battle, he told me. But she wasn't a warrior. She was a wolf. One of mine. I've also given the witch's cottage a wide berth, concerned that they would see my presence there as pressurising them to find a spell for Ray. Which, I suppose it would be. And with Oliver fully committed to his new role as Regine's chaperone, it has meant that I've had more time on my own than I would consider normal these days. Funny that. A year ago, being surrounded by people would have been abnormal. There's a knock on my door, and as it opens, I know immediately who it's going to be. She's the only one who regularly comes to see me and who would enter her Alpha's room without being invited. Great, you're here, Lou says, as though she thought that I might be somewhere else, despite the fact I've barely emerged in the past three days. I was hoping I'd find you. You know I already ate breakfast, I say, before she can try to force yet another pan of chocolat down my throat. I saw you in the kitchen, remember? Oh, this isn't about food, although Henri has made some rabbit terrine. You should definitely have some. I never thought I was a terrine type of girl, or pâté either, for that matter. You know, they always look a bit mushy, but it's really good. You should give it a try. I'll go down later and see if there's some left, if you like, assuming the pack hasn't already demolished it. For once, I don't try and stop her. Her chatter is like the white noise that gets your mind to switch off, so that you can get to sleep. I'm just considering this when she takes a seat at the dressing table and stops talking. There's a glint in her eye. What? I say. What is it? It's then that I notice she's carrying a rucksack, like the ones we took to the Vampire Council to fill with grimoires. I bumped into Arena in the library. You know the witch, Arena? Arena. Takes me a few seconds to bring her face to mind. Oh yeah, she's one of the young ones. White blonde hair. I didn't realise that Lou mixed with them enough to know their names, but I shouldn't be surprised. Lou's mission in life is to make everyone her friend, and the two are similar ages. Well, they've been working through the different spells and incantations in the grimoires. You obviously knew that because they're looking for something to help Ray, but in the process, they found other stuff too. Anyway, Arena was in the library testing one of them out. I'm sure this story has a point to it, but just like everything with Lou, it's taking a while to get there. I thought you might like to see. She comes over to the bed, unzips the rucksack and tips the contents out next to me. A dozen or so thin paperbacks. Books, I say, somewhat derisively, perhaps. Given that she was in the library, this is hardly surprising. But she's grinning like a loon. Open one. What? Go on, open one. None of them is particularly distinctive, so I pick up the closest one and open it to the first page, which it tells me the title, If on a Winter's Night a Traveller. It rings a bell. I think it might have been on one of my reading lists back in the day when I attended university. I flick to the start of the first chapter to see if I'm right, and I'm just getting into it when Lou pipes up again. So, she says expectantly. I look up, glowering at her interruption. What do you mean? Do I like it? Probably. I like most books. It'd be nice if I could read it in peace, though. Her grin is now totally insane, even by her standards. I'm obviously missing something, but I can't for the life of me work out what. She's bouncing on the bed now. Arena got this from the library. She stresses the last word like it's a clue. It's a library. What else would she expect to find there? The penny finally drops. Ah, uh, I didn't find any English books in the library. Where was it? How did Arena find it? I've been looking for something to read for months now. I thought I'd check the entire room from top to bottom. She didn't find it. She made it. Made it? Spelled it, bewitched it, or whatever you call it. All of these, look. I don't know what language they're in. French, I suppose. But now when you open them, they can be whatever you want. English, German, Estonian. I drop the first book and pick up another. Once again, it's in English. As is the third and the fourth. This is incredible. I know, she's only done small ones to start with, but imagine, any book you want to read in any language. 
She could do it to the original pages we have left of the Book of Eve, although I was hoping that Rhett would be able to go through that with us to fill in the gaps. All the positivity that this discovery has brought me disappears, as the mention of Rhett leads to thoughts of him, Callan, and Esther. I see an apology hovering on Lou's lips, but I don't want to hear it. As I get busy gathering the books together and start packing them back into the rucksack, there's another knock on the door. Wow, I'm so popular today, I say, trying to sound normal. I don't know who it could possibly be, given that Lou's already here and Oliver hasn't stepped inside my room since the incident, but at least a third person might help release the tension now between us. I'd assumed it would be one of the wolves, looking for Lou or me or both of us. But when the door opens, it's Vasara standing there. What is it? I ask, feeling like a schoolgirl who's about to be told off for having bewitched books in her bedroom. This is the first time I've had anything remotely occult in my room, and it's the first time Vasara's come up here. It feels like more than a coincidence. I can see from the dark rings under her eyes and the way her shoulders sag that she's tired. We think we found the spell to release Ray. Chapter 10 It's taken four days to get everything ready to attempt the spell. Some of the items Vasara needed were in her home in Italy, so two of her coven had to drive all the way back there to collect them. Then there was a purifying of the building to ensure no hint of darkness is lingering that Ray could somehow make use of. With the chateau having a long history for such debauchery as vampire parties, they took rather a long time. We wolves were banished from the house for two whole days, while the remaining witches burned incense and chanted incantations. But we're finally ready. Vasara came to tell me they would begin at sunrise. Never has a night felt so long. I stand outside the door to the coal store, wondering whether I should enter. I haven't been here since I got back from London. My only view of Ray has come from the CCTV cameras. It isn't just cowardice that's keeping me from going in. It's a safety issue. Every time she's got out of control before, Callan has been ready to administer a high dose of venom to knock her out. If she was somehow able to harness the darkness without him here, we'd have nothing to stop her. Last time she nearly killed Vasara before Callan intervened, and nothing seems to make her angrier than the sight of me. I wish they'd just get on with it, don't you? Oliver says, coming up beside me. There's still a tension between us, but for once, it has nothing to do with us. It's all about Ray, and what's coming next. Won't be long, sunrise, Vasara said. Why then? Something about the light after the dark helping to banish whatever's causing all that darkness within her? He nods. Do you really think we're going to get her back? He asks. Even if they can reverse whatever the vampires did to her, she's done some awful things. Helping the vampires torture the wolves in your mother's pack. Murdering the witch she was teaching her. And that's only what we know about. We have no idea what else they made her do before she found us. What if it was even worse? What if she can't come to terms with it? I know what he's saying. Ray was always the most empathetic of the three of us. Everything she's done recently is bound to have had an effect on her, whether she was in control of herself or not. We've all done a lot of things over the last year that we once wouldn't have thought ourselves capable of, but we're still here, and she'll have us to help her through it. My hand finds his, and we stand there, staring at the door. Sunrise doesn't seem so far off all of a sudden. After a while, we make our way to the front of the house. It's gone midnight, but a more accurate time than that, I could only guess. A fire pit burns there, its black smoke filling the air with the scent of cedar wood, the pack are lounging around it in human form. You don't have to be here, I say, joining them. I completely understand after... I struggle to find the right words, picturing the twisted and tortured body of their friend, after Ray's involvement with what happened to Alina. There's a uniform shaking of heads. She did what they made her do, George says. My brother was taken to Juliet's pack. I can't imagine the things that she's making him do, things he would probably find unthinkable doesn't make it his fault. Thank you, I say with sincerity. Besides, once she's free, maybe she can help you end Juliet's rule once and for all. My eye shoots straight to the speaker. Lou. What? She says. Everyone's been thinking the same thing. Besides, what wolf wouldn't fight to get Rhett, the father of wolves, back? 
The pack's gaze fixes on me, and I feel a shiver down the length of my spine. Taking on Juliet. If I do get Ray back, then what's to stop me? Fear, I guess. Fear of dying. It's not something we're going to talk about right now, I say. We don't want our energies to interfere with whatever the witches are doing. I'm not even sure if what I just said is a thing. But everyone falls silent. The fire crackles and spits, and I close my eyes, momentarily transported back to campfires with my father, laughing and joking and feeling like we had an eternity of good times ahead of us. Naz. Oliver's voice interrupts my thoughts and brings me back to the here and now. Only then do I realise I must have fallen asleep. The stars are fading as the sky changes from deep blue to turquoise. I look at him and he nods towards the door. Fasara is standing there, wearing a long white gown with lace sleeves and a matching hood that is drawn up over her head. Nerissa, Oliver, we need you in the house, she says. It is time to begin. Chapter 11 Oliver looks at me questioningly and I shrug. I don't know any more than he does why we might be wanted. I thought my part were over when we got the grimoires, but apparently that's not the case. We follow Vasara into the house and find the place is illuminated by what must be a thousand candles, all burning with a violet flame. Where's Regine? I ask. Regine is fine. I've placed a barrier spell around her wing of the chateau, and a general boundary spell on the whole building. Whatever happens in here, she will not be affected. It doesn't make me feel as confident as I would have thought it would. The fact a boundary spell is needed at all makes me nervous. I don't know what I've been imagining. A simple incantation, I suppose. This is going to be anything but. As we make our way through the house, I see runes marked on all the doors. They'll come off easily enough, Vizara says, noticing my line of sight. They're all chalk. Be careful where you tread. There are several on the ground, too. It's all precautionary. Let's just say I didn't want to take any chances this time. As we reach the door to the dining room, Vasara turns to us. I didn't explain your role in this before, because I didn't want you to worry or overthink it. What do we have to do? Oliver asks. Do you need us to hold her down? As always, Vasara's smile is gentle, and not in the least condescending, no matter how much I think his question sounds ridiculous. It would take far more than me and him to hold down an uncooperative Ray. No, all I need are your memories, the best ones you have of Andrea. Keep them to yourselves and concentrate individually on all the happy times you spent with the girl she was before all this, when she was your true friend. The older the ones you can summon, the better. Do you understand? Why? Oliver asks the same question that's in my head. Vasara nods slowly as if she'd expected it. The spell we're about to use will remove the darkness as entered her because of all the evil she was forced to perform by the vampires. However, we don't know how much of her true self has been lost. If we don't replace it with something, then the spell will be incomplete. She could be left in limbo, not so consumed by that darkness, but not a person you recognize either. Just a shell. The more you can give me, the more I have to work with. Would it help if we told you some of our memories or wrote them down? I ask trying to take in what she said. No, that's not necessary. I just need all the good things she's ever done to be at the forefront of your minds. That's fine, Oliver says, squeezing my hand. We can do that. Okay. Then, let's get started. She opens the door. All the furniture has been moved out. In the centre of the room is Ray, shackled to a sturdy chair. Her head is hanging forwards as if she's still drugged. Around the edge of the room stands the rest of the coven, all dressed like Vasara, quietly chanting an incantation. As we enter, Ray's head snaps up, and an initial look of indifference morphs into a sinister sneer when she sees me. I shoot a look at Vasara. Don't worry, we have her in a containment spell. She can't hurt you. Wow, look at this, Ray says. Long time no see, Nerissa Knight. I thought you'd forgotten me. My pulse rate rises. I want to answer back, but I can't. The more I communicate with this Ray, the more the wrong thoughts of her will be in my head, and I can't risk that. I need to think of the old Ray, the one who used to insist the three of us went ice skating before Christmas every year, 
and you organize an Easter egg hunt around Oliver's flat, using miniature bottles of spirits as extra prizes. What, not even going to say hello? That's disappointing. Still, nice to see you two in the same room as each other again. I didn't think that was going to happen after, well, you know. So, Oliver's forgiven you for sleeping with him while being in love with a vampire, has he? She's deliberately trying to get a rise out of us. From the way Oliver reassuringly squeezes my hand, he knows it too. She cocks her head to the side and tries again. Where is he, by the way, that vampire friend of yours? Haven't seen him in a while. I hope nothing bad has happened to him. I did very much like his midnight visits. But I see you've brought me some new witchy friends to play with. Did you tell them what I did to the last one I had? Now, how'd that go again? She opens her mouth, but Vasara gets in first. Nultitaiti Burke. Shock registers on Ray's face. It's as if the words have been stolen from her mouth as the spell that was on her lips only moments ago is silenced. The whites of her eyes glow in the dim light, and she scowls. Well, that's a new one, isn't it? I wonder how you did that. Not that it matters. Whatever magic it is you're using, you know I'm going to take it from you. And then kill you. Natadaiti Bertka. Natadaiti Jos Bertka. On the other side of the room, five of the witches extend their hands towards Ray, and the candles they're holding burst into life with violet flames. Ooh, you're pulling out all the stops, aren't you? But you know it won't do any good. Despite the bravado, I can see a flicker of fear in her eyes. What was she afraid of before all this? I think, trying to keep my mind focused on the old Ray. Nothing logical. She walked into a vampire drinking den after all, and outed herself to save me. That was just who she was. Selfless, determined, pig-headed and more compassionate than any other human I have ever known. The chanting increases in volume. Long vowels and harsh consonants blend into sounds that make no sense to me. The candles glow brighter until they're suddenly too much to look at, and I have to close my eyes to protect them. What's happening? Ray screams. You can't stop me! You don't know what you're doing, you bastards! I hate you! I hate you! I know those last words are directed at me. I'll kill you. You know I will. I'll hunt you down. I will kill you. This is not her, I tell myself. Think of the real Ray, the one who tried to persuade us to adopt a dog from Spain after seeing an advert for ones that needed rescuing. Think of what a great guard dog he'd make, she'd said. I don't need a guard dog, Oliver had countered. I'm perfectly capable of protecting myself. Besides, we're barely home. It would be cruel. Then we'll take him into the office. Just was all about inclusion, vampires, humans. Could be the first official black watch dog. There was a part of me that thought she'd actually do it. If there was anyone who could have persuaded Jessup to allow them to bring a dog to work, it would have been Ray. He loved her. Everyone loved her. I forced my memories back to the first time I met her, after I'd been caught breaking into black watch by Oliver. At our very first meeting, I knew she was special the type of person I wanted in my life. So if you're hanging out at Oliver's, she'd said, we need to set some ground rules. Firstly, do not let him have the remote under any circumstances. He has terrible taste in everything, and he has the volume so low that I swear even bats would strain to hear. Okay, I said, slightly taken aback as this beautiful young woman then opened the fridge and handed me a can of Coke. And secondly, pizza has to come from Mario's Pizzeria. Anywhere else is shit. I don't care what people say. Chain restaurants are nowhere near as good. And that was it. She'd slumped down onto the sofa, throwing a cushion aside as a signal that I should join her. And from that moment, we became a threesome. Dinners, films, bowling. And then came the day Blackwatch kicked her out. She'd been distraught, angry and hurt at the betrayal she felt, even greater because of her own inherent loyalty one that never wavered. Even with my eyes closed, I can tell the candles are growing brighter still. The insides of my lids are glowing red, and the heat is causing sweat to bead on my brow. Tam saturi yakapalikti, tam saturi yakapalikti. As the chants grow louder, Ray's voice persists beneath him as she writhes in her chair. I will destroy every one of you! I will send you all to hell! 
I quickly refocused on the Ray who'd let herself into my flat in the morning after I'd worked a double shift at Joe's and brought a cup of tea to my room. The Ray who made me drink healing tonics, who wrote me birthday messages on the back of old envelopes. My Ray. The heat is so intense now it's starting to stifle my thoughts. I fight through it, thinking of the nights spent drinking in clubs together and dancing unashamedly to Taylor Swift, the guilty pleasure behind our hard streetwise personas. I let that feeling of freedom shared swell in my chest. That was what it was like to be with her, to be friends with her. It made you believe you were capable of anything, that you could be anybody you wanted to be. The chanting stops. I realise the heat has subsided too, and the light intensity has gone back to normal. Can I stop thinking about her now? I don't know. It's hard to keep focusing. I tentatively open my eyes. Ray is there in the centre of the room, her shackles still in place, but she's not shouting any more. Her body is crumpled over, her head on her knees. Andrea? Vasara whispers softly. Oliver puts his arm around my trembling shoulders. The after-effects of the sweating have left a chill on my skin. She doesn't seem to be breathing. My stomach plummets. The worst thoughts roar through my mind. I go to step closer, but Oliver holds me back. Wait. He whispers. All of a sudden, Ray gasps for air, and her head goes back. Her eyes dart around the room, unfocused and erratic. Her gaze lands on Vasara and a look of confusion appears on her face. Then, she sees me. Her lips begin to move, but there's no sound coming from them. I can feel my heart pummeling against my ribs. It's not worked. I don't know what I'm going to do. But as I try to gather my thoughts, tears fill her eyes, and she speaks. What have I done, Naz? What have I done? Chapter 12 None of us moves. Oliver is holding me tight. Naz, Oliver, please. Please help me. Help me. We say rooted to the spot. She's done this before, spoken to me like we were still friends, lured me into believing that the old part of her was still in there. I won't be fooled so easily again. I look at Vasara, awaiting instructions. The spell is done, that much I can tell. The candles are out now, and dark tendrils of smoke weave their way up to the ceiling. But just because it's finished, it doesn't mean that it's worked. Naz, please help me! Ray says again. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't. They made me. They... I didn't know how to stop it. I... They... Her words are lost to the sobs that rack her body. Did the new Ray cry at all? I can't remember. Possibly when she was trying to manipulate people, but like this. Great gulping breaths. I don't think so. This reminds me of the night after she got kicked out of Blackwatch. This is the real Ray. Breaking away from Oliver's grip, I rush forwards. Naz, stop, he yells, but I'm already there. My arms around her. I'm so sorry. She weeps into my shoulder. No, I am. I am so, so sorry. I shouldn't have left you there. I should never have left you. Oliver has run over to us now and kneels, enveloping us both in his embrace. The subtle shades of dawn have been replaced by bright morning sunlight, and the three of us stay locked together. The witches depart, and Oliver goes to remove the chains from Ray's wrists. But she pulls back from him. Leave them on, she says. I don't trust myself. We trust you, I say, glancing at Oliver, who reassures her with a smile. The darkness could come back. I can feel it. Waiting. We're here. We won't let that happen. Her eyes dart around the room as if something is hiding, lurking. Just for now, please, she says. We don't want to push her, so we release her from the chair, but leave the manacles on. I help her to her feet, and we slowly guide her to my bedroom. Oliver leaves us at the door, kissing us both on the head in turn. When we lie on the bed, she immediately falls asleep in my arms. A few hours later, there's a knock on the door, and Oliver reappears with a tray of food. Grey? Ray sits up. I wasn't sure if I'd imagined you here. My mind, it's a little foggy. I'm here all right, 
he says with a broad grin. I haven't seen him forever. I figured you two might be hungry. Famished, we say in unison and turn to each other, laughing. Good to see some things never change, he says, putting the tray down on the bed. My stomach growls at the sight of a simple sandwich. My eating patterns were never particularly regular as a human. I just grabbed something when I was hungry, a snack at Joe's as I worked behind the bar or a burger from a van on the way home. And since I became a wolf, my life's been so unpredictable that whenever there's something on offer, I eat it. I gesture to the shackles on Ray's wrists, and Oliver's hand goes to his pocket for the key. I'm still not sure, she says. Well, I ain't feeding you, so it's that or go hungry, he tells her. She smiles, and Oliver removes the heavy metal restraints and leaves us to eat in peace. We tuck into the food. Do you think you're ready to come downstairs yet? I ask, and swallow my final mouthful. Everyone here is kind, the witches, the wolves. They're good people, and they all understand what you've been through. Her eyes go towards the door, but I feel she's looking beyond it, maybe trying to take in all that's happened. There's no easy way of asking how many of the horrendous things she did she can actually recall. So I stay silent. Finally, she shakes her head. I'm fine here for now, if that's okay. Her shoulders hunch, as if she's trying to make herself as small as possible. There's no rush and I can stay here with you as long as you need me to. She nods quietly, her eyes closing for a moment. Sure, she's not the wise-cracking Ray I remember, but considering how long we've been up here alone together without her trying to kill me, we're definitely making progress. I'm sorry I said those things to you and Grey. I don't remember what they were exactly, but I know it wasn't good, and I said them to hurt you. Don't worry, Oliver and I are fine, and in your defence, I don't think what you said would have hurt so much if it hadn't been so close to the mark. But like I said, we're good now. And you're a werewolf, she says. I can't believe it. Not just any old wolf, an alpha wolf. Her eyebrows lift, and a smile lights her eyes a fraction. Wow, things have changed. They have. Do you remember that I met my mother? Your mother? She frowns as if she's trying to locate memories lodged deep in the back of her mind. I feel like I know that, but your mother died when you were little, didn't she? Apparently not. She's dead now, though. She was killed. She was the alpha before me. Oh, I'm so sorry, Naz. If I had any part in what happened, then it was not of your doing and you need to stop feeling guilty. I know, she says, but the light in her eyes has gone. I understand what it's like to shoulder blame and suffer shame, far better than most. But then, just like that, her expression changes. She sits bolt upright, her eyes shining, and her mouth open. You found witches! She gasps. You found other witches. My heart soars at this, the first sign of her taking an interest in life again. I did, I say, and they want to teach you how to do magic properly, if you're up for it. Chapter 13 Despite her initial excitement, we put off going to the coven. Ray's strength isn't what it was. After struggling to walk as far as the staircase, she quickly changes her mind about being ready. I'm not surprised, I say. You need more food. You've barely eaten since you've been here. She covers her mouth and shakes her head, as if she can't stand the thought of eating again. What about a cup of tea instead, then? Oh, that'd be nice. I go down to the kitchen. There's no electric kettle here, just one of those old copper stovetop ones that takes an age to boil. But today it seems ridiculously slow. By the time I get back to my room, she's asleep again. I put the mug down and settle into an armchair to watch her sleep. My room has a small ensuite, and the following morning I persuade Ray to take a nice, long bath. There are towels in that cupboard and you can help yourself to anything in the wardrobe, I tell her. Although if you want something stylish, you will be out of luck. Wolf life doesn't exactly lend itself to high fashion, I'm afraid. You're staying with me, aren't you? I can, if you want. The familiar nod follows. It's almost childlike, and I remember what Vasara said about the danger of removing the darkness and leaving her empty. Did Oliver and I not provide enough memories to fill the void? Is this all there is to her now? She pulls her T-shirt over her head. How long it's been on her, I dread to think. When Callan was here and she was dosed with venom, 
Oliver would take the opportunity to clean her up and dress her in fresh clothes, and that hasn't happened since over a week ago. But it's not the level of grime that leaves me stunned. It's the state of her skin. Her lower neck, upper arms and back, are covered in scars from multiple bite marks. How did I not know this? Oliver must have seen it, and yet he didn't say a thing. Are they all from the attack at the blood bank, or did the vampires do this to her later? The sight makes me sick to my stomach. How could she have lain on injuries like these? Is there any shampoo? Takes me a second to realise that she's asking me a question. Yes, I say, turning away, trying to disguise the fact that I was staring. It's all in there, just help yourself to whatever you need. She disappears into the bathroom, and I drop onto the bed and sob. The bath definitely seems to have helped relax her, but it's hard to ignore how her once rich, dark skin appears dull and faded. Her body is frail, her nails bitten raw, her lips cracked, and any brightness in her eyes only fleeting. Freshly washed, she also decides to try and eat again. It's not much, just a few mouthfuls of soft cheese on crackers. Her taste for tea has returned, though. Overly sweet tea with almost as much milk as hot water, so that's something. While Vasara and her friends have kept their distance, not wanting to overwhelm her, Oliver has come to see Ray whenever he's not with Regine. When I return with a plate of fruit around tea time, I find she has another visitor. I brought some cards, Lou says, sitting cross-legged on the bed, a game spread out between them. Cards, I say, raising my eyebrows. Yeah, I found them in one of the drawers in our bedroom when we first arrived, and Mum and I have played a bit at night, so I came to give them to you, but you weren't here, and then Ray asked if I wanted a biscuit. She's got loads that you keep bringing her, and she can't eat them all, so I did, and then we just started playing. You don't mind, do you? Lou's run-on sentences are something that always make me smile inside, no matter how much I just want her to reach the damn point. At least this time there aren't a hundred questions to keep track of and try to answer. Just the one. You don't mind, do you? I take a moment to figure out what my answer should be. The part of me that does mind comes from a place of worry about them being alone like this. Yet seeing Ray doing something incredibly normal with her, I think that maybe I will have to loosen the apron strings a bit if she's to get back to her old self at the pace we need her to, assuming that's even possible. I've been for a long run, the longest since Vasara and I came back, in the hope that it would clear my head a little. Maybe it has. I'm glad you two have met. I say, noticing how at ease and relaxed Ray looks. Then add, How long have you been up here, Lou? Oh, not long. We've had a few games of shithead. We tried rummy first, but I couldn't remember the rules. I have to check them with Mum, and I think this is our second game of trumps. It's our fourth, Ray says, placing a ten of spades on top of the deck. Crap, is it really? Lou says in surprise. I didn't think we'd been playing that long. I told Mum I'd only be gone a few minutes. She's going to try and contact Adam and find out what's going on at Juliet's camp. I should probably get going. She starts to stand up, but then stops. You don't mind, do you? She asks Ray. It's fine, she replies, with a warmth that I'm pretty sure only Lou is able to extract from people so easily. OK, well, if there's anything I can get you, just tell Naz. She'll know how to get a hold of me, although if you can ask Naz to find me, then you can probably ask her for whatever it is you want. Lou... I say, with just a hint of firmness in my voice. I thought you need to get going. Crap, you're right, I should. It's nice to meet you properly, Ray, as in the non-killer sense that is. We'll catch up again later. And after what is an impressively long farewell, even by Lou's standards, she bounds out the door. There's a moment when all we can hear is the thundering of feet on the stairs. I'm the first to speak. So, you met Lou then? She seems awesome. She is, I'll be honest. She's been a godsend at times. She's a lot of fun and really sweet. Part of your mother's pack? I nod. Her mum, Chrissy, was one of the betas. She's my beta too, unofficially. They kind of adopted me. They're a great family. I come to an abrupt halt. Art was also a member of it, I think. Art, who tried to have me killed so that Daniel, one of the other wolves, could move himself up to alpha position. They were punished for their actions. Something I don't want to think about right now, let alone share with Ray. So I changed the subject with a smile. Shall we finish this game, or would you prefer to head outside? It's a bit drizzly, but we've got raincoats. We could go for a walk. Meet a few of the others, if you like. 
You don't need to have been friends for as long as Ray and I have to get the subtext in the word others. I'm talking about the witches, and she knows that. She puts her cards down, and for a second, I think she's going to agree to an outing. But instead, she shakes her head ever so slightly. I think meeting Lou was enough for today. You don't mind, do you? It's only then I see how tired she's looking. Oh, there's no rush. No rush at all, I say, wishing that were the truth. To my surprise, when I wake the next day, instead of being fast asleep beside me, Ray is standing looking out the window in the dull morning light. There's a little more colour in her cheeks, and she's clearly made an effort to brush her hair. She senses I'm awake and turns to face me. I'm ready, she says, then takes a deep breath as if to bolster her energy. I'd like to meet the witches now. Of course. Vasara said you could go to them any time. We could head straight there. Chapter 14 As Ray takes tentative steps across the lawn towards the witch's cottage, her gait is quite unsteady. I can't believe you found a full coven. I couldn't trace even a single witch. Don't beat yourself up. We didn't find a single witch either. We found a vampire. Rhett, he happened to know where the witches were. He's been protecting them and keeping them hidden for generations. A good vampire. They do exist, although they're few and far between. Where's he now, this Rhett? Is he here too? Does he live with the witches? No, he and Callan... I think about how I can word this without adding more to her mountain of guilt. We'll talk about them later. First of all, we need to get you up to speed on the magic. She stops. Naz, I'm worried I can't do this. What if something happens? What if I lose control? This is what the witches are here for. You're not on your own. Vasara and the others have been doing this all their lives. And they've helped people fight black magic too. They have. They have. There's a small twinge of guilt in my gut. It's not a lie as such. Vasara told me about a boy in their coven who'd been experimenting with dark spells to try and harness more power. But the darkness in him wasn't a patch on what she felt in Ray, and that's not something I'm about to tell her. Just take your time, small steps, there's no rush, and if you feel uncomfortable with something, then just let them know. I'm going to go for another run, but I'm leaving one of my pack close by, so if I'm needed, he can call me back immediately. You're not staying with me? I think it's best I don't. Regular werewolves are a rather new territory for the witches, but don't worry, I won't be far away. We continue walking. I can almost hear the cogs and wheels turning in her mind, the hundreds of thoughts whirring through her brain. I know this can't be easy, but Vasara was adamant that the sooner she started performing white magic, the quicker she would heal. As we reach the cottage door, I hug her. Remember, there's no hurry. Just do as much as you feel happy with, and if you need to stop and take a break, say so. I will. I knock, even though I know it's unnecessary. I could see the curtains twitching from the moment we drew near. My knuckles have barely left the wood when the door swings open and Vasara stands there, dressed in bright orange. Welcome, welcome, both of you. Vasara, this is Ray. Ray, this is Vasara. The old lady smiles. She emits so much energy that I wonder how anyone could meet her and not know that magic runs in her veins. Come in, my child. We've been looking forward to meeting you. With one final glance back at me, Ray steps across the threshold of the cottage. I'll be nearby, I say to Vasara. I know, she says, and a second later the door closes in front of me. I release a heavy sigh of relief. This is it. This is what we've been waiting for. Now Ray is with the witches, they can concentrate on getting her up to strength for what comes next, and it should also give the rest of us a bit of breathing space. I turn around to strip off my clothes and transform for my run, but before I've even taken an arm out of a sleeve, an amber wolf is bounding towards me and turns into a human. Chrissy, is everything all right? I ask. We've had some news, madam, and it's not good. Chapter 15 Ray As a child, I always believed I was different, unique, special. But then again, who doesn't? What child doesn't imagine they could have superpowers, allowing them to freeze water, run faster than a train, or fly over buildings? I've met lots who did. But the fact is, I was different, and not in a good way. It made me wish my superpower was invisibility. I was a child with no parents. 
I was one from a series of foster homes who moved schools more times than I'd had birthdays. I could fit all my belongings in a rucksack. My most treasured possessions were the few gifts given to me by those carers who'd seen me as more than a number in the system. I know Naz had a brief experience of foster care too, but it wasn't the same, although I've never say that to her. But at 14, she would have already had a sense of who she was, and she'd at least had a father up till then who loved her and taught her she could be anything she wanted to be. Her parents were gone. Mine never existed, so it was just me. Until Blackwatch. I joined the army at 16, signing up as soon as I could. I learned later that Blackwatch gets a lot of its recruits from the military and the police force. I've often wondered what made me stand out. What was it that made Jessup choose me from the thousands of files that must have crossed his desk? I never actually asked him. Not sure why. I guess I was afraid that if he thought about it too deeply, he'd realise he'd made a mistake, and I'd be back on my own. Blackwatch was the first group of people who felt like family to me. I'm sure this would have surprised some of them, even though we weren't just regular colleagues working from nine to five. It would have been impossible to experience all that we went through together, the things that we saw and not come out of it something more. So much so that I believed our bonds were even stronger than those of a family. We chose to stay together and probably shared more dark secrets than any other group of people on the planet, including that allowing a vampire to drink your blood was part of our training programme. I would have walked through fire for each and every one of them, and I was certain that they would do the same for me. And then, Oliver and I found that grimoire. Even now I can recall the smell of that dust-filled room. I can feel the cobwebs sticking to my fingers as I dug my hand into the hole we'd made in the bricked-up fireplace and then the smooth, leather binding of a book. I hadn't realised what it was, even with the magic so close to my heart. As far as I was concerned, I was just a Black Watch operative on a mission to collect a grimoire so that it could be handed over to the vampires. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if I had known... Oliver and I could have told Jessup that the tip-off was a hoax, and I could have kept the grimoire myself. I could have learned magic on my own terms, rather than be force-fed by the vampires, made to perform spells which tore my soul apart, piece by piece, blackening it, blackening my heart until I believed that was the colour it was meant to be. Even when I met Naz again and saw her joy as she realised I was still alive, it didn't register. Nothing did beyond my desire for the darkness within me to grow even stronger. But now I'm here with other witches, and I don't know if I want to laugh or cry. The older one, Vasara, leads me through into the kitchen. Why don't you take a seat, she says with a reassuring smile. She was the one who performed the spell that freed me, I'm sure of it, just as I'm certain I saw her before that. Something makes me think that I hurt her, or at least tried to, but... My emotions don't match up with my memories. Everything's muddled, distorted or incomplete. It feels like I'm watching a movie with the wrong soundtrack and with foreign subtitles on, and all the while loud music is thumping away. I can't focus properly on anything, and even if I could, I wouldn't know which storyline I'm supposed to be following. Would you like a drink? She asks. I was just going to make myself one. We have some homemade elderflower cordial that's very refreshing. I hate elderflower, anything, I always have. Tastes like highly scented soap. But I hear myself saying, Oh, that would be nice. Thank you. She pours an inch or so of yellowish liquid from a large glass bottle and tops it off with fizzy water. You have questions, I assume, she says. Things you would like to know, to learn about? I take a sip of the drink. It's syrupy, but not as unpleasant as I remember. Perhaps being starved by vampires has changed my taste buds. I'm pondering this when I realise she's waiting for the answer to a question I didn't listen to. What is it you would like to do here today, Andrea? She tries again. So, I grip the glass a little tighter and tell her the truth. I'm scared this is going to make me go dark again. I won't let that happen. We know what to do now. There's a churning in my gut, and I want to tell her that whatever she thinks she knows, she doesn't. If I don't have control of myself, how on earth can she but I don't. Instead, I say, I just want to learn. I want to learn what I am, what I can do, what I shouldn't do. I want you to teach me it all. She smiles. 
and the skin around her eyes creases into a myriad of fine lines, giving the impression that she is a repository of the wisdom of ages. Naz already told me she's incredible, that she can speak many languages and even make seeds bloom on her hand with just a few words. That's a lot, she says. We'd better start at the beginning. It's like the first day of school, but an exciting one where the teachers want to reveal every mystery of the universe and every fact they share with you makes you hungry for a thousand more. As I am sure you are aware, we have rarely walked freely, Vasara tells me. It's a sad fact that we've been persecuted for almost as long as we've existed, but there have been periods of peace. Before the vampires made it their mission to purge us from existence, Covens lived for generations in the same village or town, much the same way as ours has more recently. Some were over a hundred witches strong. But where did the first witches come from? Naz told me a story about Eve and the werewolves. Is there something like that for us? I may not have a family history, but perhaps an origin story could go some way to satisfy this gnawing need to belong that I've had all my life. Some believe that when the first vampire appeared on the earth, so did the first witch, a pure light to counteract the darkness. Others say that witches have been here since the beginning of time, and one discovered the darkness that created the first vampire. Which do you believe? Neither. Or both, I don't know. Another theory is that all humans were born with power like ours, able to read the earth and harness its energy for the good of nature, and we are simply the only ones who remember how to do it. But again, I cannot say whether there's any truth in that either, and it's not important to me. I don't believe where we came from or who we once were should define who we can become, which is what? Beings of light and good. Beings of light and good. Well, that sounds pretty cool, but I don't have a clue what she means. Part of me wants to tell her this, but the rest of me just wants to start learning, for her to teach me exactly what I'm able to do. So I keep my thoughts to myself, fearful that anything I say might delay things. Vasara hesitates for a moment before continuing. I should tell you that I believe you have a great deal of power in you. Most witches find that their energy resonates particularly strongly with certain frequencies in nature. For some, that may be water and weather patterns. Others find they have an affinity with plants or animals. From what I hear of your recent encounter with Nerissa, you were able to both control the weather and block her from changing into a wolf at the same time. An image of a house in a wood and Grey and Naz fighting for their lives appears in my mind. The word control feels like a bit of a leap. Sure, I knew what I was doing, but that was because the vampires had given me specific skills in order to immobilise them. I'm not sure I could have done anything else, even something as simple as raising a feather off the ground. I can shatter glass too, I blurt out. It was the first spell I did, without even meaning to, before I knew I was a witch. For the first time, Vasara is tight-lipped as she observes me with a slight look of apprehension. That's when I notice the hundreds of glass jars on shelves lining the walls of the kitchen, filled with various herbs, flowers and other bits and pieces, not to mention liquids. And there's what looks like distillation equipment set up on one of the side benches, too. Maybe we should start outside, then, she says. Chapter 16 Naz, what has he told you? What do you know? Adam has given us the locations of six new nests. Six. And not only that, but they're also sending out wolves to protect them. I never met Adam. He bravely joined Juliet's pack, having been a loyal member of my mother's, and has been working undercover there, feeding us intelligence about her plans and garnering news on the vampire's movements. He's not in a position where he automatically gets inside information, so his updates are slow in coming. He has to work with what he can get. On average, he's told us about one nest a week over the past few months, and we've eliminated as many as possible without exposing him. But six? That's simply unheard of. They must suspect we're behind the attacks if they're doing that. Chrissy's voice confirms my own thoughts. Shit. We knew Polidori and Juliet were going to catch on at some point. There could only be so many arson attacks they put down to accidents. And these are just the ones Adam knows of. He thinks there are a lot more. Well, they're definitely ramping things up. 
That many new vampires, all with the ability to turn others. Oh, it doesn't bear thinking about. A shudder flows through me. It comes from Chrissy, but exactly mirrors what I am feeling. And how many wolves are they sending to protect each location? It varies, but he thinks around a dozen. Crap. I was hoping her answer was going to be one or two. From what I knew of Juliet's wolves, they're strong. Stronger than us because of the harsh way she trains them. With numbers like that, I wouldn't bet on us winning a fight. We need to get to those nests, Naz. Polidori knows we're out here. He'll come for you with huge numbers if we don't strike first. That doesn't matter, but we have to stop these vampires. Her sigh reverberates through me. I know that, but we can't take them all on. Not on our own, we can't. I pad back towards the cottage, expecting to turn there and collect my clothes from where I left them hanging on the back of a garden chair. Only said chair is currently occupied, as is the one next to it. Vasara and Ray are together, doing magic. No matter how many times I've seen flowers growing from seeds held in the palm of a hand, I still find it mesmerizing. But this time it's so stunning that it's causing the hair along my spine to stand on end. They're small blue flowers, forget-me-nots, I think. But it's not what they are that makes them so special. It's who is creating them. Ray's eyes are glistening, her hands trembling. This is exactly what it was meant to be like when she found herself. This is what she was searching for. I just stand and watch as a surge of emotion floods through me. She makes a whole bouquet now, changing the blues to yellows, extending the petals to form dandelion heads, then shifting form and colour again to produce daisies and violets and vivid purple irises. Only when her hands drop to the table and she reaches for a drink do I change back to human. My days of trying to maintain any sort of modesty are long gone. Impressive, I say, gesturing to the pile of flowers. Ray's smile is self-effacing but sincere. That oh, was nothing, really. That's not true, for Sarah counters. It would take a normal apprentice months to perfect the germination spell. For you to manipulate it so easily. She lets her voice trail off and turns to me. Nerissa, did you need something? We are going to stop for food in a minute, if you'd like to join us. I shake my head. Thank you, but I said I'd have lunch with Lou today. I just need my clothes behind you and wondered if you and I could have a word. That wasn't exactly subtle. It's obvious that I want to speak to her about Ray. It's fine, Ray says, taking the hint. She gets up and passes me my things. I was going inside to get some more water anyway. Her cheeks colour a little as we glance at the nearly full bottle standing on the table. You can do me a favour, actually, Vasara says. Could you go to the living room and ask the girls for the masking spells? They'll know the ones I mean. And if you could fetch some lavender and arrowroot, that would be great. Ray nods, obligingly. Whether or not she really believes Vasara wants those things, I'm not sure. But she disappears, anyway. So, how's it going? I ask when I'm sure Ray is out of earshot. Incredibly well. She has power. A lot of power. Because of the vampires. Possibly, but I think it was always there. Did you say she was abandoned as a child? As a baby, yeah. Well, that would make sense. For her to be so strong, I suspect both parents were magical. Even that warlocks are even rarer than witches. They were probably fearful that they were leaving a trail that would make them an easy target for vampires. So they gave her a way to protect her. There's no way I can be sure, but I believe so. It's a familiar story, mothers abandoning their children to protect them, and my thoughts go instantly to Freya. I still have a tough time forgiving her for what she did, even if I understand it more now. She had to choose between her pack and her daughter. She was in an impossible position. More than once I've asked myself if I would have done anything different— but I never managed to come up with a satisfactory answer. If I've learned anything in the last year, it's that you don't know what you're capable of until push comes to shove. The invitation to join us for lunch was genuine, Vasara says. Amina has cooked a quiche, and I swear that girl's magic is in the kitchen. Oh, thank you, but I'll get back to Lou. I'll leave Ray with you and the others. Was there anything else? Thing is, we heard from Adam today, the wolf in the other pack. Juliet is sending wolves to guard new vampires in nests that we have to destroy. 
This is what you were doing before, wasn't it, when you found Rat? Yes, but then they weren't protected. She pauses, her eyes clouding with worry. So what does that mean? My throat has gone dry and there's a lump there that doesn't want to budge. I've asked so much of the witches. Even before the promise of the grimoires, they packed up their homes and followed me here to save Ray. Then Vasara risked her life when we broke into the Vampire Council, losing her oldest friend in the process. But if you don't ask, you don't get. And right now, I desperately need them. I swallow. It means I have to ask for your help again, and I think it will involve Ray teaching you a spell. Chapter 17 Ray, you don't have to do this if you're not comfortable with it. The last thing I want to do is pressure you into anything. You're kidding, I've told you already. This is what I need. Turning flowers pretty colours is nice and everything, but I want to help. I need to make up for what I did to you and those other wolves. How many times do I have to tell you it wasn't your fault? She smiles sadly, in a way that shows she clearly doesn't believe me, even though we've had this conversation many times in the last 24 hours. I take her hand and squeeze it, and we turn to face the gathering I've assembled. It's quite a sight, all of us together. A dozen witches and nearly twice as many wolves, mainly in groups of three. Two wolves to each witch. It feels wrong teaching people who know so much more than me, she says in a whisper. But I don't have your power. Only Vasara comes close. We need them to be able to do this, and the only way is if you teach them. But if you feel it's too much for you or sense the darkness again, just say the word, and we'll stop. We've chosen one of the biggest lawns. It's now littered with flowers of all shapes and colours, from where ray has been relieving her tension by doing easy magic. I have to say this form of stress relief is far better than creating thunderclouds or trying to strangle people with ivy. She coughs and clears her throat, ready to speak. But when she does, it's so faint even I can't hear her, and I'm standing right next to her. Clearly, from the way they're still chatting, no one else did either. Okay, time to listen up, I say, clapping my hands. The wolves fall silent straight away, the witches following suit soon after. Here's what's going to happen. Ray and the witches have already gone through the incantation that she used before, and Vasara has worked on it with me, too. And you're sure it's safe? Lou asks, bouncing on her toes. I know you said it was and everything, but it's pretty scary. Can we have a safe word so the witches know when to stop? Of course, if you want to arrange that with the witch you're practicing with, it's completely fine. But remember, you need to be fighting her the whole way. Give it everything you've got as if your life depends on it. Because it will. Lou is silent, as are the others. But it's not an easy silence. It's one thing trusting your alpha and knowing that you're fighting for a greater good, but it doesn't make it any the less unappealing. Remember to turn back immediately if it doesn't work. We have to keep trying until they get it right. Okay, as soon as you're ready. The incantations start, and immediately over a dozen wolves appear on the lawn, interspersed with frustrated witches. I look at Ray, who gives me an apologetic shrug. We watch as wolves morph between their two states, sometimes so quickly that there's barely time to blink. It doesn't take long to realize that it's not going well. The witches are meant to be stopping the wolves from changing, and right now, they're not having much success. I don't know what more I can do, Ray says. I told them the incantation, and they're so much more experienced than me. Why not work alongside them? You were practicing other spells earlier together, weren't you? She gestures towards a sycamore tree in the distance. We were trying small ones. We grew that this morning. I may not know much about magic, but producing a full-sized tree from a seed between breakfast and lunch doesn't feel like a minor achievement to me. Go and help them, I say. Give it a try. I need to speak to some of the wolves anyway. There's a moment of hesitation as she sucks in a lungful of air and sighs before making a beeline for the witch who's working with Lou and George. Part of me wants to watch, or better still, listen in, but as I'm about to take a subtle step forward, a throat clears behind me. Do you think this is going to work? Oliver is dressed in jeans and riding boots, and from the smell of him, he spent the morning out riding with Regine. I'm grateful he's here. My sounding board. My confidant. It's got to. We don't have enough time to come up with another plan. I'm sure they'll get it eventually. Fasara had it down in less than 15 minutes with Ray teaching her one-on-one. 
The Sora's the strongest witch they've got, Oliver says. Besides Ray. Besides Ray. We fall silent and watch her. Lou and George are still human, and I'm expecting them to change into wolves at any second. But they don't. Lou stamps her feet on the ground, growing more and more cross by the second, while George just looks mildly perplexed. The witch next to Ray, on the other hand, is grinning from ear to ear. Her cheeks are flushed with satisfaction, right up until the moment Lou snaps into a wolf. A snarling, unhappy wolf. Knowing they're now well on the way to success, I wander between other groups, stopping now and again to observe. I'm aware that Oliver is trailing me. I finally stop and allow him to catch me up. What's wrong? he asks. What do you mean? I know something's up. It's Ray, isn't it? I'm about to say he's being paranoid, but stop myself. It's not Ray. It's the wolves. The wolves? Well, they'll be fine. I think some of them might actually be enjoying this now. The atmosphere seems good. I know, and they're working brilliantly with the witches. That's not the problem, though. I don't think they've thought through what it all means. What they'll have to do. I don't want to spell it out for him, because I don't want to give voice to it myself. Thankfully, Oliver's a smart guy, and he cottons on fast. Killing other wolves. Killing their own kind, he says. If it was only that, it would be hard enough. But the enemy they'll be facing will be wolves trapped in human form. Humans, not wolves. And it won't matter what they are inside, it's humans they're going to be killing. Wolves have such a strong sense of honour, besides which some of them will be old friends, relatives even, from before. They must realise that, surely. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just not sure they've considered the full ramifications. This reminds me of the story my mother told me of how, as a young wolf, she was ordered to kill another member of the pack who was in human form. She reluctantly obeyed, and it sickened her. It's what made her leave, and she never forgot the horror of what she had done. Now here I am, about to go against what she stood for. Chapter 18 We train for three days straight, and my uneasiness continues to grow. On the evening of the third day, Chrissy and I are sitting outside, watching the sunset as the other wolves practice on the lawn with three of the witches. Things have progressed, and the aim now is to see how many a single witch can stop from changing at the same time. I just wish we had a big enough pack for them to get more practice in. Adam's estimate of twelve wolves per nest is just that, an estimate. For all we know, we could turn up at one of them and find three dozen there. It's unlikely, but not beyond the realms of possibility. The problem, Chrissy says, is that there's no way of separating the good wolves from the bad wolves, the ones who are there under duress from those who are happy to follow Juliet's orders. So in that case, we'll have to kill them all then. Do we? What's the alternative? We can't let them live. They go running back to her and she'd find out we have witches on our side. And then there's no telling what Polidori would do. I leave the rest of the sentence unsaid to Rhett and Callan. That's not the only consideration, of course. The future of the entire world is at stake. It doesn't change the fact that Callan is always there in the back of my mind, and Chrissy doesn't need the wolf link to know this. Have you thought about asking Vasara if there's a spell she could do to find out if they're still... still... alive? Yes, I have. I asked her as soon as we got back. She said there is, and if they were human or even wolf, it would be fairly straightforward, but it's difficult given that they're not technically alive. She just doesn't have the power she'd need. She doesn't, but maybe. Chrissy tips her head towards the scene on the lawn. Ray is demonstrating to the other witches. She's on her own in the centre of the wolves, and every one of them is still in human form, fighting with everything they've got to transform. Some are even on their knees, as if crouching will somehow help. A minute passes, then another, and nothing changes. The witches are cheering, and Ray's cheeks are so red I can practically feel the heat coming from them all the way over here. Maybe she's got someone who is powerful enough now, Chrissy says. Before you ask, I'm completely happy doing this, Ray says, anticipating what I'm about to say before I even open my mouth. I realise that perhaps I've been a little overprotective, but it's hard not to be. In the last week, I've seen a complete change in her. 
It's such a short time ago that she was terrified of trying even a simple spell, for fear of falling back into the dark magic pit. But now here she is, casting runes, positioning candles, and leading the circle of witches. Regine has loaned us an item connected to Callan, a book he gave her when she was young. He wrote a dedication in it as well, so that should help, but I need something of Rhett's too. I nod. Putting my personal feelings aside, Rhett is more important from the wolves' and witches' perspective than Callan. Here, Vasara says, stepping forwards and unclasping the necklace she always wears. Rhett gave this to me, many years ago. Of course, I knew they were close. I saw that when he first took me to meet her, and again, on the way to London. But she's old enough to be his grandmother, in appearance at least. This thought makes me uncomfortable. That's how it would be eventually, for Callan and me. Ray has said that I don't need to be here, but I must. It's not that I don't trust her, I trust all of them, implicitly. But if she discovers that Callan is gone and I'm not present, then one of them is going to have to come and tell me. I know from bitter experience that friends having to break bad news is harrowing, so I'm here for all our sakes, theirs and mine. Okay, I think I'm ready, Ray says, and casts her eyes around the circle once more. She's burning black candles, lots and lots of them, and there are purple petals scattered everywhere. I've no idea what flower they're from, but they're certainly pungent, and combined with the thick smoke, they're creating a heady experience. I'm tempted to go over and open one of the windows, but then realize they're probably closed for good reason, and refocus my attention on Ray. She's taken both items, the book and the necklace, and has placed them under bowls of water. If I understand this right, we can channel their essence through these connections to them, and if their spirits are still present, if they're still alive, so to speak, the water will move. Move? I ask. What do you mean? It will ripple. We practiced earlier with something belonging to one of the coven, and the bowl practically tipped over. The reaction was so strong. But Callan and Rhett are not alive in the same way. I know, but it's the best we can do. If we see any disturbance of the surface, it will be enough. She doesn't sound too confident, and I really can't blame her. I focus my attention back on the bowls, and try not to think about how foul the air is. No one else seems to have noticed. Okay, time to start, and I can't stress too highly that there should be no interruptions. The chanting is slow, all the voices in unison and yet it somehow sounds like a harmony is being created. Ripples. That's what we need, just ripples. Raskite giù cieles, paraditi saval polska. Raskite giù cieles, paraditi saval polska. I realise I didn't ask how soon they got a reaction when they practised earlier. I know this is massively different, but it would be nice to have some idea how long I should give it before I let the panic set in. It already feels like it's been too long. It can only have been a minute, possibly not even that. I feel my breath wobble and hold it in, trying to control it, before letting it out again, too loudly, apparently. One of the witches glares at me. With my stomach now churning, I force myself to do shallow breathing, a bit like they tell you to do when your baby is about to be born. It seems to be a 50-50 split between witches whose eyes are open and those who have them closed. Rays, for instance, are tightly shut, while Vasara is staring intently at the bowls. As I should be. It's not easy to see in the near dark, but the candlelight is reflecting cleanly off the water surfaces as if they're mirrors. Nothing. Vasquite Giusielas, Paraditi Savoposca. Still, nothing. The witches who had their eyes closed have opened them now, and are staring at the bowls, defeat appearing on their faces. They start to look towards Ray as if waiting for a sign from her before calling it a bust. Finally, her eyes open too. She stares at the water. It's perfectly still in both bowls, not the slightest ripple. I turn to Vasara and see tears trickling down her face. She's not alone. My cheeks are wet. The witches stop incanting. Even Ray... Everyone is silent. She looks at me and opens her mouth, and I know what she's about to say. There's no hope. They're gone. But she's barely drawn a breath before Vasara cries out, Look! 
Look there! The movement on the surface of the water is tiny, smaller than a ripple caused by a falling petal. But it's there. And what's even better? It's replicated in the second bowl. Chapter 19 I can't believe how quickly everything has come together. We'll be travelling in groups of six, two witches to four wolves. Only mine is the exception. Each has been given a location to target, which will allow us to hit all of the nests at the same time. As we gather, I repeat the rules for the umpteenth time. Be clear, be firm, the key is not to put yourselves in danger. And remember to approach only in daylight hours. If you arrive at night, camp out until it's safe to strike the next morning. What if they smell us coming, or while we're camping? George asks. They won't. You'll be travelling as humans, remember, so the witches can cover your scent. Even if something goes wrong with that, the vampires and wolves won't be monitoring for humans. You get as close as you safely can, announce your demands, and give them the chance to cooperate. If they don't do so immediately, and you're able to, offer them one more chance. You spell it out clearly again. Make sure they know what the consequences will be for them. That way, if the worst happens, it's not on you. You'll bear no responsibility. You will have given them a free choice. I say it with as much confidence as I can muster, but it still feels wrong going up against other wolves when we all should be fighting vampires. But Juliet picked her side, and her pack follows her rules. We've discussed this until our throats are dry, and this is the only way I can see it working. Let's hope we can save a life or two. Chrissy will stay here, keeping in contact with Adam and the rest of us, as long as we're in range. She'll also make sure that Regine is safe. When you're done, come straight back here. For Sarah and Ray have already put the spells in place on you. Now, any questions before we get moving? Some of us have a long way to go. A tense silence envelops us all like a cold draught. I get it. No one wants to say anything because that will make it feel too real. But it is real. It's happening. Now. Despite all the apprehension that normally goes with attacking vampire nests, now compounded with the added problem of wolves protecting them, I'm strangely excited about the trip. I think that's mainly because of the company I'll be keeping. Ray, Lou and I are travelling as a threesome. Part of me wishes Oliver were here too, for nostalgia's sake, but he's got enough to sort out back at the chateau. Besides, it's nice to give Lou and Ray the chance to get to know each other better. It feels like we're going on a girly weekend, doesn't it? It's not just me that feels like that, is it? I think it's down to the train. I've never been on one before. Can you believe that? It's not like couldn't go on them. Freya was cool about all that stuff, but you know how it is. There was just no point. We never went far enough to warrant getting a train, but maybe when all this crap is over, we could actually go on a girly weekend. Maybe Prague or, or Amsterdam or, or Budapest. Have either of you been to Budapest before? What am I talking about? You guys did loads of travelling, right? Ray, any chance you have a spell that would keep Lou quiet for the rest of the journey? I don't think there's magic strong enough for that in the universe. Ray laughs and opens a can of Coke. The nest we're heading to is on the outskirts of Bilbao, on the north coast of Spain. We've no intel other than a vague location, but it's okay. That's all we've been given before. I don't know if there have been any witch and werewolf team-ups in the past, but this grouping is definitely a good call. Whatever cloaking spells have been put on us, they're working a treat. This is the third train we've been on, and every conductor has walked past us as if the carriages were completely empty, while, to anyone else, they look completely full. Immense power and free public transport. I think I'll always travel with a witch in future. Why don't you guys get some sleep? Lou says, having ignored our less than subtle digs about her constant talking. I don't mind taking a shift on watch after I get something else to eat. I'm just going to head to the food cart and see if they've got any of those muffins that they had on the last train. Did you guys try them? They were amazing. Also, I was wondering, do you think alcohol affects your magic powers? Have you checked? It might be nice to have a tipple, and you never know, it might even make you stronger, low in inhibitions and everything. I'm going to put my foot down as Alpha here and say that this would not be the best time to test that possibility. You're not my Alpha, Ray says with a smirk before turning to Lou, but she's probably right. Maybe that one should wait. We'll save the drinks for on the way back. I wouldn't say no to one of those muffins, though. With a grin that's irritatingly infectious, Lou stands up and moves out into the corridor. Muffins coming up! With Lou gone, it's eerily silent. She's right, you know. It would be nice to do something normal at some point, Ray says. I think normal is a long way off for us right now. I know, but that doesn't mean we'll never get there. 
The silence lands again. I'd love to know what's going on in her head, though I suspect it's probably similar to mine. It would be great to let our hair down. It feels like most of my life I've been hunting or hunted, often both at the same time. I'm not sure I'd know how to live any other way. I think I'm going to close my eyes for a bit. I say, taking off my jumper and using it to make a pillow against the window. Tell Lou to wake me up when she needs a break. Ray nods as I shuffle around into the comfiest position I can find. When my eyes close, she speaks again. Naz, yeah? I love you. I love you too. We've taken the train as far as we can go. The location we've been given is Gorbeako National Park, but... That's a pretty extensive region to search, and the cold is far more intense here than back in France. The trees are entirely bare, and the frost crunches beneath our feet. Time for us to change, I say to Ray, flicking off my shoes and handing them to her to stow in her backpack. Another advantage of travelling with a non-wolf. Someone to look after your clothes when you need to transform. If you sense anything untoward, just signal us. We'll let you know as soon as we detect the nest. You've got the blocking spell on, haven't you? Do I tell you how to do your wolf job? Ray says by way of an answer. That's another nice thing about having her here. None of that constant deference that I get from the pack. Moments later, Lou and I stand shivering as she takes our clothes from us. We transform, instantly grateful for our thick coats and tough paws. How you doing? I ask Lou, her nervousness already filtering through to me. You don't need to be worried. I'm not. Well, okay, I am, but I'll be fine. I mean, they're not going to fight us, are they? I can't give her the answer I know she wants to hear. If they do, then you don't have to worry. I'll do what needs to be done. Normally, Lou would object, make a point of how she can do anything that I can, which, given she's been a wolf years longer than me, is true to some extent. But she stays silent, and I feel guilt flooding her mind. There's nothing to feel bad about here, Lou. Besides, you never know, they might all agree to come with us. I'm about to speak again when I catch a scent on the damp ground. Lou stops. She smells it too. A shiver runs through her, one that exactly matches mine. They're here. They're close. I guess it's time. Chapter 20 We hear them before we see them. They're sitting outside in a small garden behind a structure that looks like it could have been a stable at some point. We knew there would be a building, of course, somewhere to keep the vampires safe in the daylight hours. Thanks to Ray, they don't hear our footsteps as we approach, and they won't be able to tell that we're anything special either, now we've got our clothes back on, just three girls, out hiking. They look like a normal group of friends, just sitting playing cards and chatting. One of them is sharpening a knife on a stone. Given the wolves have all the tools they need at the end of their paws, this must be a sign of boredom. It's good to know that my pack's not the only one that's having to go without Wi-Fi and internet for the present. Seven, Lou whispers. It could be a lot worse, but if this goes south, then it's going to be seven wolves that I'll have to deal with. They finally see us. One of the women places her cards face down on the table. Propiedad privada, she says. Sorry, we're English. I reply. She smiles. I said, this is private property. She speaks with a Devon accent. One of Juliet's pack, then. You'll have to head back. The path's about half a mile that way. You'll see it. There's a river running beside it. If you hit the lake, you'll need to double back on yourselves. She points in the direction that we came from, obviously expecting us to thank her for her help. When we don't speak, one of the others stands up. You heard her. This is private property. The building's due for demolition. It's not safe. You just need to get back on the hiking trail. I can feel Lou trembling beside me, the realisation of what she might have to do growing more intense by the second. Ray is chanting softly to herself. Thing is, I say, stepping forwards, we're not here for the scenery. We're here to kill vampires. In less than a second, they're all on their feet, eyes flashing. The woman who spoke originally lifts her hand to steady them. Who are you? Honestly, I thought my reputation would precede me, I say. That's disappointing. Nerissa, she spits. Behind her, eyes widen and worried glances are exchanged. Nerissa, 
daughter of Freya, and Alpha of Northpack. You made a huge mistake coming here. You're going to die. No, I'm not, but I'm worried about you. Her laughter at this statement is cold and condescending. You think you three can take on all of us? There are more of us, you know, in the woods. They'll be back from their run soon. We'll let them feast on what's left of you. I'm almost certain this is a bluff. She's just trying to unnerve me. Call them now, I say. Get them back. It'll save me having to repeat myself. Her eyes narrow, her gaze scrutinising. With barely a dip of her chin, she gestures to one of the men, who strips off. Cassidy, he calls, a tremble in his voice. Just tell him to get back here, she orders impatiently. The bad news is this means she wasn't lying about there being other wolves here, but given that we were expecting a dozen anyway, that's not much of an issue. The good news is they're about to find out that this fight isn't half as straightforward as they thought it would be. Cass, the man shouts now, the fear in his voice apparent to everyone there. What is it? I can't do. Can't do what? I can't change? What do you mean? Behind her, another person starts to panic. I'm the same. I can't change either. I I can't transform. The blood drains from her cheeks now and her eyes lock on me. What have you done? She spits. I've told my pack what to say when they reach this point, how they need to be clear and forceful, but not aggressive, not until it's absolutely necessary. But now I'm faced with the situation, I'm wondering if they're finding it as hard as I am. We don't want to fight with you, but we will if we have to. We're here for the vampires. We can't let you have them. We have our orders. I know you do, I understand that. But they didn't cover you not being able to defend yourself, did they? That means you're in a somewhat grey area where Juliet's rules are concerned. That should give you the flexibility you need. Her eyes remain narrowed. They're an impressive colour, I notice, as I return her stare as determinedly as I can. Deep mahogany, but so bright in places they look almost red. What are you going to do to us? That's up to you. I sound surprisingly calm, considering how much my heart is hammering in my chest. The vampires die now. There's no question of that. It's my turn to offer a slight nod to Ray. With the slightest flick of a hand, the stables go up in flames. A witch! Cassie screams, Get the witch! Three of her people, still in human form, run towards Ray, but Lou is already there, her wolf teeth bared, snarling and stopping them in their tracks. This is up to you, I say. You can come with us. It'll be a long walk, but if you agree, you'll be safe. You'll not be harmed in any way. I submit, says the first man who failed to change, dropping to his knees. Cassidy looks at him in disgust. And if we don't, then I think you know how this ends. You'll kill us like this, in human form. How cowardly. Your alpha had my mother shot by a sniper rather than face her in combat, so let's not go down that path. Trust me, your pack will lose. Now, this is your only chance to join us. There will not be another and I do not go back on my word. It's up to each of you to decide. Her face contorts and snarl, but behind her, I see the rest are considering their position. The one on his knees is soon joined by others, and in less than a minute, only Cassidy and one of the men remain on their feet. My stomach twists in knots. Can I really do this? Can I really kill humans? But what choice do I have? If I let them go, Julia and Polidori will know that we have Ray on our side, and then the witches will be hunted too. It's either them, or us. I will make it swift, I say, hoping that this will be enough to make the remaining two change their mind, but there's nothing but pure hatred on their faces. Behind Cassidy, the stable is now engulfed in smoke, the flames having died down together with the screams of the vampires inside. They were humans once, too, but their blood isn't on my hands. It's on Polidori's. That's what I keep telling myself. I close my eyes and prepare to change, when a voice comes from behind us. Naz! Lou! Chapter 21 I'm struck by a wave of nausea so fierce I almost stagger. I somehow manage to stay upright and turn to look behind. Four men are standing there, all naked, but it's the one who spoke that holds my attention. The one with a scar across the part of his face, 
where his left eye should be. The wound is healed but remains pink and puckered and difficult to look at, not only because of the way it stretches the surrounding skin into an unnatural shape, but also because it reminds me of her, of Freya, and what he tried to do to us. He'd been one of my first friends in the pack, and however hard his betrayal was for me to come to terms with, it cannot have been a patch on what his family went through. What Lou suffered. She transforms. Art, she says, trembling so fiercely it's as if the cold has penetrated to the very marrow of her bones. Lou. He breaks into a smile, tears glazing his single eye. I didn't know if you... if you and Mum... She's made it too. She's good. Her voice quivers, like his. They're both rooted to the spot, and certain looks flash between the ones kneeling. You must come with us, Lou says gently to Art. Tears are now trickling down her cheeks, and there's none of her usual nervous chatter. She's just a little girl, looking up at her big brother who she's missed more than I could possibly imagine. Please, please come back with us. You'll be safe. Art sniffs and wipes tears away with the back of his hand. I... Juliet... He stutters, lowering his head. I... I... I've been so gripped by his disfigurement that I hadn't looked at the rest of him. But as his head drops, my eyes move down his naked body. Scars and bruises in different shades of purple and green litter his skin. A couple of the others behind him have similar injuries too, but not all. If I had to hazard a guess, I'd say that it's down to whether they're a part of Juliet's original pack or from my mother's. Although given how Art had tried to topple Freya, I would have thought he'd automatically be one of her favourites. If this life has taught me anything, it's that nothing is ever clear-cut. I've missed you, Lou, he says with a fraction more composure. I've missed you too, she sobs. It's a private moment that we shouldn't be intruding on, but we don't have any choice. The stable is just a smouldering pile now, and we have to move on. Naz, Ray says quietly, I know, I know. I move away from her, towards the brother and sister. Art, the vampires you've been protecting are all dead. You either come with us, or it's the end of the road for you. For all of you, I say, looking around at each of the others in turn, before settling my gaze back on him. Even before he speaks... I know what he's going to say. I can see all the pain and guilt there. What I did, Naz, I was an idiot. And I know I have no right to ask for your forgiveness, but this is not the time or place for that. I say with a sympathy I never thought I'd ever feel for him again. Come with us. Join us. And we'll talk later. He nods. Slowly at first. And then with more conviction. A smile playing at the corners of his mouth. Lou rushes forwards and wraps her arms around him. I thought this trip would be only about pain. Out of all the shit that we've gone through, this is a scene I could never have imagined, and seeing them together again like this, I feel as if I've been given a new lease on life. I'm getting to witness what real family love can be like, and it's mesmerizing. Ray is watching them too, a sad smile on her face, probably thinking of the family that she never got to know. Everyone seems caught up in the moment. Which is why we don't see what happens next. Until it's too late. No! I hear Lou shout and see her push away from Art. With no time for me to even register what's going on, she dives towards me and hurls me aside, away from Cassidy, who is also flying through the air, with a knife in her hand. Chapter 22 Lou, Lou, change, you must change, please, just do it, come on. Art is on his knees, pleading with her. It takes me a moment to make sense of what has just happened. One second I'm standing there, savouring the brother and sister reunion, and the next, I'm on the ground, looking across at Lou, lying, with a knife in her chest. There's blood everywhere, it's pooling on the grass around her, Fear is in her eyes, and all the colour has drained from her lips as she tries to speak. Mum! Mum! It's okay, Lou. I've got you. I've got you. I want Mum, Artie. I, 
What, Mum? I'm going to get you too, I promise. I'll get you back to her. I... <coughs> I... <coughs> she coughs, and blood bubbles from her mouth. Please, though, just try to change. Your body will fix this. Tears are pouring down Art's cheek and mixing with the blood on the ground. The knife is still in her back. No one dares remove it. Cassidy has thankfully backed away. Ray, I say, struggling to speak, is there anything you can do? There must be something. She's trembling. I'm sorry I haven't learned any of that yet. Take me, Art says, jumping up. Witches can do that, can't they? Swap one life for another? I've, I've never. Use me, please. Now. I don't know how. For Eve's sake, you can't just stand there doing nothing. At least try to save her. Ray looks at me, desperately seeking an answer I can't give her. Is there anything? I ask, hopefully. I'm already holding Juliet's wolves in human form. I don't know if I can do that and attempt something else, something I've never done before at the same time. We could lose them both if I get it wrong. I don't care, Art screams. I don't care if I die. Just save Lou, please. Just save her. This is what true love looks like, when you're willing to give up everything for another person. Ray looks at me again. She's frantic, and so am I. I don't have a clue what to do. This can't be happening, is all I can think. Lou's the best of us, the one who always encourages everyone, keeps a smile on our faces. I can't focus my thoughts, and she's fading before our eyes. Please change, Lou, I whisper. But I know the truth. If that dagger has pierced her heart, then it won't make any difference. The moment her bones snap and reform... It's still going to be there, and she'll bleed out. Possibly before she's even completed the transformation. Her breathing is so shallow, her chest is barely moving. I look at Ray again. If she attempts it and it goes wrong, then what do I tell Chrissy? That I found one of her children, only to lose them both. How could she ever come back from that? If she has art, would that be of some consolation? Might it lessen the pain just a little? There's only one choice I can make but it breaks my heart. Art, I kneel beside him. You need to tell her you love her. Make her feel safe. Talk to her. No. No. His face is contorted in anguish. There's nothing any of us can do. His cry cuts through the air, more bone-chilling than any howl I've ever heard. It's okay, Art, Lou manages to whisper. I got to see you again. I got my big brother back. Naz... Shh, shh, don't talk. Try to change. Save your energy for that. Pain flashes across her face and she shakes her head. He's good, Naz. He has a good heart. I know that. Don't worry, I've got him. Art and I are good. You don't have to worry about that. Tears silently weave their way down her cheeks into her hair. There's so much blood now. I can't imagine how her heart is still beating. I wish Mum was here. I know you do. Art says. You have to put up with me instead. She somehow manages a smile, and I think maybe she's going to say something about all the trouble he's going to be in when he gets home. But she doesn't. A second passes. Then another. And that's when I realise. She's gone. Some of the other wolves who arrived with Art are crying too, trying to comfort one another. I was right then. They were part of my mother's pack. I'm struggling to know what to do. The stink of smoke from the fire is now mixing with the smell of blood. Lou's blood. Cassidy is on the ground. I thought she was keeping quiet out of deference, maybe even shame at what she'd done. But now I see it's down to Ray. Despite her own pain, she's holding this whole thing together for us. Red heat flows in my veins, and anger I never knew existed pumps like fuel through my body. You will pay for this, I say to Cassidy. But I've barely taken a step towards her when Art springs to his feet. No, Naz, I'll do this. I get to do it. For Lou. I look at Ray. Is this something I should stop? No, I decide. Cassidy is the one who started it. Art can finish it. He moves forwards and kicks her. But when she looks up back up at him, she's grinning. I always knew, she says, spitting blood. I told Juliet she was wrong to trust you. He lashes out again, and again. 
She must be in pain, but she won't show it. She just laughs harder with each kick. Art! I grab him by the elbow. This is not the way to do it. I don't care. She's going to pay. She has to die. Okay, I get that. But not like this. I can see it's taken this tragedy for him to realise where his loyalties lie. And it's not with Juliet anymore. It's with his family. Which means he's on my side, too. I look at Ray. Let him transform, I say. Let him end her that way. Chapter 23 By the time he's finished, five more dead bodies have joined Lou's. Cassidy and the man who refused to come with us originally are among them, as are three of the others who arrive later, swiftly dispatched with teeth to the throat. The clouds have dispersed, and the sun is bright above us. The sky is that clear, crisp blue that you only ever get in winter. Yet here we are, surrounded by death. It's a strange juxtaposition. Art has returned to human form and is kneeling beside his sister. Someone has closed her eyes. I don't know if that's better or not. She's dead. Guilt seems to have been my default emotion since I started this damned mission all those months ago back in London. But what I'm feeling now is something much worse. My heart is so heavy I can barely breathe. Thanks to me, one of the brightest lights I've ever known has been extinguished. Thanks to me, Chrissy has lost her daughter, and her son has just killed five people. Before we arrived here, I was worrying how I was going to bear the weight of murdering any walls who refused to join us. But that seems as nothing now. We need to burn the other bodies, I say to Ray. She nods, and a moment later there are light and yellow flames flicker up to the sky. The supernatural fires only take a moment to reduce the dead wolves to ashes, at which point flowers start to grow where the bodies had lain. Delicate tendrils spread out over the earth. No one will find these remains. Not that I expect anyone to come looking for them. We should go back, I say, resting a hand on Art's shoulder. It's a long journey. What about Lou? I can't leave her here. I won't leave her in the same place as them. Ray steps forwards. I can perform a spell to preserve the body so we can take her home. Art nods tenderly stroking his sister's hair, pushing the tear-soaked strands back behind her ears. We can wait a little while, though, I say. In the end, we only stay long enough for the remaining wolves to gather their things. At least we won't have to steal any clothes for them. That said, when we pass a farm cottage, I notice a large white bedsheet billowing on the washing line. Hold on a second, I say. I go and unpeg it and bring it back to Art, He's carried Lou the whole time, refusing to let anyone else help him. I'm not sure if he'll accept this, but he nods. I spread it out on the ground, and he lowers her body onto it, and allows me to help him enfold her in the clean linen. No one speaks. There are no discussions, no questions about where we're going, even when we arrive at the station. I thought about how I would behave if Juliet's wolves agreed to come with us. I'd imagine reading them the riot act, threatening them with death if they tried anything, maybe having to make an example of one of them, although I'd hoped that wouldn't be the case. As it turns out, I don't do any of those things. My mind is fixed on Lou and Art. And Chrissy. I'll have to be the one to tell her, or at least be there when Art breaks the news. And there'll be another funeral to arrange, my second in barely as many weeks, because of wolves I've not brought back alive. At least this time there will be a body. Maybe this will finally convince them that I'm not alpha material. God knows, I don't think I am. We're taking the overnight train to Toulouse. It's one of the first things I've said all day. Evening seems to have arrived so quickly. I know the days are getting shorter, but it feels as if the world is in mourning with us. We board the train and Ray puts in place the spells we used on our outward journey. Try and get some sleep, I tell everyone. We've got another long walk ahead of us tomorrow. Then, because for some reason I feel it needs saying, I add, You're safe now. One or two of our new recruits look at me with scepticism, the others with relief. As I take a seat next to Ray, one of them comes over to me. He's close in age to Chrissy and my mum, with a beard that looks like it's been shocked white. 
He sports a large bruise over one eye, and a scar on his bottom lip where it's recently been split. Thank you, he says. Your mother would be proud. Sleep eludes me. Occasionally my eyes get so heavy that they start to close, but almost immediately I jerk awake. At some point, Ray wakes up too. She takes my hand. You couldn't have done anything, she whispers to me. This is not on you. I could have done so much more. I wasn't on the ball. Lou died because I was distracted. Lou died because she thought you were worth saving. When we get back to Regine's, it's up to you to show everyone that she was right. Chapter 24 The next afternoon, after walking for almost six hours straight, we're nearing the chateau. I'm worried if it's prudent for Ray to be controlling so many spells at once. Apart from the original one to stop Juliet's former pack members from changing, she's put another in place to lighten the weight of Lou's body, to help Art, and then a third to block all our scents so that if one of the walls we've brought with us decides to try and run for it, they won't easily be able to retrace their steps, which was a good call. I know from experience with Vasara that there's a limit to how much one witch can safely do on her own, but I've not brought it up. I hope it's not wishful thinking that she'd tell me if she needs to take a rest. Ray and I walk at the front, partly to guide the others, but also to keep our distance from them. I keep looking back over my shoulder, checking that everyone is still there. So far, so good. Some of them seem to be dragging their feet, but I think that has more to do with how tired they are than any reticence about where they're heading. How many do you think will have already made it back? I ask Ray, only to realise how vague my question is. I'm not even sure who I'm asking about, whether I'm talking about our witches and wolves or ex-members of Juliet's pack. Deep down, I'm worried if we've lost any more of the pack, if I've lost any more. After all, it was my decision to send them out. Won't be long now, Ray says, sidestepping my question. With both of us there, we shouldn't have lost her, I say, unable to keep it in any longer. It's not as simple as that, she replies, and you know it. We were caught off guard. And what's to say that hasn't happened to the others? Most of them have relatives in Juliet's pack. Siblings? Cousins? Don't lose faith. You're panicking over things that might never have happened. Or have already happened. I want to say, but don't. What if we arrive back and there's no one there? What if we're the only ones left? I suddenly hear my name being called from across the field. Naz! Naz! George! I rush forwards relief flooding through me. George left with three of the younger wolves, but two of the more experienced witches, and I see six silhouettes walking towards me. Six left, and it looks like six have returned. But are they the same ones? Tension grips me until they're close enough for me to make out. They are, and they look fairly refreshed, considering they must have been walking as long as we have. There are certainly no cuts or bruises or any other signs of a fight on display. Did you find the nest? I ask. We did, and set it ablaze. What about the other wolves? Juliet's. We gave them the warning. We spelt out their options, as you told us to. He looks down. I'm sorry. I'm not going to lie, it wasn't pleasant. But they made their choice when they got into bed with vampires, and they stuck with it. His gaze drifts past me, and his eyes suddenly widen. Amina, is that you? George? One of Juliet's pack calls back. An older woman with jet black hair and dark brown eyes. I mean, I thought... I thought... They break into a run towards each other, and when they meet, she buries her head in his chest. I had no choice, George, she cries, brushing tears from her eyes. She threatened Ali. She threatened my baby. I know, it's okay. You're all right now. All the others will be so pleased to see you. He looks past her to the rest of them. Tears fill his eyes now. Frederick. Imran. Their names are half whispers on his lips as if he's addressing ghosts. It's a wonderful reunion, but there's one that won't be happening. When George reaches Art, who's been partially hidden by the others, he stops dead in his tracks. Stunned. He opens his mouth to speak, but can't find the words. His hand reaches out to the boy's burden, but hovers above it. No. No, t- not Lou. 
tell me it's not her. I feel as if my skull is going to explode. I keep swallowing, trying to keep control of my emotions. I'm George's alpha, I tell myself. I'm back with my pack and I have to stay strong, show that I can lead them, even in the worst of times. We should keep walking, I say. Chrissy stayed at the chateau to liaise with the groups and Adam, keep an eye on Regine, and be there for the returning parties. The coward in me wishes I'd sent her on one of the raids. If she wasn't here, then I wouldn't be about to tell her that I'd got her daughter killed. But it would have only been a short reprieve. Art walks beside me at the front now, in what feels like a procession. Behind him, Ray has fallen into step with the other two witches, who have taken some of the magical burden from her. At the back is George, with Juliet's wolves. I don't know what else to call them. While they might seem to be with us now, I didn't exactly give them much choice in the matter. Come with me or die. It's hardly a way to generate loyalty. No different, in fact, from what Juliet did to us. Part of me wants to warn him, but he and his friends are so glad to be reunited and happiness has been in such short supply recently that I don't want to spoil things. I don't blame you for this. Art's voice brings me out of my thoughts with a jerk. When I glance to the side, he's looking straight ahead. This wasn't your fault. I want you to know that. It is, I reply flatly. There are a lot of people whose actions led to this. Me to start with. If I hadn't been so fucking proud and short-sighted. If I hadn't sided with Daniel. If I hadn't raced off so willingly to join Juliet's pack. I would have been with her. Protected her. Something Casty said springs to mind. Juliet trusted you. You were a willing member of her pack. I blurt it out without engaging my brain. Damn it. He keeps staring ahead, but I think he's crying again. I know about Adam, he says. Whatever I'd been expecting him to say next, it wasn't that. However crass my comment had been, Cassidy's words are still echoing in my mind, and I can't risk giving him anything to feed back to Juliet on the very unlikely off chance he decides to escape and run back to her. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. Who do you think the one who's been feeding him the information he's passing to you? There was no chance that Juliet would ever trust him, not with how loyal he was to your mother. It's strange. Getting this. He tilts his head towards me to indicate the scar where his eye once was. Probably helped you more than anything else. It's the reason she trusted me right from the start and was convinced I was disloyal to Freya and Northpack. You were. I don't know what type of yarn he's trying to spin me now, but I fell for it once before and have no intention of doing so again. I know what you're thinking. And I know what I did. Trust me. I have all the reminder I need right here. This time, he doesn't mean his eye. He's looking down at his dead sister in his arms. There's nothing I can say to that, so we just keep on walking. Narrow roads lead to narrower footpaths. We pass copses and ploughed fields that will be filled with crops when spring arrives. We finally walk through the gates of the chateau and down the gravel driveway up to the door. A silver-haired woman is waiting there. Chrissy. Chapter 25 I want time to stop, or better still, rewind, but my feet keep moving me forwards. Chrissy was the first person I spoke to when I arrived at Northpack. She welcomed me and showed me where I would be staying. Later, she was the first person I went on a run with. She was the one Callan contacted when I was desperately in need of help. She and Lou were there for every stage of my progress as a wolf, and I thought they always would be. Never in my worst nightmares did I imagine this. At first, she doesn't notice the body. The late afternoon sun is blinding her, and she's trying to make out who's walking towards her. When she finally does see us, there's only one person she has eyes for. Art! she shouts, breaking into a run, then stopping short a few metres from us. Art, I can't believe it! You're here! She lifts a hand to her mouth, shaking her head in disbelief before moving forwards again. Only then does she zero in on the bundle in his arms. Even with Ray's lightning spell, I can't imagine how tired he must be, how much his arms must ache. But he never asked for a break or let one of us take her for a while, even when we met up with George and the others. 
but the physical and mental burden is finally too great for him, and he sinks to his knees, pulling Lou closer to his chest to stop her from hitting the ground. Chrissy doesn't move. Trembling deepens to a shudder that spreads to every part of her. The blood has drained from her face. No, no, not my Lou. It can't be. Not my baby girl. She runs to Art and pulls frantically at the sheet until her daughter's face is revealed. Only, it doesn't look like Lou anymore. It looks like a wax replica of her. Chrissy brushes her daughter's hair from her face, strokes her cheeks and kisses her forehead, nose and lips. I shouldn't look, but I can't turn away. We're all silent, holding our breath as if that could somehow stop this from happening. Then she starts to wail. Naz. I feel a gentle touch on my elbow and turn to see Ray at my side. We should leave them. I... I... I want to go, but I can't just leave them like this. Not after everything Chrissy and Lou did for me. I bend down to Chrissy and Art. Lou's lips that in life never stop moving. Still have that gentle smile on them that I know so well. Chrissy's wails are unrelenting. Chrissy, I'm so sorry, so very sorry. If there's anything I can do. Her head snaps up and she springs to her feet. When Esther died on my watch, she spoke to me with compassion and told me that Esther knew what she signed up for, that I shouldn't feel guilty for what had happened. But the person staring me down right now is someone I don't even recognize. I can almost see her inner wolf wanting to be set free to tear the whole world to shreds. You! You're to blame for this! She spits. My daughter trusted you and you killed her! You will answer for this. I will make sure you pay. Chapter 26 I retreat to my room and close the shutters to block out the light. I don't know how much time passes, but it must be hours. Occasionally I drift off to sleep, only to jerk awake again almost immediately. I don't deserve sleep, or rest, or peace of any kind. Eventually there's a knock on the door, but I ignore it, even when it comes again, harder. I just lie there, waiting for whoever it is to leave. But they don't, and I hear the door creak open. Naz, Oliver says tentatively. I don't raise my head from the tear-soaked pillow. I can stay like this for days. I know this from when I lost my father, and that wasn't even my fault. The bed dips as he sits on the end. I spoke to Ray. She told me what happened. I'm so sorry. He pauses like he's waiting for me to say something, then continues. She told me everything, Naz, including the fact that it wasn't your fault. It's like you once told me, I bite back. Everyone who comes near me gets hurt. You were right. I'm a ticking time bomb. You, Ray, Callan, Esther, Lou, my mum. Everyone who tries to help me ends up dead. Ray and I are still here. Only just. Styx almost killed you and the rest of the vampires nearly finished Ray off. Okay, but that aside, what happened to the others wasn't on you. I get what he's trying to do, and it might work for some people, but the fact is, it's total bullshit. He's comforting me because that's what friends do. But I deserve every ounce of this guilt I'm feeling, and he bloody well knows it. Naz, no, I yell, sitting up. All I've done to these wolves is bring them pain. If I hadn't turned up, Juliet would never have come for them and they'd still be safe and Mum would be alive. They wouldn't have had to face the impossible choice of going on the run or siding with a monster. They would all still be alive, including Lou. You can't really believe that. Of course I do. It's the truth. No, it's not. Polidori's been planning this for years. Decades, probably, if not longer. Hell, for all we know, his involvement in creating the Blood Pact could have just been a ploy to blindside us so we never saw this coming. You don't know that, I snarl back. No, but I do know he was planning this long before you came on the scene, and that an alliance like his and Juliet's doesn't happen overnight. Maybe things wouldn't have gone down this exact way, maybe you wouldn't have lost your mum, or Lou, but there would have been other losses. It could have been Chrissy, or George, who knows? There might have been less collateral damage, but there could have been a darn sight more. You do realise that every one of the groups you sent out has come back safe. Every one. I'm suddenly paying attention for the first time. I didn't know that. 
I came straight up here from the scene with Chrissy. I didn't even think to ask about the others, which probably had to do with not being able to take any more bad news. Everyone came back, and all the nests you sent them to were destroyed. There's got to be hundreds of rogue vampires dead. Because of you, Naz. Can you imagine how many lives you will have saved just from that alone? And it wouldn't have happened without you. You know it wouldn't. Great, so I'm responsible for killing vampires. Vampires who had once been innocent humans. Had once been. He emphasises the words. Look, all you can ever do, all any of us can do in a given situation, is the best you're able. You can't hold on to this forever. The pack needs their alpha. More than ever now. There's something about the way he says this. What is it? What's going on? He shifts. I don't know, exactly. Oliver? I don't, I promise you. There's a lot of shouting after you came up here. All the new wolves have been locked in the barn. Even those who originally came from your mother's pack. Well, this was discussed before we left. It's what we all agreed on. I get that. It's just that some people... Who, Oliver? Which some people are we talking about and what are they doing? He's squirming. Like some school kid who's worried about snitching on his classmates. This isn't school. And we aren't children. He's about to reply when there's a hammering on the door. And it bursts open to reveal George standing there. Never in all our time here has he come to my room for any reason... And yet here he is, ghostly pale. Naz, you need to come. You need to come. Now. The alpha part of me kicks straight back into gear, like I haven't just spent hours wallowing in self-pity. Taking the stairs two at a time, I reach the hallway, and I'm out of the front door before I know it. It's dark outside, and it's cold. A white frost glistens on the grass, reflecting the bright moon that hangs in a deep indigo sky. The wolves are gathered on the lawn, along with three of the witches. Ray amongst them. There's something about the way they're arranged in semicircle that feels unnatural, almost staged. And then, I see Chrissy standing there, at the focal point. Her long grey hair is scraped back, although her choice of style isn't my biggest concern. As I approach, several of the wolves turn to look at me, their eyes conveying fear. One or two heads shake almost imperceptibly. Whatever it is that's about to happen, they don't seem to want me there. Chrissy, what is this? I ask, having no choice but to approach her. What does it look like? I'm challenging you for the position of Alpha. Chapter 27 Since I became a werewolf, cold doesn't worry me anymore, although, to be fair, it never bothered me that much as a human. There's a good chance, I suppose, that the gene was already at play, and all those months on the run with Oliver, sleeping in drafty, ramshackle buildings, hardened me even more. But right now, a chill has invaded my bones. Chrissy? I say again. My voice comes out as little more than a whisper, as if this is a private conversation, which I probably rather it was, except that our pack is standing there watching, waiting, breaths held. You heard me. I'm challenging for the role of Alpha. Okay. I take another step towards her. But you know you don't need to do that, don't you? I'll step down. If you want to be Alpha, then it's all yours. When I decided to become a lone wolf at North Pack, and when I finally became Alpha here, I felt a shift in power, a redistribution of energy. I wait for it to happen again. Nothing. Somehow I'm still Alpha. I know it, and she knows it too. It's not as simple as that, Chrissy hisses. It is. You want to be Alpha, and that's fine. Take it from me. I will fight you to the death for it. That's how it goes. Then if that's what you've got to do, then that's what you've got to do. I've faced death more times than someone my age or any age should have done. First Joe, then Styx, then Daniel, then Polidori. I've always had the instinct to fight, to survive, but it's not there now. It's gone. For the same reason Chrissy is confronting me. Lou. Nas! Ray races to my side. You can't be serious. You can't really be going to fight. Yes, I am. She's grieving, Nas. She's not thinking straight. We're all grieving. It's all this pack ever gets to do. 
She lost her son because of me, and now her daughter. I owe her this much, Ray, and so much more. And, with my clothes removed, a change. Everything's different when you're a wolf. What you hear, what you see, what you feel. The rest of the pack is changing, too. I feel it without even needing to look. As each one becomes the wolf, their fear floods through me. Although for which of us I don't delve deep enough to find out. I can't think about that. Hers is the only voice I need to concentrate on. I'm not going to fight you, I say. You have to. That's how it works. No, if you want to take Alpha from me, I'm not going to stop you. Do what you need to do. I feel her pain flowing through me, wave after wave, like the sea crashing against rocks in a violent storm. I recognize it. I know the grief of losing a loved one, but this loss of Lou is tearing her apart. Her thoughts come through broken and jagged. I don't know how she isn't crushed by sorrow like that. She's not attacking me, despite the snarls that roll from her lips. Do what you need to do, I say again. She moves back and forth between me and the others. She's panicking. Her actions look more like those of a caged animal in a zoo than a wild, free creature. But she's not free. She's bound by loss. What I need is for you to fight me. She stops, barely an inch from my face, her muzzle dripping with saliva. You're a coward. That's why she's dead, because you're a coward. I know. And it's my fault Esther died too. It's okay. You can hate me because it's true. I hate you because you won't fight. You owe me this. You owe me and my daughter. Tears build in my eyes. She's right. And who am I to deny her? The others are waiting. I realize they're not siding with either of us. They're afraid. I just want this to stop. Okay, if it's what you want, I'll fight you. I say with the meekness of a gamma not the authority of an alpha. It hurts to say the words, but I feel satisfaction ripple through Chrissy. We start circling each other. I want her to get on with it. If she does it with enough force, that might be enough to kill me quickly. And she does attack. Leaping, she lands on top of me. As I roll, she snaps at the scruff of my neck. It's a nip, not a bite. Despite her anger, she's clearly conflicted after all. She goes to pin me on my back, but I break free as easily as if she were a cub. This is starting to feel like a play fight. I've seen Chrissy in action killing vampires, and I know she's got a lot more strength in her than this. She may have been my mother's best friend, but she wouldn't have been her beta had she not been a proficient fighter. This, these attacks, are less than I would expect from a gamma. Why aren't you fighting back? She demands. I'll fight back when you start to fight seriously. You want this pack? Then take it. I want you to pay for what you've done to my baby girl. Okay, then make me pay. This time she strikes with more force. I still don't think it's half of what she's capable of, but it takes me by surprise, and I have to use considerably more strength to break free from her. Ready to fight now? She snarls. As much as I don't want to admit it, I know there's no way this will be over until one of us ends it. And if she keeps hitting me with these pathetic half-slaps, we're going to be here for hours. I duck down and come up under her neck. It sends her toppling to the side far more easily than I'd expected, although she's back on her feet almost instantly, like any true fighter would be. Is that all you've got? She snipes. How about you show me what you've got first? She lunges for my neck. I shift backwards instinctively, leaving her with only a tuft of my fur in her mouth. She doesn't go again. I get it. It's my turn. That's what she seems to want, a tit-for-tat fight. Ready to oblige, I prepare to spring, when my eyes lock with hers. She's the closest thing I've had to her mother for such a long time. I think of when she took me to her cabin and fed me the best meal I'd had in weeks. I remember how she didn't tell me that Wolf's telepathy was a thing, just stayed out of my head and gave me room to grow, like any good parent would. I can't do this, I say. Her anger is immediate and raw. You have to. You said you would. I can't. I'm sorry. Become Alpha or don't become Alpha. Kill me or walk away. It's up to you. I won't fight you any more. No. No, you must. I need you to kill me. And there it is. The truth behind the challenge. I can't do it any more. 
I can't live without her, Nerissa. Please. Please, I've never asked anything of you before. Please do this for me. Never have I felt my heart so clearly breaking. Not when I found out about Freya. Not even when I saw Lou lying there, the life fading from her eyes. This pain, this mother's pain, has surely got to be the worst of all. I struggle to come up with the right words to say to her. That's when I hear it. A tapping. It's gentle at first, like fingertips drumming on a table. It's a sound I first became aware of in my training. Someone in the pack wants permission to communicate. As it grows in strength, I realise who it is. And without a moment's hesitation, I let them speak. Mum. Mum, you need to stop this, Art says. But it's not just his voice that has joined us. He has somehow got out of the barn and is standing with the pack. I should leave and give them their privacy, but Chrissy's not going to let me just turn away. And I'm still not certain about Art. But in my heart of hearts, I feel I can trust him. She killed her, Chrissy sends to him. She's to blame for all of it, for everything bad that's happened. You really believe that? His voice is so calm just like the old Art who helped me when I was first learning what it was to be a wolf. You believe she's to blame for everything, so for what happened to me too? To Freya? Because you know that's not the case, Mum. You know it's not. Chrissy's mind is in chaos. Torrents of emotion surge relentlessly there. She sees me watching her, listening into their conversation, and stops dead, her jaws foaming. You should have protected her, she spits. You're right, Mum. She should have protected her. But so should I have. Neither of us wanted it to happen or could do anything quickly enough to stop it. Either of us would have sacrificed our own lives rather than lose Lou. You can blame Naz if you want to, but she was no more at fault than I was. That's not true. Of course it is. If I hadn't stupidly sided with Daniel, then I would have still been here with you both, and I would have been able to protect her. And I should have been more on my guard yesterday. I knew Cassidy, knew what she was capable of. Better than anyone there. I should have been there. Chrissy's voice is a whimper. I should have been there for my baby. I know. I don't want to live any more. I can't carry on without her. Please, Nerissa, kill me. She sobs. Please, kill me. And just like that, the other wolves move towards the mother and son and surround them with a writhing mass of fur. Sadness and compassion flood through the pack. Chapter 28 I turn human. Standing beside me, Ray is wearing a look of concern, and I know exactly why. You let him out, I say to her. You freed him so he could come here. I didn't know what else I could do. It was a smart choice. Thank you. I look back at the pack. It's hard to tell where one of them ends and another begins. Is she going to be okay? Ray asks. I doubt it, I reply, then turn, pick up my clothes and walk back to the house. Been around death so much lately you'd expect me to be used to it, but I don't think that will ever be the case. The fight with Chrissy, if you can even call it that, has left me emotionally drained. I've just reached the door when someone calls my name. Naz, hold up! I just want to get back to my room and lock myself in again. But that doesn't seem to be an option right now. Chrissy may not have been serious about wanting my position as Alpha, but I suppose the pack no longer considers me capable of doing the job. I don't think I ever have been. I stop and slowly turn around. George is standing a little way ahead of the others, having obviously been given the task as spokesman. For a big guy, he looks incredibly nervous, so I decide to make it easy for him. You want it, it's yours, take it. I won't fight you either. Sorry? You want to be Alpha, or someone does. You don't think I'm up to it, I get it, it's fine by me. No, that's not what we wanted to say at all. It's not. Why not? I lost Esther and now Lou. Surely that should be enough. I've said this to myself a thousand times. I've never spoken the words out loud to the pack before, but I assume they all know the way I feel. Judging by the look on George's face, however, I've got something wrong. What happened to Lou was tragic. What happened to Esther was tragic too. But we all know you wouldn't have wished it upon either of them, that you'd have taken their place if you could have. 
That's what makes an alpha. No one here is judging you, Naz. We wouldn't do that. I'm stunned. Lou and Chrissy had always been my number one allies, the ones who believed in me no matter what. I'd always felt the rest of the pack followed me because of them. But seeing George standing there, his big, round face lined with worry, I finally realised that's not the case. They've done it because they wanted to. With a small cough, I composed myself, remembering that there was something he wanted to say. What was it you wanted? He presses his lips together. My little outburst has either derailed his train of thought or made him more nervous about speaking. <clears throat> the other wolves, the, the ones the witches have bound in the barn? Juliet's. Well, that's a the thing, they're not. Maybe one or two are unhappy, but most of them were your mothers originally. Take Amina and Imran. They grew up with us. They're family. They only went with Juliet to protect their son. They don't deserve to be locked up for that. I'll make sure they're comfortable. They're not prisoners. I'll get the boundary spell changed so they can go out into the garden. Yard time, George says with a certain edge to his voice. I stifle the urge to reply that it could well be more than they deserve and consider my answer more carefully. I know you care about these people and some of them mean a lot to you. You grew up together and you think you still know them, but a lot has changed. Can you really say that you're the same person you were in Scotland? None of us are. We don't know what might have happened to them under Juliet, how they might have altered, what lies they could have been fed. The way we're handling them is part of a carefully considered plan, you know. He nods, but his disappointment is palpable. Will you just think about it? He asks. The more walls we've got available on our side, the better. I nod back in reply. I know what he's saying makes sense, but I'm not in a position where I can take risks right now. Across the garden, Chrissy and Art are back in human form, their arms wrapped around each other, she hunched over as if she's aged a decade, and he the loving son, loyal and dutiful. As I watch them, a thought springs to mind. George, give them a little more time, then suggest Chrissy goes to her room for a rest. After that, bring Art to me in the dining room. I want to speak to you both there. Chapter 29 Returning to the dining room, I feel unexpectedly nostalgic. When we first came to stay here, Regine had been so excited to have company. She put on grand dinners almost every night. She liked everyone to be suitably attired for the occasion. Lou and I had loved it, sometimes even borrowing her clothes to dress up in. It felt like we were living in a never-ending party. I remember wondering at the time if it would really be so bad if we stayed like that, if we just kept ourselves hidden away from the world, dining on pheasant and emptying the contents of a ninety-year-old woman's wine cellar. It had only been a passing thought, though. My heart had been too full of Polidori and of getting Ray back to her former self. There's a bowl of fruit and a large plate of ham and cheese on a sideboard by one of the windows. I head for the fruit, then change my mind, and sit down at the table. No sooner have I done that than there's a knock on the door, and Ray steps into the room. The fact she's changed her clothes reminds me that I haven't. After all that travelling and all that killing, I'm still dressed in the same outfit I left in. I must reek, but I'm numb to a lot of things at the moment, and I guess that extends to my sense of smell. Regine thought you might be hungry, she says, coming to stand behind my chair, and wrapping her arms around my shoulders in a hug. You okay? I feel that question has been asked way too many times already today, and there's only one answer I can give. No. Not at all. She squeezes me a little tighter, then strokes my hair. Having her here caring for me like this makes me wonder how I survive without her. She gives me another squeeze, then moves around the table to face me. You know we're here for you, Oliver and I. I know, I say softly. Thank you, and thanks again for getting art. I'm not sure what would have happened if you hadn't thought to do that. Nothing would have happened. Chrissy just needed to get it out of her system. She wanted someone to blame. You know how that can be. She's right enough there, and obviously remembers when I learned that Callan and Oliver had been hiding the fact that Freya, my mother, had been killed months earlier. I acted as if they had been personally responsible for her death, although they weren't to blame in the slightest. It's strange being on the other side of that equation. And anyway... 
she continues. I'm just as much to blame as you are. More, probably. I should have put a spell on them all. If I just ought to stop any of them moving, then Cassie would never have been able to pick up that knife and use it. I let you down. What? I'm dumbfounded that she could possibly think such a thing. It was my job to monitor the wolves, to keep them under control, to stop them changing. That was the only thing I asked you to do. I dropped my head into my hands, close to tears but too exhausted to cry. How did we get here, Ray? How did this become our lives? I don't know, she says honestly. I'm about to try and change the mood by saying something flippant about how much I'd like our biggest worry to be having to decide what type of pizza to order or where the remote has gone, when there's a knock at the door. Would you mind? I say, nodding toward the door. Important alpha business. Ray smiles. Something like that. No worries, but promise me while you're here, you'll eat something. You need to look after yourself. So do you. Don't worry about me. I've got Vasara and the others on my case. I'll be all right. You need to be taking care of yourself, okay? I will, promise. Trust me, if what I have planned right now works, it will be a very big act of self-care. Her eyebrows lift, but she doesn't probe any further. I guess I should let you get on with it then, she says. She leaves the room and I expect George and Art to enter, but they don't. It takes me a moment to realise why. Come in, I call. I don't think I'll ever get used to giving people permission to join me like I'm some kind of headmistress. They look nervous. I'm not sure how well the two of them got on in Scotland, but they're giving each other a fairly wide berth, which doesn't fill me with confidence. Taking a deep breath, I review my decision, wondering if this is going to be my worst mistake as Alpha so far. Given how many I've made, that would be a tough call. Thank you both for coming. Take a seat. How's she doing, Art? Much as you'd expect, Lou was her... her everything. She's got you back now. That's got to be a comfort. I'm not sure she sees it that way, but that's besides the point. I guess it's time for me to go back to the barn with the others. And before you say anything, I quite understand. It's actually better than some of our accommodations at South Pack. He laughs, but I'm not sure whether he's joking or not. So I carry on. The pack is obviously a bit of a mess. Well, let's be honest, it's been a mess since I took over. I don't know if you're aware of this, Art, but I didn't take on the position of Alpha by choice. I think under duress would better describe it, but fact is, I am the Alpha. This pack is my responsibility. Your mother agreed to be beta for me the same way she was for Freya, although I felt it was more out of obligation than desire. She knew my bond with her was closer than with any of the others at the time. Art looked at me with narrowed eyes. Is there a reason you're telling me all this? He asks. Of course there is. Your mother is in no fit state to be my beta anymore, and even if she was, her heart has never been in it. She wants to protect, not lead. As I said, since I became Alpha, it has been chaos. What we need, if we're to function as a proper pack, is a clear structure and stability. Which is why I asked both of you to come and see me. I want you to be my betas. Chapter 30 I hadn't expected an immediate positive response. Far from it. I brace myself for what's to come. While Art looks at me as if I've just grown an extra head, it's George's reaction I'm most interested in. And right now, he looks stunned. Why on earth would you choose him? He asks. I'm not only asking him, I'm asking you, too. Both of you. Together. And if you don't think you can work as a team, then I will have to th rethink this, but I trust you, George, completely. You look for the best in people, and you do the best for everyone. You've embraced the witches and Callan, and never once have you questioned what I've asked you to do. But why him? Because you and I sometimes get too caught up in the moment, worrying about protecting those around us to think about the bigger picture, to work out how our enemies might be operating. Think of it as having Art as a Loki to you, my Thor. By the glazed look on his face, I assume the analogy is lost on him, so I try to explain it another way. This is not a time of peace, George. We're at war, and I need generals who will give us the best chance of winning. And no one knows Juliet's set up better than Art. Because he's on her side. George's voice raises in a way I've never heard him do before. Ask Amina. Ask Imran. They'll tell you. 
like they've already told me. He started worming his way to Juliet's right hand from the moment he got there. Art's already told me that. What we didn't know was that it was him who was feeding the information to Adam that's enabled us to take out the new vampire nests. Besides, it's difficult to work out how to word what I want to say next. The fact is, I saw whose side Art was on when Cassidy killed Lou. His family matters to him more than anything now, and I believe, along with Chrissy, we're the closest thing he's got to that. We'll need to confirm what you told me with Adam, of course, I say to Art, who nods in response. While George is obviously mulling this over, Art's silence is worrying me. I thought he'd leap at the chance to take on the role of Beta. When he was at North Pack, climbing up the ranks had originally been his number one priority, and, judging from what Cassidy said before he ripped her throat out, he'd had the same ambition at South Pack, too. A minute passes, and then another, and still he says nothing. George and I exchange looks. Maybe we should have held this conversation in wolf form. At least that way I'd know what they were thinking. Not that George hasn't made his feelings abundantly clear. Art finally speaks. I can see it working, he says, but there would need to be conditions in place, things you'd need to agree to. You're not in a position to bargain, George snaps. You've been offered a great honour. Show some damn respect, boy. My natural instinct is to silence George, to tell him not to worry, that everything's fine. But in truth, he's probably right. If Art takes on this role, believing he's got the upper hand, then who knows where that power trip might take us. I let a moment pass before I speak again. What are these conditions? I ask. I'm not saying I'll agree to any of them, but I'll hear you out. As Art swallows repeatedly, I watch his Adam's apple bob up and down. His hands are flat on the table, fingers pushing into the wood, and I notice how scarred his knuckles are, scratched, bruised, and misshapen. This reminds me of some of the cage fighters I saw when Oliver and I were trying to earn some money, taking part in dodgy, illegal fights when we were on the run in Lithuania. What are they? I ask again, sensing he needs another prompt. What are your conditions for being beta? When he finally looks up, he's turned pale, but his single eye burns with a ferocity which is almost all wolf. I will not kill simply to prove my loyalty. I'll fight and protect the pack from outsiders, but I will not hurt anyone here. The things I had to do when I was with South Pack were to protect what was left of North Pack. If I hadn't, more would have suffered, but never again. When he finishes speaking, he lowers his head in obvious shame. George and I exchange glances again as we realise what he means, and what it cost him to prove his loyalty to Juliet in order to get information for us. He looks so broken. It must have involved hurting other members of my mother's pack. It's okay, I say gently, as George pats him on the shoulder. I'd never ask you to do anything like that. He nods rapidly, then tilts his head towards the ceiling, hoping to blink away the tears without us seeing them. Good, in that case, I'll do it. I'll be your beta. Chapter 31 I delivered the news of the two beta appointments to a gathering of the original werewolves in the dining room. It was met with a mixed response, but I'd expected that. Thankfully, George immediately assumed his new role, quashing any outbursts, reassuring the disgruntled and concerned wolves, which, to be fair, was all of them. While they were a long way from coming around completely to the idea, they did at least listen to what he had to say. So, 50% of my appointments had worked out. Okay, I say, sitting at the head of the table. There's one big thing that we need to discuss that I know you want sorted, and that's the wolves that return with us from the attacks on the nests. Currently, they're in the barn, bound by the witches. The question is, what do we do with them? Most of them are Freya's wolves, George said immediately. They're no threat to us. They're an asset, in fact. We should be welcoming them, not treating them like prisoners. They've already suffered enough like that under Juliet. The rest of the pack murmurs in agreement. I looked at Art for his opinion. I guess now is make or break time for him as beta, but the last thing I want is for him to just fall in with the majority. One of the reasons I gave him the position was that he wouldn't be a pushover. I agree, he says. She won herself no friends when she took on Freya's pack. I'm sure they feel no loyalty to her at all. It should be pretty straightforward for Naz to imprint on them. 
A wave of relief rolls over me. Okay, I say, so we let them out and give them their freedom. What do we do with the others? The ones who grew up in South Pack? I wish I had some suggestions myself, but I'm completely at a loss. I want to hear what the others think, and I'm willing to consider agreeing to a majority decision. At the back of the room, one of the wolves raises a hand to speak, but she's interrupted by a knock at the door. My initial thought is it's Regine, seeing if we're in need of refreshments, and while I don't want the meeting sidetracked, she has been so good to us I can't feel cross, particularly if food is involved. Come in, I call, feeling guilty for saying she can enter a room in her own house. However, when the door opens, the woman who steps inside isn't the one I expected. Her hair is loose around her shoulders, and her eyes are red-rimmed, and yet she stands with the posture of a ballet dancer. I was wondering if I could attend the meeting too, Chrissy asked me, if it's okay. I understand if you would rather... No, please. I mean, yes, you're most welcome. Please, come in. Normally, as my beta, she would sit next to me at the head of the table, but the seats either side of me are taken by Art and George. The fact that neither of them stands to vacate a chair for her tells her everything she needs to know. She smiles softly and moves to sit at the back of the room. I don't know if I want to laugh or cry. Either way, she's here, and that's what matters. We are just discussing what to do with the walls from Juliet's pack, I tell her, the ones who were in South Pack from the start. Any input would be welcome. Maggie was just about to give us her opinion. I look back at the wolf who only moments ago had something to say, but is now looking decidedly nervous. There are no wrong answers here, believe me, I say to encourage her. I just want to know what you think. I don't trust them, she blurts out. I don't. But we don't know if they agree with what they were doing, someone responds. I mean, they came with us willingly enough, didn't they? That's got to stand for something, surely. It was that or die, adds another. And other voices join in. Might be all part of a trick to get people on the inside here. What, to allow themselves to be captured and most likely killed? They couldn't know whether we would offer them a way out. People mean nothing to Juliet. They're just disposable resources. For all we know, they could have volunteered for this. They already know we have witches here. I think letting them see our full capabilities poses a massive risk to us all. There are a lot of murmurs of agreement. And I'm surprised when George speaks up in their defence. We don't know what they've been through. Under your mother, we always prided ourselves on putting people first. That has to extend to these wolves too. Besides, they could have more useful information about their plans or if there are other nests. If there are other nests, Art says, and all eyes turn to him, including mine and his mother's. Was that it, then? I say, feeling slightly optimistic. Did we get them all? I hope, for his sake, that he didn't plan on his laugh coming out quite as disrespectfully as it does. A snort catches in his throat as he shakes his head. There are dozens throughout Europe, Asia, the whole freaking planet. What you've done doesn't even scratch the surface. Polidori is building a worldwide army. It feels like a knife to my gut, and my face obviously shows it. When I look around the room, I see reflections of my own reaction. Only Art himself doesn't look the least perturbed. I thought this would be a good thing, he says. A good thing that there are all these vampire nests and we have no idea where they are. Oh, did I not say... A sly grin creeps over his face. Say what? Chapter 32 The months since Art was able to share the locations of so many nests, and we agreed to take the fight to them, has been brutal. The first attack went amazingly smoothly. They clearly hadn't imagined we would hit one of their largest nests. Since then, though, it's been a battle. There's no other word for it. They're not fights or skirmishes over with a surprise raid and a few swift blows. Some have raged on for hours. So far, every encounter has ended the same way, but no more wolves have chosen to join us. This means we've had to kill them all, which I know sits as heavily on the others as it does on me. We've split into two groups, with half a dozen witches and even split of wolves in each. One stays at the chateau, protecting it, whilst resting and going over the plan of their next attack with Oliver— while the second goes out to hit a nest. However, just as Art predicted, the number of wolves sent to guard the nest has increased, as has the quality of their fighting. 
Up until now, we've been lucky and not lost anyone. But it's hard to believe this will last. Especially right now. We've attacked an abandoned railway station on the Portuguese coast. It appears many of Juliet's top fighters are here, and it doesn't even matter that they can't transform to wolves. They came armed, and not just with knives, but with bows and arrows and guns. This is our fifth outing since Art and the others came on board, but this is the first time that we've faced firearms, and I don't need to be told to know what the bullets are made of. He's splitting out, Naz. We need help. I can't see who's speaking. I'm too busy trying to staunch the flow of blood pulsing from Imran's chest. Ray! Ray! I yell. We need help! I need you! It takes a moment for her to hear my call through the din, but the moment she does, she comes running. Two of Juliet's pack make a beeline for her, but with a wave of her hand and a few words, she sends them flying through the air where they collide with a tree. She drops to her knees and holds her hands above Imran's body as she gently chants. I know she can do this. I've seen it twice already in other battles. Two other wolves are still alive because my best friend is the most kick-ass witch you could imagine. It doesn't make it any easier, though, seeing one of your pack close to death in front of you. And every time it happens, I see Lou's face again, and reflect sadly how different things would have been if Ray had known how to do this back then. They're spreading out, Art yells at me. Then go after them, I yell back. There are too many. I've got this, Ray says. You go. Do what you need to do. Are you sure? Yes, make sure that the witches are safe. The witches are the least of my worries, and that's not because I don't care about them. It's because I've seen what they've managed to do this last month. I think it's fair to say that they've taken the magic that they found in the grimoires and run with it. One of Juliet's pack races towards one of them, knife in hand. Yet when she's a meter out, she rebounds off an invisible wall and falls backwards, stunned. I waste no time. In one swift movement, I turn into the wolf and leap onto her, snapping her neck in my jaws before she's even realized what's happening. It's not pretty, and doing it as quickly as I can is the only thing that makes it bearable for me. More come at us. So much death makes my heart ache. They've been ordered to do this by their alpha. I wish I could let them live, take them all back to regimes and show them it doesn't have to be this way, that an alpha doesn't have to be a tyrant. But it's not that simple. One by one, they drop. When those few left realize it's a lost cause, they barely even attempt to fight on, unless it's making a last-ditch attempt at one of the witches. By the time we finish, every one of us has given all we have. Every inch of me hurts. Changing from human to wolf and back again takes its toll when you're doing it over and over in the heat of battle, and my muscles feel like they've been torn apart. Looking around, I see I'm not the only one with blood, sweat and tears merging to a deep rust on my arms. Well, I ask R as he approaches, buttoning up a pair of trousers. Everyone's safe, including Imran. Relief floods through me. And the vampires? A few dozen at least. There were some humans in there too. Food. My eyes bug. That was something I hadn't expected to hear, although it makes sense in a nest that size. Were you able to save any? Five made it out. They're in a pretty bad way, but the witches are with them. They're going to clean them up the best they can. Fiddle with their memories, too, hopefully. They can do that. Let's hope so. Art steps back. He stands beside me and surveys the scene. Smoke rolls off the building as the rest of the pack drag the vampire bodies towards the fire. So much is wrong with what we're doing. These wolves are people some of us knew. People they lived with for months. But at least we can return their bodies to dust in the fire. That's got to be something, I tell myself. It's no good seeing the enemy as human, because if you do that, then you'd never be able to look at yourself in the mirror again. I'm about to walk over to Ray and see how the surviving humans are doing, when I notice someone running towards me, waving something. It's one of our new recruits, one of my mother's wolves. Andrew, I think his name is. He's kept a very wide berth from me since joining our pack, and an even wider berth from Art. Avoiding my betas, he races up to me, panting, which is unusual for a werewolf, and a clear indication that he's rattled. What is it? I ask, as he shakes his head, pulling in lungfuls of air. Here, he says, this fell out of one of their pockets. I take what appears to be a document, but not like any I've ever handled before. 
The heavy yellow paper is folded and sealed with a blob of red wax. And there on the front is a name. My name. Chapter 33 It's a trap, George says. It has to be. Of course, that doesn't mean we're not going, Ray replies. This conversation has been going around in circles. The moment I took hold of the letter, I knew who it was from. But I somehow resisted opening it until we got back to the chateau. After all the death we'd faced and seeing how drained the humans we'd found were, I don't know how they still were alive. I just couldn't cope with reading it then. So I'd waited until we were all back together for our mission debrief. In hindsight, it might have been wise not to do it so publicly. You'd have all of us with you. If this means we get Rhett back, I think you should make contact now, as soon as possible. Vasara's reaction has been far more emotional than I've ever seen before. No wonder Ray was worried about her. His absence has obviously had even more effect on her than we'd realized, and the letter has only made matters worse. But she's not the only one in the room with a strong opinion. It would be suicide, Oliver says. This is not a peace talk that he's after, whatever he's written. Penned in calligraphy, the likes of which I've never seen outside a museum, I read the letter again to myself before handing it to George and Art, who look at it and then pass it in turn to Vasara, Ray, Oliver and Chrissy. The message is clear. Eliminating Polidori's nest is unsettling his plans, and he says he wants a deal, a compromise, a truce, in which we get Callan and Rhett back in return for not killing any more of his vampires. We can name the time and the place for the handover, and he will honour his offer, providing that no further attacks on his people happen in the meantime. You need to think about what Callan would want, too, Oliver says, showing he can play the emotive card just as well as Vasara. He wouldn't want you to risk your life, or anyone's life for that matter, just to save him. He'd want you to keep doing what you're doing, bringing down Polidori's vampires. And you're obviously succeeding. He's spooked. We should carry on as before and attack the other nests, Chrissy says. Just ignore the letter. What's to say it didn't get burnt along with the body of the vampire who was carrying it? Even if they were all carrying copies, I say we pretend we've not seen it, and keep going until we've brought them all down, and half of Juliet's packed to boot. If you think this is making even a dent in the number of wolves that Juliet has at her command, then I'm afraid you're deluding yourselves, Art says. She's got an army, a literal army. Then all the more reason to keep picking them off, bit by bit, George says. And what if they trace us here? asks one of the older witches. Surely her having an army is all the more reason we should accept Polidori's truce. If they find us, then it won't just be about Callan and Rhett. It'll be our lives on the line. It's always been our lives on the line, Art says. But this is bigger than just us. It's about stopping Polidori and his plans. We have to keep going, however hopeless it might seem. So many voices join in again that I can't distinguish between them. I know they've all got valid points, but that doesn't mean I want to hear them all again. I'm going, I say, so loud that even the witches fall silent. I'm going to meet him. Oliver's face immediately flushes red with fury. You can't be serious, Naz. It's not worth it. Not for two vampires. And you can't trust him, Ray adds. She, of all people, knows what she's talking about. And the thought of coming face to face with Polidori again after what she must have gone through at his hands must be terrifying for her. I get both points of view, but it's not their choice. It's mine. I understand where you're all coming from, and believe me, I don't trust a word he says— but we can use that to our advantage, don't you see? He plans to lay a trap for us. The least we can do is reciprocate. You have an idea? Oliver asks. Yes, I do. A bad one, I admit. A very, very bad one. Chapter 34 I start by penning my reply, naming the date, time, place and conditions for the meeting. He stated that he and I should meet to discuss moving forward. Those were his words. He wants to see me one-on-one, -on -one, and that's okay by me. I've met the head of the Vampire Council twice. The first time was in their dungeon, when I didn't even know who he was. I barely knew who I was, having just killed Styx after his venom transformed me into a wolf. If I'd known then what I know now, maybe I would have tried to get past those metal bars when he was so close to me. 
The second time was also at the Vampire Council, in their entrance hall as we were trying to escape with the grimoires, when we were forced to leave Callan and Rhett behind, not to mention Esther's body, so that Vasara and I could get those books back here. The image that's in my mind as I write my response is Polidori gripping his skull in agony under Vasara's spell. It's going to be even worse for him next time, though. Now that the witches of all the powers revealed to them in the stolen books, we'll be able to finish things properly. I end the letter. Only bring Callan and Rhett with you. Come alone, apart from them. I figure there's no need to add a signature. The location I've given for the rendezvous should be more than enough for him to know this is genuine. I can't imagine anyone else who would pick my mother's old village in Scotland. This has nothing to do with sentimentality, however. It's strategic. Weirdly, as the days of planning proceed, it's Regine I feel most sorry for. We might have put her life into complete and utter disarray these last few months and nearly eaten her out of house and home, but I can't count how many times she's told us that she loves our company, and I know it's not just out of kindness. We aim to leave in two days' time, I tell her, as we sit in the small room where she likes to take her tea. Two witches will remain with you. They'll make sure that the boundary spell stays up around the barn and get you and Henri safely away if anything goes wrong. Like hell they will she protests. I'm perfectly capable of looking after myself, and Henri won't go anywhere without me. Besides, once you've lived as long as I have, you can't be doing with all that fretting and running around. If anything untoward does happen, then you'll find me in the library with a glass of sherry and a good book. I'm not a hugger, and during my time here I've avoided all of Regine's embraces and cheek kissing. But right now, putting my arms around her is the only thing to do. You bring our boy back to me, won't you? I'll do everything in my power to. And thank you, Regine. Thank you for all you've done for us. It has been my pleasure, Cherie. You can come back, you know, when all this is over, if the pack wants a new home. You love the place in springtime. It's a shame you've not seen it then. That's incredibly generous. You should be careful making offers like that, though. You'll find yourself inundated. If there's even a pack left at the end of it. I nearly add, but don't. Instead, I indulge in just one more hug, lingering this time for my sake as much as hers. When even Regine has had her fill, I step back and leave her in the foyer and walk out of the door. Oliver is waiting with Ray on the driveway. To the side of him, a black and silver chopper motorbike with a low seat and high chrome handlebars rests on its stand. What on earth is that? I laugh as I reach them. You're not going to drive that, are you? You don't drive a bike, you ride it, said Oliver. And yes, I am. I told Regine that I'd be heading out before the rest of you and wondered if Henri could give me a lift to the station. She said she could do one better. I wander over to it and run my hand across the leather seat. You're insane, I say. Can you actually ride it, though? Safely, I mean. Of course I can, although I may have done a couple of practice laps around the field to make sure. And in his defence, he only stalled twice and nearly fell off once. Ray adds, jabbing him in the side with her elbow. It's the nearly that counts, Oliver jibes back. Besides, I told you, the ground was bumpy. Laughter rings out between us, before fading away and leaving a tense quiet. No heroics now, I say, my voice coming out a little more wobbly than I'd have liked. You need to promise me. No heroics. I promise. We have a plan. A plan I must stick to, I know. You've made that clear many, many times. Releasing a lungful of air, I wrap my arms around Oliver and squeeze him tightly. It's been a long time since I've hugged him like this, and I realise I've missed it. So I let myself stay there a little longer. Jeez, all this hugging today is starting to worry me. When I break away, Ray takes my place, hugging him hard too, before breaking away and linking arms with me. You need to stay safe too, right? He says. No heroics from your end either. You don't need to worry about me. I've got a super witch on my side now. I tug Ray's arm, causing her to topple against me, and we laugh briefly again. Three days, I say to Oliver. We'll see you in three days. Looking forward to it. Chapter 35 With Oliver gone, we kick things up a gear. Ray joins the witches in the cottage where they're packing everything up, and I go to the wolves and we run through every possible scenario that could occur, once more, getting caught before we make it to the old village. An ambush, 
Polidori killing Rhett and Callan before we arrived to deliberately spite us, and many more. Our contingency plans have their own plan Bs, and there are even more layers on top of that. It's midday and we're sitting on the ground in human form. I'm not great at this whole addressing the pack thing. My mum used to do it standing up, someone for people to look up to, literally as well as metaphorically. I've seen memories of this in the other wolves' minds, the way she could inspire them with just a sentence. No hesitating, no stumbling, just clear, convincing rhetoric. There's no reason why this shouldn't go as planned, I say, but if any of you don't want to be there, I understand. I'll even go alone if need be. There's no way we'd let you do that. Imran says. Besides, I think it'll help the others to see we're following you willingly. They'll realize that you're nothing like Juliet. I'm not so sure about that. The whole reason my mum deserted my dad and me was to put an end to the old, barbaric ways of her former pack. And yet here I am, having killed wolves and ordered my pack to do the same. But I can't think like that if we're going to succeed. I have to remind myself that we always give them a choice— the fact that everyone seems to agree with me at least helps quell my doubts a little. And a year ago I would have rushed off and done this on my own, so that's got to be progress of a sort. I know I keep saying this, but if you want back out, just say so. You'll still be part of this pack. We won't do that, boss. We're with you 100%. It's Amina who's spoken. When I look at her, her face lights up in a smile. I haven't had the chance to talk to her about her time in my mother's pack, before all this, but I get the feeling that they got on well. Well, that's it. I have nothing more to add. Okay, then, you know the plan. I guess it's time we got moving. I'm surprised to see a look of disappointment on their faces, as if they were expecting more from me. I'll admit my short speech has come to rather an abrupt end, and, although I've been truthful with them, it could have probably been a bit more motivational. Amina and some of the others go to leave, but George and Art are both staring at me with the same questioning look on their faces. They haven't been baiters together for long, so if they're agreeing on something, I should probably take note. Stop. Wait a second, I say, wiping my hands on my trousers. Maybe it would have been easier if I'd done this as a wolf. I wouldn't have had to try so hard to find the right words. There's something more I need to say. With a deep breath, I let the walls fall. What you've gone through in the past few months would have been unthinkable this time last year. Each one of you has lost so much. Family, friends, loved ones. And we've all lost our home. None of us has escaped unscathed. I pause, wondering how the hell I'm going to turn this into a positive. The fact that a group of people can go through so much and still hold out hope is remarkable. And it's not just hope I have today. I have faith. You know I was not raised like you were. I don't know the world of wolves like you do. But I know that what has happened recently has been more than just luck. Me arriving on your doorstep as Polidori started putting his plot into action. Finding Rat, Finding witches to help us. All of this tells me that there's a greater plan in motion here. I'm done believing in coincidences. And I'm done with having doubts. We can do this together. We will do this together. I look out, and there's only one face I'm looking for. And there it is. Grey hair flowing, eyes shining. She offers me a small, almost imperceptible nod. But it's enough. Chapter 36 We travel in groups of six, similar to when we first attacked the nests, four wolves to two witches. My group comprises me, Amina, Imran, and Andrew. And in terms of witches, I went back and forth trying to decide if it would be better for me and Ray to travel independently or together. She's Polidori's missing witch, and he definitely wants me, so we'd probably be better off apart. It's bad enough not knowing how Oliver's doing, not to mention Callan and Rhett, but with Lou gone too, I need her close to me. So that's how I make my decision, no matter how selfish it makes me. Arena joins Ray as the second witch. Each group is taking a different route from France back to Scotland, and we're staggering our departure times too. My team leaves an hour after George's. After travelling on foot, we take buses and trains before boarding the ferry across from Amsterdam to Newcastle. From there, we take a rental car. 
which magic supplies all the documentation needed. The closer we get to our old home, the more on edge I feel. I've only driven along these potholed roads and overgrown lanes once before, but I'm starting to recognize the scenery. The camp lies in the bottom of a valley with a dense forest behind it and only one road leading in. Any vehicles approaching are easily spotted from below. As we arrive at the top of the last hill and look down, the emotion I feel takes me by surprise. I hadn't expected coming back to be easy, but I'd never imagined it would be this hard. How long was I here? A week. That's hardly any time at all in the grand scheme of things, but it really was life-changing. And in terms of memories, there may not be many, but they're unparalleled, and are all I have of her. Of Freya. You okay? Ray asks me, squeezing my elbow. I will be, I reply. I'd like to think I sound like I'm on top of this, but I doubt I do, and whatever small amount of confidence I had disappears entirely as we thunder across the cattle grid. I'm guessing it didn't look like this before. Ray almost whispers. No, I say, peering out. It didn't. It had never rivaled the Ritz-Carlton, but I remember how surprised I was when I first saw this expanse of buildings and houses. A couple were a little ramshackle back then, but in a homely way. The place was well looked after, with vegetable gardens and good pathways that the children used to cycle on. I see some of their bikes lying abandoned, They've succumbed to rust, with weeds entwined around handlebars and between spokes, binding them to the ground. I know places always look worse in winter, but this is so much more than that. Windows are smashed, doors have been pulled off their hinges. I shudder to imagine what was playing out here while I was making my escape. The terror. The bloodshed. It's evening, and the sun is setting without ceremony or colour, leaving us in a grey twilight. That's what faces us now, total and utter gloom. We could do something about this, if you like, Ray says. Tidy it up a bit. Wouldn't take me and the other witches long. I remember the flowers that had bloomed here, the lush grass that led up to the wall and the forest boundary. I wish I could have shown it to Ray like that, but it's too late. And I shake my head. No, I say, thank you, but no. We can't risk any sign that you're here. Nothing at all. I understand she says. I'll go and see how many of us have already arrived. I nod. A lump is lodged in my throat, and tears are pricking my eyes. One of my betas emerges from a nearby building, his look a sad reflection of my own. George will find you a room, I say to Ray. What about you? We don't have long. You need to make sure you get as much rest as possible. Don't worry, I will. There's a hut a little way into the forest, where Chrissy took Callan and me when we first arrived, somewhere for us to stay. It holds one or two memories, but fewer than other places here. I could go there and lock myself away, forget about the world and my responsibilities and what we're going to face in two days' time. But that doesn't seem fair on the rest of the pack. However difficult I'm finding this, it can be nothing compared to those guys who spent their entire lives here. This is where every memory from their birth onwards was formed, and I'm expecting them to deal with it. Besides, walking to that cabin was when I met Lou, who insisted on helping her mum and talking incessantly all the way. Even then, she oozed charm and likability. Turns out no place is going to be free of painful memories. So that leaves me with two choices. I could use my mother's old cabin. It was one of the newer ones and might still be in a fairly reasonable condition. It was minimalist to start with, so there wouldn't have been much for Juliet's wolves to trash. Or I could say where Callan and I ended up. There's a third option, too. I could ask George or Art to find me a completely different place, but they're already busy locating suitable accommodation for the witches. I'm Alpha. This is something I should be able to sort out for myself. It already feels disrespectful to my mother, taking over her pack and going against everything she'd worked so hard for. So I decide not to take her home, too. In the end, I head to the cabin that Callan and I used. As I near it, I see Chrissy standing close by, and realise my mistake. It's right next door to where she once lived, with Art and Lou. I approach her with a nervous smile on my face. Her emotions must still be all over the place. Is she going to yell at me again, or even worse, cry? But as she sees me and our eyes meet, she attempts a small smile back. You should get some rest, she says. I'll take a shift on watch tonight. 
I figure George and Art will already have that covered, but I don't want to seem ungrateful. Are you sure? I am. Silence falls as I pass her and make my way up the steps to my old cabin. Two days, she calls, causing me to stop and turn. Two days and it will all be better. Or a hell of a lot worse, I say before I can stop myself. I want to claw back the words immediately, but I'm surprised to see that her smile has widened and seems more heartfelt. Just think to yourself, what would Lou say in this situation? What would Lou say? I reply, feeling like laughing and crying at the same time. She would say, everything will go to plan or even better than planned, and we'll have Rhett and Callum back, and the sun will come out, and we're going to be the best wolf pack the world has ever seen. I laugh, despite myself. Well, then, in that case, that's what we should choose to believe, too. I nod, wondering whether she really means it or if she's just trying to make me feel better. Either way, I'll take it. There's no lock on my door. There used to be. Mum stored some of Dad's things here, mainly his notebooks from when he was in Blackwatch. I half expect the place to be a bomb site when I go in, but to my surprise, it's all in fairly good shape, apart from the dust and cobwebs. As I cross the floor, a current of air sends something floating upwards. It's a single white feather, no doubt from the time I tore a pillow to shreds in anger. For some reason, that memory is immediately replaced by something a foster parent once told me. She said that when you see a solitary white feather, it's a sign that an angel is watching over you. I dismissed it as nonsense. Having just lost my dad to a vampire, I only believed in devils. But seeing this one now, I can't help but wonder if she might have been right. We could do with one on our side right now. As I lie down on the bed, my thoughts drift to Oliver and whether he's got the strength to do what I've asked of him. Chapter 37 Oliver This feels good, having a purpose again, other than walking with Regine in her garden and listening to her reminisce about her youth. Don't get me wrong, the woman is incredible, and the life she's led wouldn't be out of place in a Hollywood script. But it's not what I'm used to. This is what I'm used to. When I was young, a lot of my friends had cars. I couldn't afford one, but my granddad had an old motorbike in his garage. We worked on it together as a project, and when we finished, it was my absolute pride and joy. I rode it for years, thinking I'd get a new, more powerful one at some point. However, working at Blackwatch was all about discretion, and it's hard to go unnoticed, hurtling around on a Harley Davidson. But now those days are over, it could be time to treat myself. I take the ferry from Calais to Dover. I know Naz and co. will be going back via Holland with others arriving at Portsmouth or elsewhere along the East Coast. It's a good call to keep it as random as possible. Thankfully, my onward route to London offers me some great countryside to enjoy. Unfortunately, I have to leave my trusty steed at a rental place on the outskirts where I swap it for a hire car, using documents provided by Vasara. Vintage bikes are great and I'm sad to leave it. But just like when I was at Blackwatch, I need to stay incognito. So I opt for a plain silver Toyota, something that will blend right in. By the time I arrive in the city centre, fog has settled, turning the streetlights into hazy, glowing orbs. It's not the most pleasant weather to be out in, unless your aim is stalking someone, when it's perfect, and that's exactly what I'm about to do with a certain Clinton Jessup. He was the one who recruited me to Blackwatch, and every promotion I had came through him. He was a top dog. The best of us, I thought turns out it's not the case at all i sit in my car outside blackwatch hq looking up at the lights in the windows it's just gone seven when most people in the city would be well on their way home but blackwatch aren't most people there'll be staff normally two or three working all night monitoring donors looking for others filing paperwork from the night before occasionally jessup would take the night shift but usually only if he had to or if he needed to meet with a vampire but with no family and no hobbies that I know of, at least. He very rarely left before eight. Somewhere between eight and a quarter past was the norm. I just need to hang out and see if tonight follows the old pattern. At twenty-five past eight, I'm starting to think that maybe I've got it wrong and need to rethink my plan. When the door to the building opens and he comes out, I do a double take. I know that I've changed. I've never sported so much facial hair in my life. And, thanks to Regine's generous catering and the lack of exercise, 
I'm not oblivious to the fact that I've put on a pound or two. But I don't think I look too bad. Jessup, on the other hand, is a complete mess. Unlike me, he's lost weight, so much so that his jacket is hanging from his shoulders. His hair is longer than it used to be and is greasy and dishevelled, and the guy looks almost as much in need of a shave as I do. My plan was to follow him straight to his townhouse and wait to tail him back here in the morning. Turns out that's not going to happen. Rather than having a car pick him up from outside as he used to, he walks along the road and takes the stairs down into Oxford Circus tube station. I have no choice but to follow on foot. Having donned a pair of clear frame glasses and pulled up the hood of my jacket, I step out of my car, shutting the door discreetly. To be fair, with these fake specks and my new beard, I wouldn't look out of place in a trendy hipster bar. I don't think I have to worry too much about him recognising me. I'm a long way from the sensibly dressed Oliver Gray that he used to work with. Still, this guy is a surveillance expert, which means he would probably be aware if someone were tailing him. As such, I keep as far back as I can, but without knowing which line he's heading for, I have to stay closer than I'd like to. He heads for the central line, and for a split second I panic. Could he be going to the council building? But that's in the direction of St Paul's, and to my relief, he makes his way to the westbound platform. I hang back by the wall before darting onto the train, just as the doors are closing. I make my way along to his carriage, which is thankfully full enough that I can get a clear view of him without being obvious. He's gazing out the window into the blackness beyond. I expect him to look around at some point and get ready to avert my gaze, but he continues to just stare blankly at the tunnel wall until we reach Shepherd's Bush, when he moves towards the door. Only half a dozen of us leave the carriage at this point, but due to the congestion on the platform, I find myself ahead of him as we reach the escalator. At the ticket barrier, I fumble with my ticket so that he's once again in front of me. Then it's just more walking. This is part of London I'm familiar with for all the worst reasons. Don't get me wrong, it has improved over the years, but still has an air of poverty, drug use and impending violence. It was a great place to source blood donors from among the addicts or people selling themselves for sex. Not a nice job. Only the most desperate were considered doing what we asked of them, but that had the added advantage that no one would ever believe them if they did decide to blab. But that's not a job Jessup would ever do at his level. Maybe he's following up an important lead or a security risk. That would be more his mark. But when he stops and knocks on the door of a three-storey house... I'm none the wiser as to what he's up to. Stakeouts are normally done in pairs, meaning one of you can catch some shut-eye while the other watches and vice versa. But there's no one to share the load with me today. All I can do is wait until he reappears. It's gone one o'clock by the time he leaves the building and hails the only black cab on the street. I assume he's finally going home and I'll have to follow him from there in the morning. There's nothing else I can do anyway. By the time I'm able to hail a cab of my own, he's long gone so I return to my rental car, which is now sporting a parking ticket, which I toss. I'd never normally operate like this. I need some help if I'm going to be on point tomorrow. I drive to Jessup's Road and park up, then walk to an all-night pizza place a few minutes away. Used to have a good reputation for looking out for people on the streets. I scan the four customers in the eating area, two of whom are slumped with their heads on the table, fast asleep. I've got more than one thing to sort out here. I go over to the counter. How long's she been like that? I asked the guy serving, pointing to a sleeping girl. Not long, just came in. Didn't even get a slice before she was gone. I nod. And him? I say, indicating the bloke asleep near the door. Couple of hours at least. Thought about waking him, but there's no point. Kids are regular here. Turns up once or twice a week when things get too aggro back at home. Great, thanks, I reply. Then examine the pizza on display. The slices look tired, like they've been there a while, which, given the time of night, isn't surprising. I'll take two pepperoni, I say. When I've got my food, I slip into the booth by the door and tap the sleeping guy on the shoulder. He stirs a little, but doesn't wake. Hey, mate, I say, shaking him a bit hard and placing one of the slices on the table in front of him. He gradually blinks himself awake. When he sees me sitting across from him, he shifts back in his seat. I smile, as warmly as I can. For you, I say, indicating the pizza. Now, how'd you fancy earning some good money? Chapter 38 
Nerissa. How are you feeling? Ray asks, sitting down on the sofa in my cabin. I considered asking her to stay with me last night. I would have liked the company, but she had her own place with the witches, and I could tell she needed to be with them. They bolster each other and raise their energy levels, which is important. Plus, they've brought some of the grimoires with them. The rest, from what Ray said, were hidden en route here, secured safely with various incantations. If this does all go wrong, the last thing they want is the vampires getting hold of them again. Besides, if she and I were together, all we'd likely do is worry about Oliver, and that wouldn't help either of us. We thought it might be nice to perform a ceremony, she says, a blessing on the place, you know, before he gets here. She shudders, not even wanting to say his name. In all my thoughts of getting Callan and Rhett back, I'd forgotten what it would mean to Ray, being in proximity to Polidori again. We still haven't spoken explicitly about what he did to her, what he made her do. But I suspect that Tamsin, the old witch who helped her find us, wasn't the first person she'd killed. I'll never mention her name to Ray. On the off chance that she can't remember that incident, I'd like to keep it that way. I think that sounds great, I enthuse, although I'm not sure it will achieve anything. If it makes the witches feel more comfortable and confident, then that can only be a good thing. As long as you don't think the vampires will be able to sense it, you know, smell it or something, we can make sure they can't. That sounds lovely, then. Thank you. For a moment, the only sounds come from outside. The chatter of people passing, birds, the sound of cars being moved to a hiding place in one of the barns. The witches are going to have their work cut out, masking the traces of everyone and everything that shouldn't be here. There's so much to do, and yet I somehow feel detached from it all. You didn't actually answer my first question, Ray says, bringing me back to the moment. Sorry, what was that? How are you feeling? Ah, yes, so that would be why I avoided answering it. Honestly? Like a sitting duck. She nods. She gets it. She lets me carry on. I know this place has been here for generations, and it was chosen because of the security it afforded, but right now I feel they could pick us off like shooting fish in a barrel if they wanted to, that we're all in here. Shit or bust. It's going to be okay. I can feel it. Now I nod, not knowing what to say. Polidori agreed to bring Callan and Rhett here at nightfall. At least that won't be much longer with the shorter winter days. I'm not sure how I'd cope if we had to wait until nine or ten o'clock. What about Oliver? She asks. Have you heard from him yet? No, I don't think I'm going to. You know he'll be fine. He'll do it. For the first time, I sense her conviction waver. Would you be able to do it? I say, not sure if I actually want to hear her answer. Would you be able to do what I've asked him to? She presses her lips together for a moment. If it was for you, I'd do anything. And he feels the same. Chapter 39 Oliver it's a skill that I often use working for Blackwatch, one I previously honed in the military, getting to sleep fast to make the most of any available downtime, even in the most uncomfortable of places. I know Naz found it hard to do this when we were on the run in Europe, moving from one run-down house to another, sleeping on bare floors with no blankets, or out in woods if we were really unlucky. I've done it all, and as long as I'm dry, I'm happy. I've slept in the desert during the daytime when it was so hot you could practically feel your skin frying, and in places so cold that icicles formed in my nostrils, and I was terrified that I'd wake up with my eyelids frozen together. I've camped out for a week in a rainforest, been bitten to death by mosquitoes, and surrounded by every type of creepy cruelty known to man, trying to get my kit dried out in the morning sun before the monsoon hit again in the afternoon. Rain like that soaks more than just your clothes. It feels as if it's seeping through your skin into your bones." As such, a weatherproof vehicle with a reclining cushioned sea is practically five-star accommodation to me. There's little noise on the street outside, although sounds from a busier road a short distance away offer a nice background hum for me to drop off to. When there's a knock on my window, it's still dark outside. My mind is instantly alert, and I feel as rest as most people would from a full night's sleep. Is that the guy? 
The boy from the pizza shop has been on watch all night with only one instruction, to wake me up when a man matching Jessup's description leaves his house. And that's exactly what he's done. It's Jessup, without a doubt. He's dressed in the identical style suit, navy tie and polished shoes that he used to wear in the office every day. Probably the same he's worn since starting at Black Watch. I check my watch. 6.30. I've had four hours sleep. His normal time to head to work. Nothing unusual there. Not yet, at least. Thanks, I say, opening my wallet. I go to pull out two notes before changing my mind and taking three. The guy looks at them, eyes glinting. Seriously? You free again tonight? You bet. He looks like all his Christmases have arrived together. I'll see you at the pizza place again. Get some sleep today, okay? You need to be in a fit state. Understand what I'm saying? Gotcha. Good, I say. See you later. The rest of the day pans out exactly as I expected. A black watch car collects Jessup from his home, and I follow him discreetly to HQ. He emerges again later to head out to the local sushi place for an early lunch. As I follow him back again on foot, I'm forced to be even more circumspect in case any other of the black watch staff, who might recognise me, are leaving for their breaks. I used to trust these people with my life. Probably still would. They realise so little. They must still be like I was, certain that their boss, Jessup, is one of the good guys, and Polidori is a decent vampire too. I wish I could tell them the truth. It would make things a lot easier if I had them on my side. But it would be too much of a risk. It would only take one person to open their mouth and everything would blow up in my face. So I pull my hood up and walk closer to the wall and watch as they walk past, feeling a pang of sadness in my chest. Then it's a waiting game again till he leaves the office. It's not thrilling work. I put the car radio on, but I've been out of the loop for so long that I don't recognise any of the music and end up switching to one of the playlists on my phone instead. Most of the songs are at least ten years old, but I'm fine with that. After all the time spent around so many people recently, I kind of like the solitude. The streetlights come on, highlighting the drizzle as I eat the remains of the food I bought after trailing Jessup at lunchtime. I'm just switching the radio on to catch up with the news when Jessup suddenly emerges from the building. He appears to be struggling to keep his eyes open. Tonight, he flags down a taxi straight away, for which I'm very grateful. It makes my job a darn sight easier. I follow it back to his house. There's less than 30 minutes from the time he gets in until his bedroom light turns off. I don't move immediately. I want to make sure he isn't turning off the light because he's leaving the room again. But after 15 minutes with no further sign of life, I get out of the car and I walk to the pizza shop. The boy is asleep in the same position as the night before, and dressed in the same clothes. Could be a case of Groundhog Day, if it were not for the grin when I wake him up this time. Ready to work? Sure, although I was thinking that maybe a little raise could be in order, considering what a good job I did last night and everything. If I ever get out of this mess, I'm going to come back here and find this kid a job in sales. He's practically skipping as we walk back to Jessup's, which wouldn't be so bad if he weren't whistling too. Come off it, you're on undercover work, I tell him. Sorry, boss man, he says, and quickly stops the musical accompaniment, although he carries on skipping. Remember, wake me if you see anything, I say, as we reach my car. Just make sure you don't draw attention to us. I've got it, he says, undercover work. Still grinning, he leans against a lamppost and puts an earbud in, at which point I get in the car, settle down and quickly fall asleep. When the knock comes, I feel less rested this time. Yawning, I roll down the window. That's him, right? The boy says, his breath fogging in the cold night air. It takes me a moment to see Jessup crossing the road. What time is it? I ask. The boy shrugs and I peer at my watch. Midnight. A rendezvous with a vampire? They usually take place at an hour that's more acceptable to both parties. But if this is the case... Jessup's so senior that there's only one person he'd be meeting, and I know for a fact that he's not in London right now. This sets off several alarm bells, reinforced by the fact that he's dressed in dark green cords, and he's holding a large case that's nothing like a briefcase. It's made of aluminium. Jessup is going hunting. Chapter 40 Nerissa whether in wolf or human form, we're all pacing, walking back and forth, nerves getting the better of us. 
I can't imagine how the witches must be feeling. I could ask them, but I don't want to hear that they're scared too. Their presence here is about the only thing keeping me sane. From first light, Ray, my betas and I have kept busy, going over and over our plans, and trying to predict what Polidori might do. Best case scenario is that it actually will be a straight trade, and we get Callan and Rep back, as promised. But you must know that I'm not going to stop attacking the nests, so there's really no chance it's going to be that simple. The witches have been practicing incantations until they were hoarse. Because they needed subjects to work on, my wolves are shot, exhausted from constantly changing back and forth. I'm not sure expending all their energy was a good idea. Maybe they should have spent the day resting. Then again, perhaps they prefer to stay busy too. The sun finally disappears behind the trees. Sunset. Our agreed meeting time. Art and George run up to me and turn from wolf to human form. They're coming, Art says. They'll be here any second now. How many cars? George's eyes shift. Over twenty. What? My heart drops to the pit of my stomach. You're serious? We couldn't stop to count them, but we think it's about that. That fucker. We knew he was never going to bring Cal and Rhett alone. That was never going to happen. But this is shocking news. Twenty cars. With possibly five vampires in each, we're looking at over a hundred of them on their way here. That's a small army. Will the witches be able to control so many? I don't know how the hell we're going to get through this unscathed. Shit. Okay, well, you know what we have to do, I say. Positions, please. We've got this. I'm about to say something else encouraging when lights appear at the top of the hill in front of us. Positions! I yell. There's jostling as people quickly make their way to their allotted spots. The ones we've rehearsed. Rehearsed. Like we're about to put on some bloody play. Not fight for our damned lives. When someone bumps into me, I realize I'm the only person who hasn't moved. I'm standing in the wrong place. My eyes are fixed on the horizon. On a pair of headlights. For a second, that's all there is. Then another two join them. And another... And another. I can feel the wolves stiffen around me. All these vehicles rolling down the hills towards us. I try to count them, but it's impossible the way they twist and turn. Who's in which car, I wonder? Where are Callan and Rhett? He must have brought them, if for no other reason than to put them on parade and gloat about their captivity. If we could just work out where in this convoy they are, it would be easier. We must free them. My stomach turns. What if he didn't bring them at all? What if I haven't identified all the possibilities after all? All the witches are in place and prepared, Vasara says. Her voice sounds distant, which is understandable, given that I don't even know where she is. We're here for you. I haven't been aware of the cold, but right now I'm feeling chilled to the bone. There are only ten of us out in the open, all in human form, too few, and Polidori would know we were definitely hiding others. Too many, and it would appear we're spoiling for a fight. I hate this waiting, I say to George, who's standing a short distance away. If anything happens to me, this becomes your pack. Take it and go back to Regine's, or anywhere you feel is safe. Just get everyone away. Nothing's going to go wrong. It already has, I want to say. I'd imagine Polidori turning up with two or three cars, half a dozen at the most. But this is something else entirely. And even if we win, it doesn't mean to say that I'll survive. Just say you'll do it. Say you'll be Alpha. You know I will. If anything happens, I will lead the pack. Thank you. The first car is in clear view now. It's a large black SUV with tinted windows, and I'm pretty sure you can fit more than five people in one of those. Shit. How could I have thought this would be a good idea? As a wolf, I could have run up and down that hill four times while they're only halfway here. They're driving slowly, George says, echoing my thoughts. Really slowly. Delaying tactics. He's just trying to unsettle us. Well, it's working. I look around and see the others fidgeting, their breathing coming faster. Have you thought about what will happen if he sticks to the deal? George asks, if he just hands them over. Do you think that's possible? No. No. Do you? I'm not sure. I guess we'll cross that bridge if and when we get to it. 
Finally, the lead car rumbles over the cattle grid and comes to a halt. One by one, the others pull up behind it. The clearing in front of the village isn't small, but it was never designed for this many vehicles, and as we're blocking the way into the camp itself, there's nothing for them to do but stop on the slope of the hill. The headlights blaze through the darkness, and once again, I think I may have made a terrible mistake. I'd like someone's hand to hold. Ray's, Oliver's, even Art's. I honestly don't care whose. But I'm an alpha, and that's not how we act. So instead... I push my shoulders back and step forwards. I focus my attention on the first car. There's nothing about it that makes it stand out from the rest, but I'm pretty certain Polidori's in it. That would be his style, to lead his minions into battle, to be the first one to face me. All the engines have been turned off, and the silence is only broken by the sound of my breath and my heart pounding in my ears. The driver's door opens, but it's not Polidori who steps out. It's Dimitar, another nasty piece of work. He was there that night in the council building. It's definitely not a face I wanted to see again here. He moves around the car and opens the rear passenger door, looking for all the world like a regular chauffeur. My heart is in my throat as Polidori drops down from the SUV and brushes the sleeve of his pale blue jacket. He closes the door and steps over from the track to the pathway. When his eyes meet mine, there's a glimmer in them that I don't quite understand. Nerissa Knight, he says. How lovely to see you again. Chapter 41 I don't know why I expect it. I've met him briefly before, of course, but wasn't able to study him in those situations. And if you'd asked me to pick him out of a lineup, I'm not sure I would have been able to. He's not what you think the most evil vampire in existence would look like. The first thing that strikes me about him is how normal he appears. I know that shouldn't be a surprise, Rhett and Callan look the same, but he could be any rich city slicker in his tailored suit and polished shoes. There's a silk handkerchief tucked into his breast pocket, too. It's not just his clothes that have my attention. He's younger than I thought he would be. Early forties, I guess. His eyes are a piercing green. But when he speaks, his fangs, both sets, flash, and I know there's nothing human there. I see you, Mr. Memo, I say, about coming alone. His smile is perfectly even. No slant to it. The skin at the sides of his eyes creases by an equal amount. You all forgive my entourage. You understand the necessity. You've caused us quite a lot of trouble lately. Sorry, have I delayed your plans for world domination? Well, domination, he laughs, so melodramatic. You're not building a vampire army to overthrow the human race, then? Well, if you put it like that, I suppose that is about the size of it, but it's actually much more nuanced. Why? I say, cutting him off. Why? He cocks his head to the side. Why do you think? To restore the natural order of things. The lion doesn't answer to the gazelle, or the fox to the rabbit, or, or the shark to the sardines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get what you're saying. Apparently, the use of metaphors is a necessary requisite of vampire leadership, but I don't have the time or the inclination to humour him. The fact that he's not honoured the one most basic and important part of our agreement makes me wonder if he's stuck to the rest of it either. So, I cut to the chase. Where are Callan and Rhett? I want to see them. He closes his lips and pauses before answering. They're in one of the cars. I can assure you that they're quite safe. Considering everything they've done to me, I think that shows a great deal of forbearance on my part. The snore I emit gets caught in my throat, but I know it's more than loud enough for his vampire hearing to pick up. You'll forgive me for not believing you. I mean, you were given one instruction, to come alone. You can see why I'd be reluctant to take your word on this matter. He nods slowly. I feel that you and I got off on the wrong foot. I'm pretty sure that wrong feet are all you've got, I say. Wrong feet in ugly pointy shoes, I want to add, but somehow manage to keep my mouth shut. Maybe winding up the head vampire isn't the best tactic, but there's a big part of me that's already past caring. What can he do to me? He either kills me, or he doesn't. I'm sorry you think that. Would you be open to going somewhere more conducive to arriving at an understanding in these negotiations? 
Sorry, did I not make myself clear about the lack of trust? No negotiating or any other conversation is going to happen until you let me see that Callan and Rhett are safe. This time, a flash of anger crosses his face. The wolf in my head wants to lunge at him, and I can sense my pack itching to attack. It's hard for them. They've taken out so many vampires recently, with all the nests we've destroyed, that it's become second nature. And to them, Polidori is just another one of those. But they weren't there when we first met Rhett. They didn't see the way he was able to throw George and Esther around like they were rag dolls, and that was trying not to hurt them. Dimitar and Polidori seem of a similar age to Rhett. If any of my pack does go for them, I know there's only one way it will end. Still, there are ten of us that he can see, and even he can't be eager to take on that number. He might be able to avoid dying himself, but he'd certainly lose a fair few of his henchmen, who are currently listening in from the safety of their vehicles. Callan and Rhett, now, I say, or these negations, as you want to call them, are very quickly going south. He takes a deep breath, and then lets it out in a long sigh, like a parent reluctantly agreeing to the demands of a petulant child. I guess that's how I seem to him. Age-wise, I'm practically a newborn. He turns to the car behind and nods. My heart is pounding. I hadn't realised until now that I actually thought I wouldn't see Callan again. It's taken every bit of faith I could muster to even believe that he was still alive. I move my feet further apart to stand firm, terrified that my body's going to take over and run to him the moment I see him. Everything is moving so slowly. A vampire gets out and walks around to the back door of the second SUV and opens it, just as before. But it takes an age for a foot to appear. My throat tightens, and my mouth dries. As the person emerges, a pain grips my chest and the wolf in my head growls with a ferocity that makes me want to set it loose, there and then. You, I say. Chapter 42 I didn't see her when she came to my mother's pack. I'd already begun my escape, not knowing what was happening behind me. I recognise her, though. I've seen her image in the darkest corners of the minds of my pack a thousand times before the slim figure, the sleek hair, dressed entirely in white. She moves forwards, moonlight reflecting off her as she comes and takes her place beside Polidori. An angel? A saviour? Or just a sick, manipulative werewolf bitch with a god complex? Juliet. She offers me a demure smile. I could almost believe it's genuine if I didn't already know the truth about her. The great Nerissa... I've heard so much about you. I guess I shouldn't be surprised to see the company you're keeping these days. I've heard that psychopaths attract one another. Her smile doesn't change. The vampires and I have a mutual understanding, one we like to think you could come on board with. You mean killing innocent people? Sorry, that's not my thing. But killing innocent wolves is. I wonder what your mother would have said about all the ones you've slaughtered these past months. Did you kill members of her pack, too? Her eyes are fixed on mine. She oozes power and confidence. Is she strong enough to read my thoughts when we're still in human form? I immediately dismiss this idea. No, it's just another attempt to intimidate me. And, once more, it's working. She tilts her head to the side. No one could ever doubt that this woman has wolf surging through her veins. Everything about her, from her posture to the predatory look in her eyes, oozes animalistic ferocity. You would have been more suited to my pack. Your mother always lacked the backbone to lead effectively. Depending how this goes, I could find a place for you. I always have room for another beta. Thank you, but I think I'll decline that offer. I'm perfectly happy where I am. Ah, yes, with this... pack... She looks down her nose as she scans across us. I'll admit, we don't give the best impression spread out like this, as if we're trying to look like there are more of us than there actually are. I feel my pack bristle at the insult. It was the exact response she was aiming for. The twinkle in her eye brightens. I have to say, John and I were surprised to hear from you. We thought you might keep up this vigilante act a bit longer. John. 
takes me a moment to realise she's talking about Polidori. For some reason, it makes me feel queasy. Using his first name makes him sound like a regular person, and he's definitely far from that. I'm glad you came to your senses, Juliet continues. It's so difficult for a pack to hold together without an alpha. I am the alpha. How sweet. She's still trying to get a rise out of me, but she's not even close. True, I'm not half the alpha that my mother was, but I'm not the monster Julia is either, and I've been doing good. I've reunited some of my mother's pack, killed a load of rogue vampires, and got a coven of witches on side. I say that's pretty good going for a girl who didn't even know what she was this time last year. For someone you consider such a low-level threat, you seem to have gone to an awful lot of trouble with this ambush, I say. Her smile is barely discernible, yet it still makes my skin crawl. Why did you do it? I ask. Why would you side with the vampires after everything they did? They only created us to do their bidding, like slaves or pets. And when they couldn't control us, they tried to eradicate us. They might have failed in that, but at least they finally got their pet. Talking of which, where's your leash? She sniffs, dismissively. You have large parts of our history missing, I'm afraid. You're right about one thing, though. Vampires did create us. And it was a vampire who saved us, too. And, thanks to you, we'll use him as a figurehead to unite both our sides. Rhett wouldn't do that. All he's ever wanted is peace. Well, old age does strange things to the mind. Don't worry, we'll keep him alive-ish. He's valuable to all of us. The other one, though. Caleb, is it? He's not of much use to us. That's it. I've heard enough. Get them now, I snap. I want to see Callan and Rhett right this minute, or things are going to get very messy. Really? She says, exchanging an ironic glance with Polidori. I don't think you're really in a position to bargain, are you? He says. What you think and what the truth is are very different matters. What, do you think we don't know you've got a couple of witches back there? The one you stole from me and the one who stole the grimoires from us? Let me guess. They've put a cloaking spell in place to cover their scent. If I was a cynical man, I think you've got a few more wolves hidden in those buildings too. What you stole from me? Julia adds with a hiss. You can't steal people, I bite back. You don't seem to understand that. In a second, all her former refinement is gone, and a snarling, vicious old woman stands in front of us. I thought you'd know better than to play games with me, child. You should have learned that much from your mother. I learned a lot from my mother, by not giving in to bullies. And what a lot of good that did her, she crows. Anyway, enough of this grandstanding. You must have realised how this would go, that you'd have to give yourselves up in the end. There's no way you and your little pack or those witches get out of here alive otherwise. Isn't there? No, there isn't. She looks at Polidori, who nods, and lifts his hand into the air. At once, every car door swings open, and at least a hundred vampires make their way down towards us. Amongst them, two bodies are being dragged. They're so broken and battered that they're barely recognisable. Callan and Rhett. My heart leaps and I want to run to them, but George's voice stops me. Nerissa, he says, over there. I look up towards the top of the hill, where it appears a colony of fireflies has taken up residence, glinting and glimmering. But it's not. They're wolf eyes. Hundreds of them, all along the ridge. And they start rushing down. Polidori's smile is so wide now, he's almost drooling in anticipation. I think it's time we end this now. Don't you? Chapter 43. Oliver. I drive out of London, maintaining a safe distance from Jessop's car. I'm almost certain where he's going, but I want to keep up with him. Fortunately, as we make our way up the M1, he stops at services. I watch him go into the building and smile to myself as I imagine what his face would look like if he only knew how much going for a quick piss was going to cost him. I reach under the back of his car and fix a small GPS device on the inside of the bumper, then hurry back to my own vehicle to make sure it's working. I open up the app on my phone. It isn't a particularly fancy model and gives me little more than a flashing dot on a crude map, 
But as long as I'm going in the same direction as it is, I'm happy. I'll now be able to stay a half mile or more behind him for the rest of the journey. Around 7am, as rush hour hits, we reach the Scottish border and start heading west. If I'd ever had any doubts about where Jessup was going, they're gone now. As soon as we leave the motorway, I keep even further back. It wouldn't take much for him to become suspicious if he gets more than a couple of glimpses of my little silver Toyota in his rearview mirror. We're on what I think is probably the final stretch of main road, with about 10 or 15 miles to go to our destination. When the GPS indicates that he's stopped, so I pull up a few hundred yards short, then get out of the car to approach on foot. I round the bend that should put his vehicle in my line of sight, but there's no sign of it. I move into the trees bordering the edge of the road and make my way along parallel to it, checking the app again. It's telling me I'm only 50 metres away. Where the hell is it? 20 metres. I start scanning the area more thoroughly, looking for a concealed turn-off. Five metres. I should be right on top of it by now. I step out into the road again and look up and down. One metre. I'm staring at my phone when I hear the crunch. I look down and lift up my foot. Broken plastic. Shit. I curse myself for not securing the device more securely as I race back to my car. This has cost me too much time. Jessup will be very close to journey's end, if not already there. With no other choice, I throw caution to the wind and drive at breakneck speed along the tiny lanes. Branches scrape the sides of the car as I cut corners, and the undercarriage grinds on the ground as I crash through potholes. I certainly won't be getting my deposit back. I continue to press my luck, desperate to make up the distance. As I take a sharp left-hander, I don't see the hidden tree stump. There's a tremendous bang as the near-side front wing impacts with it, then the graunch of twisting metal, as momentum sends the car spinning a full 180 degrees. The wheels slip off the road, and the car topples sideways into a ditch. The edge of my vision darkens. Lack of seatbelt has left me in a crumpled heap, and I can feel blood running into my eyes. The darkness closes in on me more can't believe I've failed her. Chapter 44 Nerissa There must be over a thousand, George hisses. He's right, and every single one of them is in wolf form, thundering towards us. They'll be here any second now. Even after everything Art told me, I think it's fair to say I underestimated what it would look and feel like to come up against a pack like this. As they reach the edge of the field, they slow to a walk, and then begin to circle us. There are wolves of every size and colour, their eyes gleaming yellow through the evening mist. I knew Polidori wouldn't come alone. I knew he wouldn't play fair. But this is beyond anything I could have ever imagined. Callan raises his head. Go, Nerissa. He chokes up. Please, save yourself. His words cost him a knee to the stomach from the vampire holding him, and once again... I'm finding the urge to run to him almost unbearable. There doesn't appear to be a way out of this. Polidori and Julia are practically salivating at my impending downfall. But what they can't see is the smile I'm keeping hidden. The spark of satisfaction that's ignited in me. All these vampires. All these wolves. They've just laid every card they have on the table for me to see. It's not a remotely fair fight, fifty of us against a hundred vampires and a thousand werewolves, but I've always been one to root for the underdog, and I'm not about to change that. Callan and Rhett, now, I say to Polidori. Unable to hide his glee, the vampire tilts his head. You seem remarkably calm, all things considered. Callan and Rhett, I say again. This is your last chance. Polidori seems even more amused by this. My last chance. Even with a couple of witches on your side, you must know this is the end for you. My wolves will tear you to pieces the moment I give them the command, Julia adds. They're like some weird, evil double act. Unless I take them first, I say. You can't be serious, she replies with a full-bellied laugh. She looks towards Polidori with an expression... Nothing short of euphoria. They seem in no hurry. They're just enjoying the moment. Savouring it, even. But what's that saying? The higher you rise, the further you fall. 
I'm seriously hoping that's about to be proven true. Juliet's laughter continues, then suddenly stops. Every trace of a smile gone. You're playing a very dangerous game here, she gloats. But fine. Give it a try, you and your five witches. That's how many you actually have, isn't it? Yes, it appears that your friends here are not quite so hard to break as you might have thought, Polidori says with a hint of triumph. We know all about the coven you found, if you can call four witches that. My heart does something between a leap and a plummet. I can't imagine what Rhett and Callan must have gone through, what tortures were inflicted on them to get that information out of them. And yet they still didn't tell all. If I didn't already have immeasurable respect for them, I would now. I allow myself to seem shocked and concerned. It's obviously what they're looking for. Even if you had a hundred witches, it would still be twenty of my wolves to every one of them, Juliet says nonchalantly. Have you got a death wish? You'd be risking your entire pack, says the person who pimps her wolves out to vampires. Her face contorts in a snarl. How dare you? I will... I challenge you for the leadership of South Pack, I announce, with a silent prayer that Oliver has made it. You! Challenge me! She lets out an incredulous laugh. I begin to rip off my clothes, ready to transform, as the members of my pack we put on show step back to clear a space. Oh, my dear, that won't be necessary, Juliet coos, and a gunshot rings out from up on the ridge. Chapter 45 Oliver I can feel glass cutting my palms as I push myself up, fighting against the darkness. How long have I been out? I've blown it. I'd like nothing more than to submit to oblivion again, but I can't give up while Naz and Ray are fighting for their lives. I pull my t-shirt up and wipe the blood from my eyes. The windscreen is badly cracked, so I lift my leg and kick out at it. It gives way easily, and after a couple more blows, I'm able to climb through the gap and scramble out. My heart almost leaps out of my chest. There, on the opposite side of the road, is a narrow path leading into the forest, and there are fresh tyre marks in the mud. I laugh to myself. There's no way I would have spotted that at the speed I've been going. My body's protesting, but I push through the pain and head down the track. I've not gone a hundred metres before I come across Jessup's car. It's empty. A hand on the bonnet tells me it's been here longer than I would have liked. Time to put my tracking skills to use. I reached for my gun, only to find the holster empty. It must have slipped out in the crash. I consider going back for it, but decide time is of the essence. I'm grateful it's winter. The ground is muddy and Jessup's footprints are easy to spot. I wish I could believe that he's come here to protect Naz, but I know that's not the case. Every step I take sounds to me like an elephant trampling through undergrowth, and I find I've taken the wrong path more than once and I have to backtrack. The sun is sinking fast, and it's getting harder to follow him. I may not know much, but of one thing I'm certain. He's going to be heading for high ground, so that's the way I'll go, too. I curse myself for leaving my water bottle behind. I should have known better than that. Thankfully, I reach a small stream and crouch down to quench my thirst, where the water bubbles over rocks. As I do so, I see a footprint in the mud. I'm closing in on him. I pull out my small maglite and scan around for more. I finally reach the top of the ridge. The sun is set now, but I can clearly see the village below, lit up by many car lights. I can even make out Naz. She's holding something up, but I don't have time to speculate what. The fact that she's in my sights means that she's also in his. As I look to my left and right, deciding which way to go, I see a small copse, perfect cover for a trained sniper. Now, more than ever, I concentrate on moving as quietly as possible, even regulating my breathing carefully. As I creep into an area of thick foliage, a low silhouette appears in front of me. Jessup's entirely focused on his target. It strikes me that either Polidori has a sick penchant for making history repeat itself, or he's just covering all his bases. I suddenly feel very naked without my gun, but then have an idea. I rush forward and grab him around the neck at the same time, pushing my little torch into the back of his head. Fancy seeing you here, I say. He's lying flat on his belly, a rifle on a stand in front of him. He goes to turn his head. Keep your eyes down and keep your hands away from the gun. Now, I order. He's not trembling, I'll give him that. 
I was ambushed like this once, and I'm not ashamed to say I was scared shitless as I waited to see if the gunman would pull the trigger. Perhaps this isn't the first time for him. I won't ask twice, I say, pushing the torch into his scalp even harder. He sighs and slowly lifts his hands. The moment he does so, I release him and kick him as hard as I can in the ribs. As he rolls over with a grunt, I see his shoulder holster at the same moment he realises he's surrendered to a torch, and we both go for his weapon. But I'm faster off the mark. I bury my fist in his face and grab the gun, switching the safety off in one smooth movement. Bloody torch, he laughs, spitting blood. You always were a crafty bastard. Better than being a traitor, I reply, emptying the rifle with my spare hand. So you've sided with that damn night girl, then? I assume that would be the case. I wish to God I'd buried her in the care system when Michael died. Not that it really matters. There's nothing that can save you now. Yeah, from where I'm standing, I'm not the one in trouble. I shake my head. You know she thought of you as a surrogate father. She trusted you. We all trusted you. You should be protecting her. You should be with us. He lifts his head and looks at me, but there's no emotion in his eyes. You don't get it, do you? He says. You can't stop him. Polidori has been planning this for years, decades. By the time I realised, I knew it was too late to stop him and decided to opt for the winning side. She's going to lose, just like her father did. A red mist descends on me. I slam the butt of the gun against his temple and he recoils in pain. For a moment, his eyes are unfocused, but he soon shakes that away. I feel physically sick. I've seen a lot of broken people in my time, and I thought there was nothing left that would shock me about humans any more. But this, it curdles my stomach. Here's a man I trusted, someone whose job it was to protect, and he's done the exact opposite. What did they offer you? I spit. No, don't tell me. Let me guess. Polidori's going to make you immortal, isn't he? You'll be one of them. There's a trickle of blood running down from his temple. At least this way, one of us gets to carry on. I can still help, try to bring some order to things if I'm in their ranks. Don't you see? The only thing that will help is a bullet through your skull, I say, putting the barrel of the gun against his forehead. My hand starts to shake as I apply more pressure to the trigger. Just a millimetre further is all it would take. Just one small squeeze, and I can end his miserable life here and now. I wonder if he's able to see the uncertainty in my eyes, I've heard it said that it's easier to kill a hundred strangers than a single person you know. I've never doubted the truth of that for one second, but I've never had to test the theory. Until now. What are you waiting for? He sneers. I thought I trained you better than this. Eliminate the threat before it's turned on you. He's goading me, trying to make me second-guess myself. And it's working. My throat's dry and I can't swallow. You can't do it, can you? You realise I'm right. I want to tell him he's wrong, then silence him for good. Did you even put up any resistance? I ask instead. Did you try to influence Polidori at all, or did you just roll over, like a lapdog? His eyes flash with anger. I simply realised that no one could stop him. Not me, not you, not the whole of Blackwatch. We've never had any more power over them than they were happy to allow us. They're uncontrollable. With the gun still against his head, he slowly pushes himself up onto all fours, and I feel powerless to stop him. But I can talk to them if you let me go, he wheedles. I'll tell Polidori you were with me all along. I'll say that you were the one who convinced Nerissa to come here for the meeting, that you've been feeding me information all this time. He'll believe me. He'll reward you, in fact. I know he will. Reward me? You mean turn me too? Think about it, Oliver. What a gift it would be. Eternal life. You could do anything you've ever wanted to. In a world with no humans. He shakes his head. It won't be like that. Humankind will continue to exist. The only difference will be that the vampires are in charge, free to feed on and punish or kill whoever they want, whenever they want. Would that be such a bad thing, honestly? Look at the world and the way we treat each other. Wars, pollution, poverty, famine. Humans are hurting other humans all the time, and it's getting worse. This is a chance to start over. A new order. I can see the desperation in his eyes, and hear the conviction in his voice, but he's deluding himself. This is what you've told yourself, is it? This is how you get to sleep at night. This is how you convinced yourself you were doing the right thing when you killed your best friend's wife, and now you're about to murder their daughter, too. They're just two people. Grey. In the grand scheme of things, they mean nothing. 
Well, they mean something to me. He raised himself into a crouch now, the perfect position to attack me from. I step away from him before he can make his move. I've seen the wolves change and fight hundreds of times. I saw Nerissa turn for the first time and kill Sticks in Callan's flat. I saw her kill another vampire too in the docks in Lithuania. And Jessup looks just as much an animal, ready to pounce. In one quick movement, his hand goes to his waistband and he whips out a short, silver blade. He springs up, teeth bared and eyes flashing, the knife aimed at my chest. And I finally have no choice. A hundred strangers or one person you know. I close my eyes and squeeze the trigger, knowing I can't miss this close. Chapter 46 Nerissa As the echoes of the gunshot fade away, my heart leaps. He did it. Oliver has killed Jessup, or I wouldn't still be standing here. I think it will be necessary, I say, not bothering to conceal my smile. Juliet stares as I continue to undress, then looks around frantically at Polidori, who casually brushes at a sleeve of his jacket, as if removing an invisible piece of fluff. This changes nothing, he says to her. This has gone on long enough. She dies tonight. Are you ready to settle it the traditional way this time? I ask Juliet. Before she can react, Polidori steps forward. While these romantic notions of custom and honour are all very well, and I have no time for them. He turns to Juliet, and I'm certainly not trusting the success of my plans to you, winning a bitch fight with this girl. He turns now to the vampires. Kill them all. They immediately spring into action. Juliet's pack obviously gets the message too, and they move towards us. But their snarls of aggression soon turn to whimpers, as they find themselves bouncing off an invisible barrier. And when they suddenly find themselves turned back into human form, the confusion on their faces is quite something to behold. What are you doing? Juliet screams at them. Before they can answer her, the sound of rhythmic chanting fills the air, soft at first, then getting louder as the coven of witches comes into view, arms raised, encircled by the remaining members of my pack, in wolf form. Polidori's eyes widen as he sees that we have far more witches than he thought, and then go wider still when they lock with rays. On cue, the members of the pack who have been standing with me charge as well, until I am the only one left in human form. Actually, I say to Polidori, I think it's time to make more of an effort to keep our traditions and act honourably. His jaw is locked, fangs glistening, as his gaze moves from Ray to Vasara. A look of horrified recollection appears on his face. He remembers her and the spell that had him writhing in agony on the floor. I don't want to count my chickens before they're hatched, but the fear in his face makes it impossible for me not to smile again. So, now that everyone's here, I say, I'll give you one last chance. Either you return Callan and Rhett to us immediately, or you all die. Chapter 47 Juliet's pack is in turmoil. They now realise that however hard they try, they can't change back to wolf form. Juliet herself is apoplectic with rage. Do something, she screams at Polidori. Get her! Stop these fucking witches! The witches now turn their attention to the vampires, and the screaming starts. First one or two, then ten, and twenty. The others are scared and obviously looking for a way out. One brave or foolish specimen, a few paces back from Polidori, makes a charge at the invisible barrier. I see Ray flick her wrist, and he passes straight through. He skids to a halt and looks around in triumph at his success. He turns back towards the witches, and in that instant, Art is on him, and rips his head clean off with one bite. Relinquish the pack, I say to Juliet. She starts to back away, only to find that the perimeter of our protective bubble has moved, and she's now on the inside. You... you can't do this, she stammers. Well, yes, actually, I believe I can. It was you who impressed on me that a true alpha can do whatever they want. I am that alpha, and I think my mother would be proud of me. Now, how does this work? I'm not too clued up on the fine details of wolf etiquette, but this definitely feels like a win to me, so do you kneel, or what? As much as I'm enjoying taunting her, what I've just said feels true. There's been a shift in power, just as when Art taught me to block, 
and then again when I refused to follow Freya's orders and declared myself to be a lone wolf. I somehow know that her pack is mine now, that they actually want to follow me. They're shifting around, distancing themselves from Juliet and the vampires. I won't let you do this, she sobs. They're mine. They're my pack. Not any more. For a second, her head bows, and I think she's actually going to kneel. But instead, she lunges at me. For someone her age, she's far stronger than I expected, and she catches me by surprise. I lose my balance for a moment, but in a heartbeat, I've got it back, and I have it in a headlock. I feel a flood of energy flowing through me, just as when I became Alpha. All this strength and the feeling of privilege. It's easy to see how she became addicted to it and why she's done everything possible to avoid relinquishing it for half a century. But her time is up. I know it, and she knows it, and so does the rest of the pack. Fight me, you coward, she hisses. Fight me. I deserve that much. Like my mother, you mean. She sucks in a lungful of air. I did what I had to. The vampires would have ended her anyway. There was no other choice. It was the kindest way for her to die. How very charitable of you, I sneer. She's still struggling, writhing in my grip. Her eyes fill with tears as she looks at all the people who were once loyal to her. Her former arrogance has gone, and the bravado has evaporated. In its place, all that's left is an old woman on whom the shadow of death has just fallen. Please, she says, not like this. Let me die a wolf. Please, give me that mercy. One you didn't extend to my mother. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please. I recall that moment in the vampire's vault when Callan and Esther held my hands as I was about to step into the flames, facing certain death. I remember thinking how lucky I was that I got a moment to prepare for what was about to happen and experience the comfort of spending my last moments with people I cared about. Then I think about my mother and father, and how they were denied this. Juliet doesn't deserve any better, but the realisation dawns on me. It's not about her. It's about me. I look towards my wolves, searching for one in particular, and there she is, her amber fur shining in the moonlight. My mother may not be here to advise me, but I have the next best thing. Her old beta. Her best friend. In human form, there's no way for me to silently communicate with her. Yet when our eyes meet, a simple dip of her muzzle tells me all I need to know. Dropping my arm, I allow Juliet to fall to the ground. Her pack is silent. Every pair of eyes is on me. Let her turn, I say to Vasara. Chapter 48 The effect is instant. Juliet's clothes shred, and her leather belt splits apart as she becomes the wolf, and she launches herself at me. I spring up to meet her. I might not be as big as she is, but this fight is already over. I know it, and so does she. I will make this swift. I let my voice enter her mind. I'm her alpha now. It's my privilege what she hears or doesn't hear. Her acceptance floods back through to me. I sink my teeth into her neck and hold them there until her body goes limp. I've seen people die before. My father was the first. A vampire snapped his neck, and by the time his body hit the ground, the light had already gone from his eyes. I suppose to anyone watching, Juliet's death will seem instantaneous. My jaws around her neck, the snap of her bones, her collapse. But it isn't instant for me. I feel her heartbeat slow and fade to nothing. Her blood is on my face as I stand in a human form and lift her limp wolf head off the ground. I look out over South Pack. My pack now. I will not force any of you to stay, I call out to them, and I can't promise the transition will be easy. If you choose to go, then do so now. But if you stay, know your loyalty will be rewarded. Some start to move away. More than I hoped would, but not enough to make a great difference. I nod to Vasara, who releases a spell on them. They immediately sense it lift, change into wolves, and slip away into the forest. I nod again, and Vasara does the same for those who remain, and they also change. George and Art marshal them into position around the vampires. Now, 
What was it you said? I take a step towards Polidori. This ends tonight. I think you were right. His fangs glisten. But I'm not scared. Not in the slightest. I've got an army of werewolves with me now. Not to mention a dozen witches who could take him out in the blink of an eye. You have no idea what you're doing, he says. Without me, there will be anarchy. No, I don't think that would be the case at all. The council will fall apart. On the contrary, I believe we'll have very little difficulty replacing you. You think the vampires will follow another leader blindly on your say-so? No, but I think they will follow one of the oldest and most respected vampires in existence, one who will unite the wolves and the witches. I look to Rat, who doesn't look the slightest bit enamoured with the idea. Don't worry, I reassure him. You need only be a figurehead. Callan can run the day-to-day affairs. Polidori snorts. It will all come crashing down. You mark my words. It won't work and you will ruin everything. Well, you're lucky there because you won't be around to see it. And with that, I raise my head and give the signal my wolves have been waiting for. I stand back as they descend on the vampires. Is it normal to feel so calm amidst all this killing? But there again, it isn't really, is it? They're vampires. They're already dead. Polidori's face turns white, and he's trembling. Vampires don't need to blink, but by the way he's staring at me, I know he's trying as hard as he can to break free of the spell that's holding him immobile. He desperately wants to release himself and kill me. I can't say I blame him. He knew, didn't he? I say. My father uncovered this plot years ago. I made him an offer. Join us and live to see your daughter grow up. Or die. He made his choice. Ray approaches me. He can't stop you if you want to finish this. It's fine. I got my revenge and killed my demon back in Callan's flat. Everything since then has just been tidying up the loose ends. This one is for you. She gives me a lingering look before turning to Polidori. You will never harm another witch again, she says. And with that, Polidori falls to the ground. I can't believe it for a moment and just stand and stare. The pale blue suit looks like moonlight, spilt on the dark earth. Suddenly, someone lunges past me and sinks a stake into his chest. I rush to Callan and wrap my arms around him. I just needed to make sure, he says. And his eyes are filled with tears. Chapter 49 Running as Alpha with a pack this size doesn't give me much room to breathe, and I only manage thirty minutes, but allows me time to gauge their feelings about the change of leadership. From the relief that floods through to me, I think it's safe to say they're happy to be out of Juliet's iron grip, although the level of apprehension is high. I get it. They're respectful, though. I know some of them had their eyes on Juliet's throne, hoping that she wouldn't have long left, but I can tell none of them are planning on challenging me any time soon. Apparently, when your best friends are a powerful witch, two of the strongest vampires ever, and a leading Blackwatch operative, no one is keen to mess with you. Having done my best to comfort and reassure the new wolves, I hand them over to my betas, who have now been joined by Adam. Although I never met him before, his reputation preceded him, and he certainly risked enough to earn the title. I also return Chrissy to the role. You're sure? she asks, speaking privately to me. I'm positive. It's yours for as long as you want it. Maybe for just a little while, then, she says, until you get to know the others better. Nerissa, what happened before? Forget it. A silence descends on us, but there's still something that's been left unsaid. Chrissy is the one who finally gives voice to it. I wish Lou were here to see this. Me too, more than anything. And even though I don't have to, I lay bare all my feelings to her, so she knows the full truth. There's so much I wish I could change about this last year, but more than anything, it would be to have Lou back beside me. With the wolves being managed by my four betas, I head to my cabin. Not the one I slept in when I first came here. Not the one I shared with Callan. My mother's. The Alphas. When I open the door, I see it's crowded. Callan, Ray, and Oliver are already here. They've managed to locate some booze, and by the looks of things, they're already well into it. Without waiting for me to say anything, Oliver gets up and pours me a glass. 
There's a space on the sofa next to where he's been sitting, and also room on the arm of Callan's chair. But I move over to the dining area and pull out a chair there. I take a long draw on my drink. It's strong and burns my throat, but it feels good. I sent some of the wolves to bury Jessup, I tell Oliver. He'd arrived in Jessup's car shortly after we killed the vampires, and I think it's safe to say that he got the fright of his life suddenly faced with so many wolves. The rest are burning the bodies, I continue. As for Juliet, we'll give her a wolf's funeral tomorrow night. She was an alpha, no matter what I think of her, and the office deserves respect. It will also demonstrate our ethos to my new wolves. So is it staying like this? Ray asks. With you as alpha of the combined packs. I'm certain the others have been asking themselves this question too. I know I have. All eyes are now on me. I've been hoping for a bit of time alone with each of them before coming to a decision. I wanted to get their individual opinions one-on-one. I guess that's not going to happen. But perhaps discussing it together will pull up some different ideas. I don't know, I reply. As long as things are harmonious, I think we should stay like this as one united pack. But in theory, I don't see any reason why we should all have to remain here. I mean, if the ones from South Pack want to head back home, I'm okay with that. A look of concern flickers on all their faces. But it's Callan who comments first. He's hardly spoken since arriving here, but the barely healed wounds on his body say more than words ever could. What about you? He says. If your pack is split, then where will you be? This is a question I do know the answer to. There are still new vampires out there, rogues, created for Polidori's failed uprising, and also the older ones who turned them. What are you saying? Ray asks, putting her glass down. I'm saying that I need to go after them. I have to make sure they're not a threat to humans or the new vampire council, or Blackwatch. Assuming that Blackwatch is still even a thing, Oliver says, emptying his glass in one swig. It's obviously going to take him some time to get over Jessup's betrayal, which is how I know what I'm going to propose next will be tricky. But if we're going to have any hope of peace and order in the immediate future, it's what has to happen. About that, I say, we need you to take on the role as soon as possible. The role? Jessup's. It's the only thing that makes sense. You must head up Blackwatch. He looks bemused and is obviously waiting for the punchline but there isn't one, because it's not a joke. You cannot be serious now, as I've been out of the loop for almost a year. No, you're the only one who's actually been in the loop. None of the others had any idea of what was going on. Besides, it's essential that the head of Blackwatch has a good rapport with the new leaders of the Vampire Council. Isn't that right? I guess so. And who else could Rhett and Callan trust? He still doesn't look convinced. There's quite a bit I've never had any experience of, a lot of the management stuff. Then get yourself up to speed and learn it. That's your superpower, isn't it? And make sure you surround yourself with good people you can rely on. He looks across to Ray and Callan. So if I'm the new head of Blackwatch, how do you think the vampires would feel about me having a mega-powerful witch in the organisation? His eyes twinkle with the closest thing to a smile I've seen on him today. Callan nods. I think that would be a very good idea and would certainly send a clear message to any who might think twice about adhering to council orders. Great. Oliver's smile is wholehearted now. So, what do you say, Ray? Ready to get back into the field? All eyes are on Ray. Being thrown out of Blackwatch when it was discovered she was a witch devastated her. She wanted to stay and prove she was loyal, no matter what. But from her hesitation, I know what she's going to say even if the others don't realise it yet. There's so much information in the grimoires, so much knowledge to be harnessed, and we'll now have access to all of them. It's going to be a huge undertaking. We've barely scratched the surface. I guess what I'm saying is I'm going to stay with the witches. Oliver is visibly disappointed, but he manages to keep smiling. I get it, I understand. You want to be with your people. For a while, at least. Perhaps in a year or so I could come back to you if the offer's still there. Of course it would be. Consider it open-ended. Thank you. Silence descends. That's it, then. We're sorted. Sorted and about to go our separate ways. But there's still an important conversation I need to have, only not in front of a group like this. Oliver reads the situation perfectly. 
a knack of his. He empties his glass and stands up. Ray, any chance you could take me to see Rhett? I assume he's with Vasara. We should probably get talking if he's going to be the head of the Vampire Council, and I'm going to start running Blackwatch. I thought Rhett was just going to be a figurehead. I thought Callan... Oliver's glower stops her mid-sentence, and she hurriedly finishes her drink and stands up too. Oh, you're right, she says. I'll take you straight over there. We'll be back later, Naz, or we could go somewhere else if you want to sleep. I give her a look that's a half-glare, half-smile. I'm so exhausted, the chance of doing anything other than sleeping tonight are highly remote. Besides, I don't even know where Callan and I stand right now. See you in a bit. Wrapping an arm around her shoulder, Oliver leads Ray away, leaving Callan and me alone. Chapter 50 The door closes. For a moment, neither of us moves. Neither of us knows what to say. Is it possible that he looks older than the last time I saw him? I know vampires don't age, and yet he looks so weary. That's it, not older, just worn out. You all right? He says eventually. That was one hell of a stunt you pulled off today. Am I all right? Of all the questions I expected, this is not one of them. Why don't you tell me what you and Vasara had planned? I demand. You know I would never have let you go through pain like that. I think you've just answered your own question. It worked out for the best, didn't it? We're all here. The witches. The wolves. Everyone. I'm suddenly kneeling on the ground in front of him, cupping his face in my hands. What I wouldn't give to be able to see into his mind and put blocks on his painful memories. I'm so sorry we had to leave you there. You were all I thought about. I need you to know that. What do you think kept me going in that dungeon? It definitely wasn't Rhett's sense of humour. For someone as old as he is, he ought to have some better jokes in his repertoire. I want to smile, but I can't. I was a prisoner there for only one night. That was bad enough, and I wasn't being tortured. What kind of torment could someone inflict on an immortal being? I shudder to think. Letting go of his face, I interlaced my fingers with his... The skin around his nails is torn and bruised. I lift his hands and kiss each of his fingertips, one by one. Nerissa, you know that this won't work, don't you? I wouldn't be able to do my job. The vampires wouldn't trust me and your wolves won't trust you. I know. I already know that. Then. Then we think about that tomorrow, I say. Not tonight. He hesitates, then presses his mouth against mine. My lips don't leave him as I kiss his neck, his arms, his chest, anywhere I can find. I try to commit every single moment to memory. We know that this is the last time. As I explore his body, my fingers detect so many changes. Bones have broken and reset imperfectly, and these are only the physical injuries. I don't need to be a genius to know that the most painful ones are those in his mind. We silently undress each other and move to the bed. As he slides inside me, I push against him, as if our bodies could merge into one, if I try hard enough. Do you hate me for letting Ray kill him? I ask later, curled up in his arms. He was practically a father to you. I could never hate you. You should know that by now. As for Polidori, you did the only thing you could. You did the right thing. You promise you mean that? I do. We fall silent, and I wish we could forget the world outside and stay like this. Ignore all our responsibilities for more than a single night. The room is illuminated by the early morning light. Ray and Oliver didn't return. I feel a little bad about that. Not for Ray, she's got the witches. But for Oliver. It's strange that he would leave Callan and me like that last night, after all he's done before to try and keep us apart. But I suppose he's changed. I guess we all have. I leave Callan resting and step outside. People have already set to work repairing the buildings. Others are clearing away the detritus of a year of neglect. There are people milling around everywhere, but no wolves. I head next door and find Chrissy. We've reinstated the no wolves in the village rule, she says. It felt the right thing to do. You don't mind, do you? No, it's a good idea, I say. I almost add that it's what Freya would have wanted. 
but I'm sure she already knows I'm thinking that. Nerissa, she says in a tone she normally doesn't adopt with me, I want to talk to you about the future. Okay? She nods slowly. Whatever it is she wants to say, I reckon it's not a decision she's come to lightly, so I don't rush her. If it's all right with you, I'd like to move down to join Southpack. Artwood, too. This has been my home forever, and I'll miss it, but there are just too many memories. Too much of her here. She doesn't need to clarify the her she's talking about. I keep expecting Lou to appear. I can't imagine what it must be like for her. Moving seems absolutely the right thing for them to do. I think it's a good idea. I appreciate that. Don't be in such a rush to thank me. If you're going down there, you'll be in charge. You do get that, right? I suspect Adam will want to join you, but you'll have to sort that out with him. And we need to put some more betas in place there too, ones from the original pack. I'll have a talk with Adam, see if he's got any suggestions. Good. That's a plan, then. The rest of the day I go around meeting new members of the pack. The more of them I speak to, the more at ease I feel. Juliet's regime of terror obviously wore them down. One person I hadn't been looking forward to meeting again was Daniel. After all, he once tried to kill both me and Freya and take over her pack. I'm not sure what it says about me, but I'm more than a bit relieved to discover he's not here. He must have been one of the ones who decided to leave last night. Following Juliet's funeral, which clearly brings up a lot of mixed feelings, I leave the wolves to it and make my way back to my mother's cabin. I should be thinking of it as my cabin now, but I haven't quite got there. Yet. I find Callan and Rhett on the porch, discovering how to move forward with the council. Vasara has made them both tonics to ease the pain they're still feeling from Polidori's torture. Amongst other things, it seems they've had tiny wooden splinters inserted into their bodies which would gradually make their way to their hearts. She's working on a spell to remove them altogether. I'm sure she'll succeed. This is Rhett's life we're talking about here. I'll do it, Rhett says. I'll be a figurehead, but I'm not moving back here. My home is in Italy. With Vasara is the part he doesn't say. As long as you're here now and again, that'll be fine. I've been on the council long enough, I can handle the day-to-day -day stuff. And anything that belonged to the witches should be returned to them. The things in the armory and the rest of the grimoires, of course. I agree. Okay, then, I guess that's it. He says and turns to me. I'm going to travel back home with the coven. We're leaving early tomorrow morning, so I probably won't see you for quite a while. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, I say in disbelief. You have absolutely nothing to thank me for. You're the one who saved me. Saved all of us. Without you and the witches, I dread to think how things would have turned out. I think you'd have found a way, though. Somehow. He pauses, his eyes lingering on me just a little longer than I find comfortable. You're a lot like her, you know. Who? Eve. She would have liked you a lot. And with that, he turns and leaves. What about you? I ask Callan. I'm leaving tonight. Really? It's for the best. And with that, he leans forwards and kisses me. Goodbye, Nerissa Knight. Or maybe I should say, Joanna. By the time I get up the next day, Rhett and most of the witches have left, taking several of the SUVs that the vampires arrived in. Two have decided to stay on at the camp, while Chrissy has sanctioned a pair of wolves to go to Italy, in a kind of bizarre exchange program. The wolves who are going to the South Pack camp are on the green, organising themselves. We're going to make use of the other SUVs to get the oldest and youngest down there, if that's all right with you, Art says. The rest of us are going to run. How many are staying here? It's about 50-50. If the ones leaving, some just want to go home, while others want a fresh start, away from all the memories. I get it. Are you sure you don't want to come down with us first? Get the lie of the land? Maybe in a few weeks. Fair enough. Take care of them. And your mother. I will, he says, then turns and walks away. As I go to find Chrissy to say my goodbyes to her, someone takes me by surprise. Ray! I thought you left with the witches this morning. Without saying goodbye? She hugs me. Besides, I'm going with Oliver here to help clear up the mess at Blackwatch first. I know what I said, but we figured he might need some backup, explaining what Jessup did. There's room in the car if you'd like to join us. 
Oliver, Ray and me, together again, the old team. I've yearned for this for the longest while, but what I said to Art wasn't a lie, and as much as I love them, I need some time to myself. Maybe I'll catch up with you later, I say. Epilogue. Nerissa. Six months later. The outskirts of Budapest. I'm not sure this is quite what Lou had in mind when she suggested a girl's trip. For starters, I'm on my own. And secondly, although I do get satisfaction out of it, it's not what you'd call a pleasure. Generally speaking, I deal with the nests as a wolf. But given the small size of this one and the amount of practice I've had in the last few months, I could cope with it in human form. Besides, it's noon on a bright summer's day. What could possibly go wrong? I feel a frisson of excitement as I approach the back of the abandoned farmhouse. The windows that aren't boarded up seem to have heavy curtains drawn across them. Then I spot one on the second floor that only has a net hanging there. I take out the glass bottle and light the rag. With an accuracy that comes with practice, I launch the Molotov cocktail. The sound of breaking glass is immediately followed by the familiar woomph of the petrol igniting. Before I even take a step back, flames are leaping out of the window. It's definitely time to move. At the front of the house, I position myself by the small wooden gate, waiting for the vamps. It doesn't take long. The front door crashes open, and the first one comes rushing out, his body covered in a blanket that's already on fire. As he bursts into flames, I raise my crossbow, and one impressively accurate shot later, he's down. As I go to reload and before I've had the chance to congratulate myself, two more bolt out. These guys haven't got blankets. They've opted for speed rather than protection, and unfortunately, they seem to have a target in mind. Me. The first lunges for my legs as the second dives at my upper body. But the truth is, I kind of expected something like this. A moment before impact, I throw myself sideways, spinning between them, arms out, a stake in each hand. They've barely had time to look surprised before they're dead dead dead. Flipping myself back onto my feet, I wait for the last vamp to appear. I'm certain there's one more in there, but the door has swung shut again, and smoke is billowing from all the windows. The fire must have already killed him, I think, as flames leap from the roof. Of course, thinking you're home and dry is the one thing likely to ensure you're not. The thought has no sooner entered my head than the door blows outwards with a rush of heat. Splinters of wood and glass fly towards me as I hit the deck. I carefully remove my hands from my face. Well, that's new, I say. Standing before me in heavy biker leathers and a crash helmet with a darkened glass visor is one of the biggest vampires I've ever seen. He's got to be seven feet tall, and he's holding a vicious-looking club studded with nails. He lets out a blood-curdling scream that sends birds flying from the nearby trees, then charges at me. Damn it, I think. I knew I shouldn't have worn my best jeans. I close my eyes. It's time to let the wolf out. The end. Nerissa will return in a brand new adventure next year. This has been Dark Reckoning, a gripping and explosive conclusion to the Dark Creatures saga, written by Ella Stone, narrated by Naomi Rose Mock. Copyright 2022 by Ella Stone. Production copyright by Ella Stone.